Sharp's Tiger by Bernard Cornwell. Copyright 1997 by Bernard Cornwell. This unabridged recording of the reading of Sharp's Tiger was published by arrangement with Toby Ed Associates Limited, third floor, nine Orme Court, London W two four R L, and was produced in 1999 by Blackstone Audio Books Incorporated, which holds the copyright there too. Neither this recording nor any portion of it may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authorization from Blackstone Audio Books. This book is read by Frederick Davidson. This book is four hundred and eighty-seven pages long. The following material appears on the book's back cover. As the British Army fights its way through India toward a diabolical trap, young Private Richard Sharp must battle both man and beast behind enemy lines. It's seventeen ninety nine, and Richard Sharp is just an illiterate young private in His Majesty's service, part of an expedition sent to push the ruthless Tipu of Mysore from his throne, and drive his French allies out of India. Posing as a deserter, Sharp must penetrate into the Tipu city, and make contact with a Scottish spy being held prisoner there. Success will mean winning his sergeant's stripes. Failure being turned over to the Tipu's brutal executioners, or his man-eating tigers. Picking his way through an exotic and alien world, one slip will mean disaster. As Sharp learns that he must fight his old comrades in order to save his own neck. Along the way, he keeps an eye out for Mysore's beautiful prostitutes, any stray loot he can get his hands on, and the chance to learn his ABCs. But when the furious British assault on the city begins, Sharp must fight with the fierceness and agility of a tiger himself, to foil the Tipu's well-set trap, and to keep from being killed by his own side. Bernard Cornwell is a native of England, where he worked as a journalist in newspapers and television. In addition to the best-selling Sharp series, he has also written the Civil War series and the Starbuck Chronicles. A resident of the United States for fifteen years, Bernard Cornwell now lives with his American wife on Cape Cod. The book is preceded by a dedication. Sharp's Tiger is for Muir Sutherland and Malcolm Craddock, with many thanks. Sharp's Tiger by Bernard Cornwell, Chapter One. It was funny, Richard Sharp thought, that there were no vultures in England. None that he'd seen, anyway. Ugly things they were, rats with wings. He thought about vultures a lot, and he had a lot of time to think because he was a soldier, a private, and so the army insisted on doing a lot of his thinking for him. The army decided when he woke up, when he slept, when he ate, when he marched, and when he was to sit about doing nothing, and that was what he did most of the time. Nothing. Hurry up and do nothing. That was the army's way of doing things. And he was fed up with it. He was bored and thinking of running. Him and Mary, run away, desert. He was thinking about it now, and it was an odd thing to worry about right now, because the army was about to give Richard Sharp his first proper battle. He'd been in one fight, but that was five years ago, and it had been a messy, confused business in fog, and no one had known why the thirty-third regiment was in Flanders or what they were supposed to be doing there. And in the end, they'd done nothing except fire some shots at the mistrusted French, and the whole thing had been over almost before young Richard Sharp had known it had begun. He'd seen a couple of men killed. He remembered Sergeant Hawthorne's death best, because the sergeant had been hit by a musket ball that drove a rib clean out of his red coat. There was hardly a drop of blood to be seen, just the white rib sticking out of the faded red cloth. You could hang your hat on that. Hawthorne had said in a tone of wonder. Then he'd sobbed, and after that he choked up blood and collapsed. Sharp had gone on loading and firing, and then just as he was beginning to enjoy himself, the battalion had marched away and sailed back to England. Some battle. Now he was in India. He did not know why he was invading Mysore, and nor did he particularly care. King George the Third wanted Richard Sharp to be in India, so in India Richard Sharp was. But Richard Sharp had now become bored with the king's service. He was young, 
and he reckoned life had more to offer than hurrying up and doing nothing. There was money to be made. He was not sure how to make money, except by thieving. But he did know that he was bored, and that he could do better than stay on the bottom of the dung heap. That was where he was, he kept telling himself, the bottom of a dung heap. Never I knew what was piled on top of a dung heap. Better to run, he told himself. All that was needed to get ahead in the world was a bit of sense, and the ability to kick a bastard faster than the bastard could kick you. And Richard Sharp reckoned he had those talents right enough. Though where to run in India? Half the natives seemed to be in British pay, and those would turn you in for a handful of tin pice. And the pice was only worth a farthing, and the other Indians were all fighting against the British or readying to fight them. And if he ran to them, he would just be forced to serve in their armies. He would fetch more pay in a native army, probably far more than the tuppence a day sharp got now after stoppages. But why change one uniform for another? No, he'd have to run to some place where the army would never find him, or else it would be the firing squad on some hot morning. A blast of musket shots a scrape in the red earth for a grave, and next day the rats with wings would be yanking the guts out of your belly like a bunch of blackbirds tugging worms out of a lawn. That was why he was thinking about vultures. He was thinking that he wanted to run, but that he did not want to feed the vultures. Do not get caught, rule number one in the army, and the only rule that mattered. Because if you got caught, the bastards would flog you to death, or else reorganize your ribs with musket balls. And either way, the vultures got fat. The vultures were always there, sometimes circling on long wings that tilted to the sudden winds of the warm upper air, and sometimes standing hunched on branches. They fed on death, and a marching army gave them a glutton start. And now in this last year of the 18th century, two allied armies were crossing this hot, fertile plain in southern India. One was a British army, and the other belonged to a British ally, the Nizam of Hyderabad, and both armies provided a feast of vulture fodder. Horses died, oxen died, camels died. Even two of the elephants that had seemed so indestructible had died, and then the people died. The twin armies had a tail ten times longer than themselves. A great sprawl of camp followers, merchants, herders, whores, wives and children. And among all of those people, as it did among the armies themselves, the plagues ran riot. Men died with bloody dysentery, or shaking with a fever, or choking on their own vomit. They died struggling for breath, or drenched in sweat, or raving like mad things, or with skins blistered raw. Men, women and children all died, and whether they were buried or burned, it did not matter, because in the end the vultures fed on them anyway, for there was never enough time nor sufficient timber to make a proper funeral pyre, and so the vultures would rip the half-cooked flesh off the scorched bones, and if the bodies were buried, then no amount of stones heaped on the soil would stop the scavenging beasts from digging up the swollen, rotting flesh, and the vultures' hooked beaks took what the ravenous teeth left behind. And this hot March day promised food in abundance, and the vultures seemed to sense it, for as the early afternoon passed, more and more birds joined the spiring column of wings that circled above the marching men. The birds did not flap their wings, but simply soared in the warm air as they glided, tilted, slid, and waited, always waited, as if they knew that death's succulence would fill their gullets soon enough. Ugly bastard birds, Sharp said. Just rats with wings. But no one in the thirty-thirds light company answered him. No one had the breath to answer him. The air was choking from the dust kicked up by the men ahead, so that the rearward ranks stumbled through a warm, gritty mix that parched their throats and stung their eyes. Most of the men were not even aware of the vultures, while others were so weary that they had not even noticed the troop of cavalry that had suddenly appeared a half-mile to the north. The horsemen trotted beside a grove of trees that were bright with red blossom, then accelerated away. Their drawn sabres flashed reflected sunlight as they wheeled away from the infantrymen, but then, as inexplicably as they had hurried and swerved away, they suddenly stopped. Sharp noticed them. British cavalry they were, the fancy boys come to see how proper soldiers fought. 
Ahead, from the low rise of land where a second group of horsemen was silhouetted against the furnace whiteness of the sky, a gun fired. The crack of the cannon was immense, a billow of sound that punched hollow and malignant across the plain. The gun's smoke billowed white as the heavy ball thrashed into some bushes, tore leaves and blossoms to tatters, struck dust from the baked ground, then ran on in ever decreasing bounces to lodge against a gnarled fallen tree, from which a pale shower of decaying wood spurted. The shot had missed the red coated infantry by a good two hundred paces, but the sound of the cannon woke up the weary. Jesus! a voice in the rear fire said, What was that? A bleeding camel farty. What the hell do you think it was? a corporal answered. It was a bloody awful shot. Sharp said, My mother could lay a gun better than that. I didn't think you had a mother, Private Garrard said. Everyone's got a mother, Tom. Not Sergeant Akes will, Garrard said, then spat a mix of dust and spittle. The column of men had momentarily halted, not because of any orders, but rather because the cannon shot had unnerved the officer leading the front company, who was no longer sure exactly where he was supposed to lead the battalion. Ikesville wasn't born of a mother, Garrard said vehemently. He took off his shako and used his sleeve to wipe the dust and sweat from his face. The woolen sleeve left a faint trace of red dye on his forehead. Ikesville was spawned of the devil, Garrard said, jamming the shako back on his white powdered hair. Sharp wondered whether Tom Garrard would run with him. Two men might survive better than one. And what about Mary? Would she come? He thought about Mary a lot when he was not thinking about everything else, except that Mary was inextricably twisted into everything else. It was confusing. She was Sergeant Bickerstaff's widow, and she was half Indian and half English, and she was twenty two, which was the same age as Sharp, or at least he thought it was the same age. It could be that he was twenty one or twenty three. He was not really sure on account of not ever having had a mother to tell him. Of course, he did have a mother. Everyone had a mother, but not everyone had a cat lane whore for a mother who disappeared just after her son was born. The child had been named for the wealthy patron of the foundling home that had raised him, but the naming had not brought Richard Sharp any patronage, only brought him to the reeking bottom of the army's dung heap. Still, Sharp reckoned he could have a future, and Mary spoke one or two Indian languages, which could be useful if he and Tom did run. The cavalry, off to Sharp's right, spurred into a trot again and disappeared beyond the red blossomed trees, leaving only a drifting cloud of dust behind. Two galloper guns, light six pounder cannons, followed them, bouncing dangerously on the uneven ground behind their teams of horses. Every other cannon in the army was drawn by oxen. But the galloper guns had horse teams that were three times as fast as the plodding draft cattle. The lone enemy cannon fired again, its brutal sound punching the warm air with an almost palpable impact. Sharp could see more enemy guns on the ridge, but they were smaller than the gun that had just fired, and Sharp presumed they did not have the long range of the bigger cannon. Then he saw a trace of grey in the air, a flicker like a vertical pencil stroke. Drawn against the pale blue sky, and he knew that the big gun's shot must be coming straight toward him, and he knew too that there was no wind to carry the heavy ball gently aside. And all that he realized in the second or so that the ball was in the air, too short a time to react, only to recognize death's approach, but then the ball slammed into the ground a dozen paces short of him and bounced on up over his head to run harmlessly into a field of sugar cane. I reckon the bastards have got your mother laying the gun now, Dick, Garrard said. No talking now, Sergeant Hicksworth's voice screeched suddenly. Save your godless breath. Was that you talking, Garrard? Not me, Sarge. I ain't got the breath. You ain't got the breath. Sergeant Hicksworth came hurrying down the company's ranks and thrust his face up toward Garrard. You ain't got the breath. That means you're dead, Private Garrard. Dead. No use to king or country if you's dead, but you never was any bleeding use anyway. The sergeant's malevolent eyes flicked to Sharp. Was it you talking, Sharpie? Not me, Sarge. 
You ain't got orders to talk. If the king wanted you to have a conversation, I'd have told you so. Says so in the scriptures. Give me your firelock, Sharpie. Quick now. Sharp handed his musket to the sergeant. It was Hakeswell's arrival in the company that had persuaded Sharp that it was time to run from the army. He'd been bored anyway, but Hakeswell had added injustice to boredom. Not that Sharp cared about injustice, for only the rich had justice in this world. But Hakeswell's injustice was touched with such malevolence that there was hardly a man in the light company not ready to rebel. And all that kept them from mutiny was the knowledge that Hakeswell understood their desire, wanted it, and wanted to punish them for it. He was a great man for provoking insolence and then punishing it. He was always two steps ahead of you, waiting around a corner with a bludgeon. He was a devil, was Hakeswell, a devil in a smart red coat decorated with a sergeant's badges. Yet to look at Hakeswell was to see the perfect soldier. It was true that his oddly lumpy face twitched every few seconds, as though an evil spirit was twisting and jerking just beneath his sun-reddened skin. But his eyes were blue, his hair was powdered as white as the snow that never fell on this land, and his uniform was as smart as though he stood guard at Windsor Castle. He performed drill like a Prussian, each movement so crisp and clean that it was a pleasure to watch. But then the face would twitch, and his oddly childlike eyes would flicker a sideways glance, and you could see the devil peering out. Back when he'd been a recruiting sergeant, Hakeswell had taken care not to let the devil show, and that was when Sharp had first met him. But now, when the sergeant no longer needed to gull and trick young fools into the ranks, Hakeswell did not care who saw his malignancy. Sharp stood motionless as the sergeant untied the scrap of rag that Sharp used to protect his musket's lock from the insidious red dust. Hakeswell peered at the lock, found nothing wrong, then turned away from Sharp so that the sun could fall full on the weapon. He peered again, cocked the gun, dry-fired it, then seemed to lose interest in the musket as a group of officers spurred their horses towards the head of the stalled column. Company! Hakeswell shouted. Company! Shan! The men shuffled their feet together and straightened as the three officers galloped past. Hakeswell had stiffened into a grotesque pose, his right boot tucked behind his left, his legs straight, his head and shoulders thrown back, his belly thrust forward and his bent elbows straining to meet in the concavity of the small of his back. None of the other companies of the King's 33rd Regiment had been stood to attention in honour of the passing officers, but Hakeswell's gesture of respect was nevertheless ignored. The neglect had no effect on the sergeant, who, when the trio of officers had gone past, shouted at the company to stand easy, and then peered again at Sharp's musket. "'You'll not find out wrong with it, Sarge,' Sharp said. Hakeswell, still standing at attention, did an elaborate about turn, his right boot thumping down to the ground. "'Did I hear me give you permission to speak, Sharpie?' "'No, Sarge.' "'No, Sarge, no, you did not. Flogging offence, that, Sharpie.' Hakeswell's right cheek twitched with the involuntary spasm that disfigured his face every few seconds, and the vehement evil of the face was suddenly so intense that the whole light company momentarily held its breath in expectation of Sharp's arrest. But then the thumping discharge of the enemy cannon rolled across the countryside, and the heavy ball splashed and bounced and tore its way through a bright green patch of growing rice, and the violence of the harmless missile served to distract Hakeswell, who turned to watch as the ball rolled to a stop. Poor bloody shooting, Hakeswell said scathingly. Heathens can't lay guns, I dare say. Or maybe they're toying with us. Toying! The thought made him laugh. It was not, Sharp suspected, the anticipation of excitement that had brought Sergeant Obadiah Hakeswell to this state of near joviality, but rather the thought that a battle would cause casualties and misery, and misery was the sergeant's delight. He liked to see men cowed and frightened, for that made them biddable, and Sergeant Hakeswell was always at his happiest when he was in control of unhappy men. The three officers had stopped their horses at the head of the column, and now used telescopes to inspect the distant ridge, 
which was clouded by a ragged fringe of smoke left from the last discharge of the enemy cannon. That's our Colonel, boys, Hakes will announce to the Thirty Thirds Light Company. Colonel Arthur Wellesley himself. God bless him for a gentleman, which he is and you ain't. He's come to see you fight, so make sure you do. Fight like the Englishman you are. I'm a Scot. A sour voice spoke from the rear rank. I heard that. Who said that? Hakeswill glared at the company, his face twitching uncontrollably. In a less blithe mood, the sergeant would have ferreted out the speaker and punished him, but the excitement of pending battle persuaded him to let the offence pass. A、oh, Scot. He said derisively instead, "What is the finest thing a Scotsman ever saw? Answer me that." No one did. The high road to England—that's what says so in the scriptures. So it must be true. He hefted Sharp's musket as he looked down the waiting ranks. "I shall be watching you," he snarled. "You ain't none of you been in a proper fight before. Not a proper fight." But on the other side of that bleeding hill, there's a horde of black-faced heathens who can't wait to lay their filthy hands on your women folk. So if so much as one of you turns his back, I'll have the skin off the lot of you, bare bones and blood. That's what you'll be. But you does your duty and you obeys your orders, and you can't go wrong. And who gives the orders? The sergeant waited for an answer, and eventually Private Mallinson offered one. The officer's sergeant. The officers, the officers. Hakeswell spat his disgust at the answer. Officers are here to show us what we're fighting for. Gentlemen, they are proper gentlemen, men of property and breeding, not broken pot boys and scarlet-coated pickpockets like what you are. Sergeants give the orders. Sergeants is what the army is. Remember that, lads. You're about to go into battle against heathens, and if you ignore me, then you'll be dead men. The face twitched grotesquely, its jaw wrenched suddenly sideways, and Sharp, watching the sergeant's face, wondered if it was nervousness that had made Hakeswell so voluble. But keep your eyes on me, lads," Hakeswell went on, "and you'll be right as trivets. And you know why?" He cried the last word out in a high dramatic tone as he stalked down the light company's front rank. "You know why?" He asked again, now sounding like some dissenting preacher ranting in a hedgerow, "Because I cannot die, boys. I cannot die." He was suddenly intense, his voice hoarse and full of fervor as he spoke. It was a speech that all the light company had heard many times before, but it was remarkable for all that, though Sergeant Green, who was outranked by Hakeswell, turned away in disgust. Hakeswell jeered at Green, then tugged at the tight constriction of the leather stock that circled his neck, pulling it down so that an old dark scar was visible at his throat. The hangman's noose, boys! He cried. That's what's marked me there. The hangman's noose. See it? See it? But I am alive, boys, alive and on two feet instead of being buried under the sod. Proof as never was that you needs not die. His face twitched again as he released the stock. Marked by God, he finished. His voice gruff with emotion. That's what I am. Marked by God. Mad as a hare, Tom Garrard muttered. Do you speak, Sharpy? Hakeswell whipped around to stare at Sharp, but Sharp was so palpably still and staring mutely ahead that his innocence was indisputable. Hakeswell paced back down the light company. I've watched men die, better men than any of you pieces of scum, proper men. But God has spared me, so you do what I says, boys, or else you'll be carrion. He abruptly thrust the musket back into Sharp's hands. Clean weapon, Sharpy. Well done, lad. He paced smartly away, and Sharp, to his surprise, saw that the scrap of rag had been neatly retied about the lock. The compliment to Sharp had astonished all the light company. He's in a rare good mood, Garrard said. I heard that, Private Garrard. Hakeswell shouted over his shoulder. Got ears in the back of me head, I have. Silence now. Don't want no heathen horde thinking you're frit. 
You're white men, remember? Bleached in the cleansing blood of the bleeding lambs and no bleeding talking in the ranks. Nice and quiet like them bleeding nuns, what never utters a sound on account of having had their papist tongues cut out. He suddenly crashed to attention once again and saluted by bringing his spear-tipped halberd across his body. Company or present, sir? He shouted in a voice that must have been audible on the enemy held ridge. All present and quiet, sir. Have their backs whipped bloody, else, sir. Lieutenant William Lawford curbed his horse and nodded at Sergeant Hexwell. Lawford was the light company's second officer, junior to Captain Morris, and senior to the brace of young ensigns, but he was newly arrived in the battalion and was as frightened of Hexwell as were the men in the ranks. The men can talk, Sergeant, Lawford observed mildly. The other companies aren't silent. No, sir, must save their breath, sir. Too bloody not to talk, sir. Besides, they got heathens to kill, sir. Mustn't waste breath on chit-chat, not when there are black-faced heathens to kill, sir. Says so in the scriptures, sir. Uh, if you say so, Sergeant, Lawford said, unwilling to provoke a confrontation. Then he found he had nothing else to say, and so... Awkwardly aware of the scrutiny of the light company's seventy-six men, he stared at the enemy-held ridge, but he was also conscious of having ignominiously surrendered to the will of Sergeant Hakeswell, and so he slowly coloured as he gazed toward the west. Lawford was popular, but thought to be weak, though Sharp was not so sure of that judgment. He thought the lieutenant was still finding his way among the strange and sometimes frightening human currents that made up the 33rd, and that in time Lawford would prove a tough and resilient officer. For now, though, William Lawford was twenty-four years old, and had only recently purchased his lieutenancy, and that made him unsure of his authority. Ensign Fitzgerald, who was only eighteen, strolled back from the column's head. He was whistling as he walked and slashing with a drawn sabre at tall weeds. Off in a moment, sir, he called up cheerfully to Lawford then seemed to become aware of the light company's ominous silence. Not frightened, are you? he asked. Saving their breath, Mr. Fitzgerald, sir, Hakeswell snapped. They've got breath enough to sing a dozen songs and still beat the enemy, Fitzgerald said scornfully. Ain't that so, lads? We'll beat the bastards, sir, Tom Garrard said. Then let me hear you sing, Fitzgerald demanded. Can't bear silence. We'll have a quiet time in our tombs, lads, so we might as well make a noise now. Fitzgerald had a fine tenor voice that he used to start the song about the milkmaid and the rector, and by the time the light company had reached the verse that told how the naked rector, blindfolded by the milkmaid and thinking he was about to have his heart's desire, was being steered toward Bessie the cow, the whole company was bawling the song enthusiastically. They never did reach the end, Captain Morris, the light company's commanding officer, rode back from the head of the battalion and interrupted the singing. Half companies, he shouted at Hakeswell. Half companies it is, sir. At once, sir. Light company, stop your bleeding noise. You heard the officer? Hakeswell bellowed. Sergeant Green, take charge of the after ranks. Mr. Fitzgerald, I'll trouble you to take your proper place on the left, sir. Forward ranks, shoulder firelocks. Twenty paces forward march. Smartly now, nah. smartly. Hakeswell's face shuddered as the front ten ranks of the company marched twenty paces and halted, leaving the other nine ranks behind. All along the battalion columns, the companies were similarly dividing, their drill as crisp as though they were back on their Yorkshire parade ground. A quarter mile off to the 33rd's left, another six battalions were going through the same manoeuvre and performing it with just as much precision. Those six battalions were all native soldiers in the service of the East India Company, though they wore red coats just like the king's men. The six sepoy battalions shook out their colours, and Sharp, seeing the bright flags, looked ahead to where the 33rd's two great regimental banners were being loosed from their leather tubes to the fierce Indian sun. The first, the king's colour, was a British flag, on which the regiment's battle honours were embroidered, while the second was the regimental colour and had the 33rd's badge displayed on a scarlet field, the same scarlet as the men's jacket facings. 
The tasseled silk banners blazed, and the sight of them prompted a sudden cannonade from the ridge. Till now there'd been only the one heavy gun firing, but abruptly six other cannon joined the fight. The new guns were smaller, and their round shot fell well short of the seven battalions. Major Shee, the Irishman who commanded the 33rd, while its colonel, Arthur Wellesley, had control of the whole brigade, cantered his horse back, spoke briefly to Morris, then wheeled away toward the head of the column. We're going to push the bastards off the ridge, Morris shouted at the light company, then bent his head to light a cigar with a tinder box. Any bastard that turns tail, Sergeant, Morris went on when the cigar was properly alight. We'll be shot. We have him. Loud and clear, sir, Hakeswell shouted. Shot, sir. Shot like the coward he is. He turned and scowled at the two half companies. Shot. And your name's posted in your church porch at home as the cowards you are. So fight like Englishmen. Scotsman, a voice growled behind Sharp, but too softly for Hakeswell to hear. Irish, another man said. We ain't none of us cowards, Garrard said more loudly. Sergeant Green, a decent man, hushed him. Quiet, lads. I know you'll do your duty. The front of the column was marching now, but the rearmost companies were kept waiting so that the battalion could advance with wide intervals between its twenty half companies. Sharp guessed that the scattered formation was intended to reduce any casualties caused by the enemy's bombardment, which, because it was still being fired at extreme range, was doing no damage. Behind him, a long way behind, the rest of the Allied armies were waiting for the ridge to be cleared. That mass looked like a formidable horde, but Sharp knew that most of what he saw was the two armies' civilian tail, the chaos of merchants, wives, sutlers, and herdsmen, who kept the fighting soldiers alive and whose supplies would make the siege of the enemy's capital possible. It needed more than six thousand oxen just to carry the cannonballs for the big siege guns, and all those oxen had to be herded and fed. And the herdsmen all travelled with their families, who, in turn, needed more oxen to carry their own supplies. Lieutenant Lawford had once remarked that the expedition did not look like an army on the march, but like a great migrating tribe. The vast horde of civilians and animals was encircled by a thin crust of red-coated infantry, most of them Indian sepoys. Whose job was to protect the merchants, ammunition, and draft animals from the quick-riding, hard-hitting light cavalry of the Tipu Sultan. The Tipu Sultan, the enemy, the tyrant of Mysore, and the man who was presumably directing the gunfire on the ridge. The Tipu ruled Mysore, and he was the enemy. But what he was, or why he was an enemy? Or whether he was a tyrant, beast, or demigod, Sharp had no idea. Sharp was here because he was a soldier, and it was sufficient that he'd been told that the Tipu Sultan was his enemy, and so he waited patiently under the Indian sun that was soaking his lean, tall body in sweat. Captain Morris leaned on his saddle's pommel. He took off his cocked hat and wiped sweat from his forehead with a handkerchief that had been soaked in cologne water. He had been drunk the previous night, and his stomach was still churning with pain and wind. If the battalion had not been going into battle, he would have galloped away, found a private spot, and voided his bowels. But he could hardly do that now, in case his men thought it a sign of weakness. And so he raised his canteen instead and swallowed some arak, in the hope that the harsh spirit would calm the turmoil in his belly. Now, sergeant. He called when the company in front had moved sufficiently far ahead. Forward, half company! Hakeswell shouted. Forward, march smartly now. Lieutenant Lawford, given supervision of the last half company of the battalion, waited until Hakeswell's men had marched twenty paces, then nodded at Sergeant Green. Forward, Sergeant. The redcoats marched with unloaded muskets, but the enemy was still a long way off. And there was no sign of the Tipu Sultan's infantry, nor of his feared cavalry. 
There were only the enemy's guns, and high in the fierce sky, the circling vultures. Sharp was in the leading rank of the final half company, and Lieutenant Lawford, glancing at him, thought once again what a fine-looking man Sharp was. There was a confidence in Sharp's thin, sun-darkened face and hard blue eyes that spoke of an easy competence. And that appearance was a comfort to a young, nervous lieutenant advancing toward his first battle. With men like Sharp, Lawford thought, how could they lose? Sharp was ignorant of the lieutenant's glance and would have laughed had he been told that his very appearance inspired confidence. Sharp had no conception of how he looked, for he rarely saw a mirror, and when he did, the reflected image meant nothing. Though he did know that the ladies liked him, and that he liked them. He knew, too, that he was the tallest man in the light company. So tall, indeed, that he should have been in the grenadier company that led the battalion's advance. But when he'd first joined the regiment six years before, the commanding officer of the light company had insisted on having Sharp in his ranks. Captain Hughes was dead now, killed by a bowel-loosening flux in Calcutta. But in his time, Hughes had prided himself on having the quickest, smartest men in his company, men he could trust to fight alone in the skirmish line. And it had been Hughes's tragedy that he'd only ever seen his picked men face an enemy once, and that once had been the misbegotten, fever-ridden expedition to the foggy island off the coast of Flanders, where no amount of quick-wittedness by the men could salvage success from the commanding general's stupidity. Now, five years later on an Indian field, the 33rd again marched toward an enemy, though instead of the enthusiastic and generous Captain Hughes, the light company was now commanded by Captain Morris, who did not care how clever or quick his men were, only that they gave him no trouble. Which was why he brought Sergeant Hakeswell into the company, and that was why the tall, good-looking, hard-eyed private called Richard Sharp was thinking of running. Except he would not run today. Today there would be a fight, and Sharp was happy at that prospect. A fight meant plunder, what the Indian soldiers called loot. And any man who was thinking of running and striking up life on his own could do with a bit of loot to prime the pump. The seven battalions marched toward the ridge. They were all in columns of half companies, so that, from a vulture's view, they would have appeared as one hundred and forty small scarlet rectangles spread across a square mile of green country, as they advanced steadily toward the waiting line of guns on the enemy-held ridge. The sergeants paced beside the half companies, while the officers either rode or walked ahead. From a distance, the red squares looked smart. For the men's red coats were bright scarlet and slashed with white cross belts, but in truth the troops were filthy and sweating. Their coats were wool, designed for battlefields in Flanders, not India, and the scarlet dye had run in the heavy rain, so that the coats were now a pale pink or a dull purple, and all were stained white with dried sweat. Every man in the thirty-third wore a leather stock, a cruel high collar. The dug into the flesh of his neck, and each man's long hair had been pulled harshly back, greased with candle wax, then twisted about a small sand-filled leather bag that was secured with a strip of black leather, so that the hair hung like a club at the nape of the neck. The hair was then powdered white with flour, and though the clubbed and whitened hair looked smart and neat, it was a haven for lice and fleas. The native sepoys of the East India Company were luckier. They did not cake their hair with powder, nor did they wear the heavy trousers of the British troops, but instead marched bare-legged. They did not wear the leather stocks either, and even more amazing, there was no flogging in the Indian battalions. An enemy cannon ball at last found a target, and Sharp saw a half company of the thirty-third broken apart as the round shot whipped through the ranks. He thought he glimpsed an instant red mist appear in the air above the formation as the ball slashed through, but maybe that was an illusion. Two men stayed on the ground as the sergeant closed the ranks up. Two more men were limping, and one of them staggered, reeled, and finally collapsed. 
The drummer boys, advancing just behind the unfurled colours, marked the rhythm of the march with steady beats interspersed with quicker flourishes. But when the boys marched past the twin heaps of offal that had been soldiers of the Grenadier Company a few seconds before, they began to hurry their sticks and thus quickened the regiment's pace until Major Shee turned in his saddle and damned their eagerness. When are we going to load? Private Mallinson asked Sergeant Green. When you're told to, lad, when you're told to, not before. Oh, sweet Jesus! This last imprecation from Sergeant Green had been caused by a deafening ripple of gunfire from the ridge. A dozen more of the Tipu's smaller guns had opened fire, and the crest of the ridge was now fogged by a grey-white cloud of smoke. The two British galloper guns off to the right had unlimbered and started to return the fire. But the enemy cannon were hidden by their own smoke, and that thick screen obscured any damage the small galloper guns might be inflicting. More cavalry trotted forward to the 33rd's right. These newcomers were Indian troops dressed in scarlet turbans and holding long, wicked, pointed lances. So what are we bleeding supposed to do? Mallinson complained. Just march straight up the bloody ridge with empty muskets. If you're told to, Sergeant Green said, that's what you'll do. Now hold your bloody tongue. Quiet back there, Hakeswell called from the half-company in front. This ain't a bleeding parish outing. This is a fight, you bastards. Sharp wanted to be ready, and so he untied the rag from his musket's lock and stuffed it into the pocket where he kept the ring Mary had given him. The ring, a plain band of worn silver, had belonged to Sergeant Bickerstaff, Mary's husband, but the sergeant was dead now, and Green had taken Bickerstaff's sergeant's stripes and sharp his bed. Mary came from Calcutta. That was no place to run, Sharp thought. The place was full of redcoats. Then he forgot any prospect of deserting, for suddenly the landscape ahead was filling with enemy soldiers. A mass of infantry was crossing the northern end of the low ridge and marching down onto the plain. Their uniforms were pale purple, they had wide red hats, and, like the British Indian troops, were bare-legged. The flags above the marching men were red and yellow, but the wind was so feeble that the flags hung straight down to obscure whatever device they might have shown. More and more men appeared until Sharp could not even begin to estimate their numbers. Thirty-third, a voice shouted from somewhere ahead. Line to the left! Line to the left! Captain Morris echoed the shout. You heard the officer. Sergeant Hexwell bawled. Line to the left, smartly now. On the double, Sergeant Green called. The leading half-company of the 33rd had halted, and every other half-company angled to their left and sped their pace, with the final half-company, in which Sharp marched, having the farthest and fastest to go. The men began to jog, their packs and pouches and bayonet scabbards bumping up and down as they stumbled over the small fields of crops. Like a swinging door, the column, that had been marching directly toward the ridge, was now turning itself into a line that would lie parallel to the ridge, and so bar the advance of the enemy infantry. Two files! a voice shouted. Two files! Captain Morris echoed. You heard the officer! Hakeswell shouted. Two files on the right. Smartly now. All the running half-companies now split themselves into two smaller units, each of two ranks, and each aligning itself on the unit to its right, so that the whole battalion formed a fighting line two ranks deep. As Sharp ran into position, he glanced to his right and saw the drummer boys taking their place behind the regiment's colours, which were guarded by a squad of sergeants armed with long, axe-headed poles. The light company was the last into position. There were a few seconds of shuffling as the men glanced right to check their alignment. Then there was stillness and silence, except for the corporals fussily closing up the files. In less than a minute, in a marvellous display of drill, the King's 33rd had deployed from column of march into line of battle so that seven hundred men, arrayed in two long ranks, now faced the enemy. "'You may load, Major Shee. That was Colonel Wellesley's voice. He had galloped his horse close to where Major Shee brooded under the regiment's twin flags. 
The six Indian battalions were still hurrying forward on the left, but the enemy infantry had appeared at the northern end of the ridge, and that meant the 33rd was the nearest unit and the one most likely to receive the Tipu's assault. Load! Captain Morris shouted at Hakeswell. Sharp felt suddenly nervous as he dropped the musket from his shoulder to hold it across his body. He fumbled with the musket's hammer as he pulled it back to the half cock. Sweat stung his eyes. He could hear the enemy drummers. Handle cartridge! Sergeant Hakeswell shouted, and each man of the light company pulled a cartridge from his belt pouch and bit through the tough waxed paper. They held the bullets in their mouths, tasting the sour, salty gunpowder. Prime! Seventy-six men trickled a small pinch of powder from the opened cartridges into their muskets' pans, then closed the locks so that the priming was trapped. Cast about! Hakeswell called, and seventy-six right hands released their musket stocks so that the weapons' butts dropped toward the ground. And I'm watching you! Hakeswell added, if any of you lily-white bastards don't use all his powder, I'll skin your eyes off you and rub salt on your miserable flesh. Do it proper now. Some old soldiers advised only using half the powder of a cartridge, letting the rest trickle to the ground so that the musket's brutal kick would be diminished. But faced by an advancing enemy, no man thought of employing that trick this day. They poured the remainder of their cartridge's powder down their musket barrels, stuffed the cartridge paper after the powder, then took the balls from their mouths and pushed them into the muzzles. The enemy infantry was two hundred yards away and advancing steadily to the beat of drums and the blare of trumpets. The Tipu's guns were still firing, but they had turned their barrels away from the 33rd for fear of hitting their own infantry and were instead aiming at the six Indian regiments that were hurrying to close the gap between themselves and the 33rd. Draw ramrod! Hakes will shouted, and Sharp tugged the ramrod free of the three brass pipes that held it under the musket's thirty-nine inch barrel. His mouth was salty with the taste of gunpowder. He was still nervous, not because the enemy was tramping ever closer, but because he had a sudden idiotic idea that he might have forgotten how to load a musket. He twisted the ramrod in the air, then placed the ramrod's flared tip into the barrel. Ram cartridge, Hakeswell snapped. Seventy-six men thrust down, forcing the ball, wadding, and powder charge to the bottom of the barrels. Return ramrod. Sharp tugged the ramrod up, listening to it scrape against the barrel, then twirled it about so that its narrow end would slide down into the brass pipes. He let it drop into place. Order arms, Captain Morris called, and the light company now with loaded muskets, stood to attention with their guns held against their right sides. The enemy was still too far off for a musket to be either accurate or lethal, and the long, too deep line of seven hundred redcoats would wait until their opening volley could do real damage. Talion! Sergeant Major Bywater's voice called from the centre of the line. Fix bayonets! Sharp dragged the seventeen-inch blade from its sheath, which hung behind his right hip. He slotted the blade over the musket's muzzle, then locked it in place by twisting its slot onto the lug. Now no enemy could pull the bayonet off the musket. Having the blade mounted made reloading the musket far more difficult, but Sharp guessed that Colonel Wellesley had decided to shoot one volley and then charge. "'Going to be a right mucky brawl,' he said to Tom Garrard. More of them than us, Garrard muttered, staring at the enemy. The buggers look steady enough. The enemy indeed looked steady. The leading troops had momentarily paused to allow the men behind to catch up, but now, reformed into a solid column, they were readying to advance again. Their ranks and files were ramrod straight. Their officers wore waist sashes and carried highly curved sabres. One of the flags was being waved to and fro, and Sharp could just make out that it showed a golden sun blazoned against a scarlet sky. Vultures swooped lower. The galloper guns, unable to resist the target of the great column of infantry, poured solid shot into its flank, but the Tipu's men stoically endured the punishment, as their officers made certain that the column was tight-packed 
and ready to deliver its crushing blow on the waiting red coat line. Sharp licked his dry lips. So these, he thought, were the Tipu's men. Fine-looking bastards they were too, and close enough now so that he could see that their tunics were not plain pale purple, but were instead cut from a creamy white cloth, and decorated with mauve tiger stripes. Their cross belts were black, and their turbans and waist sashes crimson. Heathens they might be, but not to be despised for that. For only fifteen years before these same tiger-striped men had torn apart a British army and forced its survivors to surrender. These were the famed tiger troops of Mysore, the warriors of the Tipu Sultan, who had dominated all of southern India until the British thought to climb the ghats from the coastal plain and plunge into Mysore itself. The French were these men's allies, and some Frenchmen served in the Tipu's forces. But Sharp could see no white faces in the massive column that at last was ready, and, to the deep beat of a single drum, lurched ponderously forward. The tiger-striped troops were marching directly toward the king's thirty-third, and Sharp, glancing to his left, saw that the sepoys of the East India Company regiments were still too far away to offer help. The thirty-third would have to deal with the Tipu's column alone. Private Sharp. Hakeswell's sudden scream was loud enough to drown the cheer that the Tipu's troops gave as they advanced. Private Sharp! Hakeswell screamed again. He was hurrying along the back of the light company, and Captain Morris, momentarily dismounted, was following him. Give me your musket, Private Sharp! Hakeswell bellowed. Nothing wrong with it, Sharp protested. He was in the front rank and had to turn and push his way between Garrard and Mallinson to hand the gun over. Hakeswell snatched the musket and gleefully presented it to Captain Morris. "See, sir," the sergeant crowed. "Just as I thought, sir. Bastard sold his flint, sir. Sold it to an heathen darky." Hakeswell's face twitched as he gave Sharp a triumphant glance. The sergeant had unscrewed the musket's dog head, extracted the flint in its folded leather pad, and now offered the scrap of stone to Captain Morris. Piece of common rock, sir. No good to man a beast. Must have flogged his flint, sir. Flogged it in exchange for a pagan whore, sir. I dare say, filthy beast that he is. Morris peered at the flint. Sell the flint, did you, Private? He asked in a voice that mingled derision, pleasure, and bitterness. No, sir. Silence! Hakeswell screamed into Sharp's face, spattering him with spittle. Lying to an officer, flogging a fencer, flogging a fence, selling his flint, sir. Another flogging a fencer says so in the scriptures, sir. It is a flogging offence, Morris said with a tone of satisfaction. He was as tall and lean as Sharp, with fair hair and a fine boned face, that was just beginning to show the ravages of the liquor with which the captain assuaged his boredom. His eyes betrayed his cynicism. And something much worse, that he despised his men, Hakeswell and Morris. Sharp thought as he watched them, a right bloody pair. Nothing wrong with that flint, sir. Sharp insisted. Morris held the flint in the palm of his right hand. Looks like a chip of stone to me. Common grit, sir. Hakeswell said, "Common bloody grit, sir. No good to man or beast." Might I? A new voice spoke. Lieutenant William Lawford had dismounted to join Morris, and now, without waiting for his captain's permission, he reached over and took the flint from Morris's hand. Lawford was blushing again, astonished by his own temerity in thus intervening. "There's an easy way to check, sir," Lawford said nervously. Then he drew out his pistol, cocked it, and struck the loose flint against the pistol steel. Even in the day's bright sunlight, there was an obvious spark. "Seems like a good flint to me, sir." Lawford said mildly. Ensign Fitzgerald, standing behind Lawford, gave Sharp a conspiratorial grin. A perfectly good flint, Lawford insisted, less diffidently. Morris gave Hakeswell a furious look, then turned on his heel and strode back toward his horse. Lawford tossed the flint to Sharp. Make your gun ready, Sharp, he said. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Lawford and Fitzgerald walked away. As Hakeswell, humiliated, thrust the musket back at Sharp, 
Clever bastard, Sharpie, aren't you? I'll have the leather as well, Sergeant, Sharp said, and once he had the flint seating back, he called after Hexwell, who had begun to walk away. Sergeant? Hexwell turned back. You want this, Sergeant? Sharp called. He took a chip of stone out of his pocket. He'd found it when he'd untied the rag from the musket's lock and realised that Hexwell had substituted the stone for the flint when he'd pretended to inspect Sharp's musket. No use to me, Sergeant, Sharp said. Here. He tossed the stone at Hexwell, who ignored it. Instead, the sergeant spat and turned away. Thanks, Tom, Sharp said, for it had been Garrard who had supplied him with a spare flint. Worth being in the army to see that, Garrard said, and all around him men laughed to have seen Hexwell and Morris defeated. Eyes to your front, lads, Ensign Fitzgerald called. The Irish Ensign was the youngest officer in the company, but he had the confidence of a much older man. Got some shooting to do. Sharp pushed back into his file. He brought out the musket, folded the leather over the flint, and seated it in a dog head then looked up to see that the mass of the enemy was now just a hundred paces away. They were shouting rhythmically, and pausing occasionally to let a trumpet sound or a drum flourish a ripple, but the loudest sound was the beat of their feet on the dry earth. Sharp tried to count the column's front rank, but kept losing count as enemy officers marched slantwise across the column's face. There had to be thousands of the tiger troops, all marching like a great sledgehammer to shatter the two-deep line of redcoats. "'Cutting it fine, aren't we?' a man complained. "'Wait, lads, wait,' Sergeant Green said calmly. The enemy now filled the landscape ahead. They came in a column formed of sixty ranks of fifty men, three thousand in all, though to Sharp's inexperienced eye it seemed as if there must be ten times that number.' None of the Tipu's men fired as they advanced, but held their fire just as the 33rd were holding theirs. The enemy's muskets were tipped with bayonets, while their officers were holding deeply curved sabres. On they came, and to Sharp, who was watching the column from the left of the line so that he could see its flank as well as its leading file, the enemy formation seemed as unstoppable as a heavily loaded farm wagon that was rolling slowly and inexorably toward a flimsy fence. He could see the enemy's faces now. They were dark, with black moustaches and oddly white teeth. The tiger men were close, so close, and their chant began to dissolve into individual war shouts. Any second now, Sharp thought, and the heavy column would break into a run and charge with levelled bayonets. Twenty-third! Colonel Wellesley's voice called out sharply from beneath the regiment's colours. Make ready! Sharp put his right foot behind his left so that his body half turned to the right. Then he brought his musket to hip height and pulled the hammer back to full cock. It clicked solidly into place, and somehow the pent-up pressure of the gun's main spring was reassuring. To the approaching enemy it seemed as though the whole British line had half turned, and the sudden movement, coming from men who had been waiting so silently, momentarily checked their eagerness. Above the tiger troops of Mysore, beneath a bunch of flags on the ridge where the guns fired, a group of horsemen watched the column. Was the Tipo himself there? Sharp wondered. And was the Tipo dreaming of that far-off day when he had broken three and a half thousand British and Indian troops and marched them off to captivity in his capital at Seringapatam? The cheers of the attackers were filling the sky now, but still Colonel Wellesley's voice was audible over the tumult. Present! Seven hundred muskets came up to seven hundred shoulders. The muskets were tipped with steel, seven hundred muskets aimed at the head of the column, and about to blast seven hundred ounces of lead at the leading ranks of that fast-moving, confident mass that was plunging straight toward the pair of British colours, under which Colonel Arthur Wellesley waited. The tiger men were hurrying now, their front rank breaking apart as they began running. The wagon was about to hit the fence. Arthur Wellesley had waited six years for this moment. He was twenty-nine years old and had begun to fear that he would never see battle, but now at last he would discover whether he and his regiment could fight, and so he filled his lungs to give the order that would start the slaughter. 
Colonel Jean Goudin sighed. Then, for the thousandth time in the last hour, he fanned his face to drive away the flies. He liked India, but he hated flies, which made India quite hard to like. But on balance, despite the flies, he did like India, not nearly as much as he liked his native Provence, but where on earth was as lovely as Provence? Your Majesty, he ventured diffidently, then waited as his interpreter struggled to gain the Tipu's attention. The interpreter was exchanging Goudin's French for the Tipu's Persian tongue. The Tipu did understand some French, and he spoke the local Canarese language well enough. But he preferred Persian, for it reminded him that his lineage went back to the great Persian dynasties. The Tipu was ever mindful that he was superior to the darker-skinned natives of Mysore. He was a Muslim, he was a Persian, and he was a ruler. While they were mostly Hindus, and all of them, whether rich, poor, great, or lowly, were his obedient subjects. Your Majesty, Colonel Goudin tried again. Colonel, the Tipu was a short man inclined to plumpness, with a moustached face, wide eyes, and a prominent nose. He was not an impressive-looking man, but Goudin knew the Tipu's unprepossessing appearance disguised a decisive mind and a brave heart. Although the Tipu acknowledged Goudin, he did not turn to look at the colonel. Instead, he leaned forward in his saddle, with one hand clasped over the tiger hilt of his curved sabre. As he watched his infantry march on the infidel British, the sword was slung on a silken sash that crossed the pale yellow silk jacket that the Tipu wore above chintz trousers. His turban was of red silk and pinned with a gold badge showing a tiger's mask. The Tipu's every possible accoutrement was decorated with the tiger, for the tiger was his mascot and inspiration. But the badge on his turban also incorporated his reverence for Allah, for the tiger's snarling face was formed by a cunning cipher that spelled out a verse of the Koran: "The Lion of God is the conqueror." Above it, pinned to the turban's brief white plume and brilliant in the day's sunlight, there glittered a ruby the size of a pigeon's egg. Colonel, the Tipu said again. It might be wise, Your Majesty," Goudin suggested hesitantly. "If we advance cannon and cavalry onto the British flank." Goudin gestured to where the thirty-third waited in its thin red line to receive the charge of the Tipu's column. If the Tipu threatened a flank of that fragile line with cavalry, then the British regiment would be forced to shrink into square, and thus deny three quarters of their muskets a chance to fire at the column. The Tipu shook his head. We shall sweep that scum away with our infantry, Kuda, then send the cavalry against the baggage. He let go of his sword's hilt to touch his fingers fleetingly together. Please Allah. And if it does not please Allah, Kuda asked, and suspected that his interpreter would change the insolence of the question into something more acceptable to the Tipu. Then we shall fight them from the walls of Seringapatam. The Tipu answered, and turned briefly from watching the imminent battle to offer Colonel Goudin a quick smile. It was not a friendly smile, but a feral grimace of anticipation. We shall destroy them with cannon, Colonel. The Tipu continued with relish, and shatter them with rockets. And in a few weeks, the monsoon will drown their survivors. And after that, if Allah pleases, we shall hunt fugitive Englishmen from here to the sea. If Allah pleases. Gouda said resignedly. Officially, he was an adviser to the Tipu, sent by the Directorate in Paris, to help Mysore defeat the British, and the patient Gouda had just done his best to give advice, and it was none of his fault if the advice was spurned. He brushed flies from his face, then watched as the thirty-third brought their muskets to their shoulders. When those muskets flamed, the Frenchman thought. The front of the Tipu's column would crumple like a honeycomb hit by a hammer, but at least the slaughter would teach the Tipu that battles could not be won against disciplined troops, unless every weapon was used against them: cavalry to force them to bunch up in protection, 
then artillery and infantry to pour fire into the massed ranks. The Tipu surely knew that, yet he had insisted on throwing his three thousand infantry forward without cavalry support. And Gudan could only suppose that either the Tipu believed Allah would be fighting on his side this afternoon, or else he was so consumed by his famous victory over the British fifteen years before that he believed he could always beat them in open conflict. Gudan slapped at flies again. It was time, he thought, to go home. Much as he liked India, he felt frustrated. He suspected that the government in Paris had forgotten about his existence. And he was keenly aware that the Tipu was not receptive to his advice. He did not blame the Tipu. Paris had made so many promises. But no French army had come to fight for Mysore, and Goudin sensed the Tipu's disappointment, and even sympathized with it, while Goudin himself felt useless and abandoned. Some of his contemporaries were already generals, even little Bonaparte, a Corsican whom Goudin had known slightly in Toulon, now had an army of his own, while Jean Goudin was stranded in distant Mysore, which made victory all the more important, and if the British were not broken here, then they would have to be beaten by the master artillery and rockets that waited on Seringapatam's walls. That was also where Goudin's small battalion of European soldiers was waiting, and Seringapatam, he suspected, was where this campaign would be decided. And if there was victory, and if the British were thrown out of southern India, then Goudin's reward would surely be back in France, back home, where the flies did not swarm like mice. The enemy regiment waited with levelled muskets. The Tipu's men cheered and charged impetuously onward. The Tipu leaned forward, unconsciously biting his lower lip as he waited for the impact. Goudin wondered whether his woman in Seringapatam would like Provence, or whether Provence would like her, or maybe it was time for a new woman. He sighed, slapped at flies, then involuntarily shuddered. For beneath him the killing had begun. Fire! Colonel Wellesley shouted. Seven hundred men pulled their triggers and seven hundred flints snapped forward onto frizzens. The sparks ignited the powder in the pans. There was a pause as the fire fizzed through the seven hundred touch holes. Then an almighty crackling roar as the heavy muskets flamed. The brass butt of the gun slammed into Sharp's shoulder. He had aimed the weapon at a sashed officer leading the enemy column, though even at sixty yards range it was hardly worth aiming a musket, for it was a frighteningly inaccurate weapon. But unless the ball flew high, it ought to hit someone. He could not tell what damage the volley had caused, for the instant the musket banged into his shoulder, his vision was obscured by the filthy bank of rolling smoke coughed out of the seven hundred musket muzzles. He could hardly hear anything either, for the sound of the rear rank muskets going off close beside his head had left his ears ringing. His right hand automatically went to find a new cartridge from his pouch. But then, above the ringing in his ears, he heard the colonel's brusque voice Forward! Thirty third! Forward! Go on, boys, Sergeant Green called. Steady now, don't run, walk. Damn your eagerness, Ansett Fitzgerald shouted at the company. Hold your ranks, this ain't a race. The regiment marched into the musket smoke, which stank like rotting eggs. Lieutenant Lawford suddenly remembered to draw his sword. He could see nothing beyond the smoke, but imagined a terrible enemy waiting with raised muskets. He touched the pocket of his coat in which he kept the Bible given to him by his mother. The front rank advanced clear of the stinking smoke, fog, and suddenly there was nothing ahead but chaos and carnage. The seven hundred lead balls had converged on the front of the column to strike home with a brutal efficiency. Where there had been orderly ranks, there were now only dead men and dying men who writhed on the ground. The rearward ranks of the enemy could not advance over the barrier of the dead and injured. So they stood uncertainly as, out of the smoke, the seven hundred bayonets appeared. On the double! On the double! Don't let them stand! Colonel Wellesley called. Give them a cheer, boys! Sergeant Green called. Go for them now! Kill the buggers! 
Sharp had no thought of deserting now, for now he was about to fight. If there was any one good reason to join the enemy, it was to fight. Not to hurry up and do nothing, but to fight the king's enemies. And this enemy had been shocked by the awful violence of the close-range volley, and now they stared in horror as the redcoats screamed and ran toward them. The 33rd, released from the tight discipline of the ranks, charged eagerly. There was loot ahead. Loot and food and stunned men to slaughter. And there were few men in the 33rd who did not like a good fight. Not many had joined the ranks out of patriotism. Instead, like Sharp, they'd taken the king's shilling because hunger or desperation had forced them into uniform. But they were still good soldiers. They came from the gutters of Britain, where a man survived by savagery rather than by cleverness. They were brawlers and bastards, alley fighters with nothing to lose but tuppence a day. Sharp howled as he ran. The sepoy battalions were closing up on the left, but there was no need for their musketry now, for the Tipu's vaunted tiger infantry were not staying to contest the afternoon. They were edging backward, looking for escape. And then, out of the north where they'd been half hidden by the red-blossomed trees, the British and Indian cavalry charged to the sound of a trumpet's call. Lances were lowered, and sabres held like spears, as the horsemen thundered onto the enemy's flank. The Tipu's infantry fled. A few, the lucky few, scrambled back up the ridge, but most were caught in the open ground between the 33rd and the ridge's slope, and there the killing became a massacre. Sharp reached the pile of dead and leapt over them. Just beyond the bloody pile, a wounded man tried to bring up his musket, but Sharp slammed the butt of his gun onto the man's head, kicked the musket out of his enfeebled hands and ran on. He was aiming for an officer, a brave man who had tried to rally his troops and who now hesitated fatally. This book is continued on Disc 2. Sharp's Tiger by Bernard Cornwell Continued Disc 2 Sharp reached the pile of dead and leapt over them. Just beyond the bloody pile, a wounded man tried to bring up his musket, but Sharp slammed the butt of his gun onto the man's head, kicked the musket out of his enfeebled hands and ran on. He was aiming for an officer, a brave man who had tried to rally his troops and who now hesitated fatally. The man was carrying a drawn sabre. Then he remembered the pistol in his belt and fumbled to draw it but saw he was too late and turned to run after his men. Sharp was faster. He rammed his bayonet forward and struck the Indian officer on the side of the neck. The man turned, his sabre whistling as he sliced the curved blade at Sharp's head. Sharp parried the blow with the barrel of his musket. A sliver of wood was slashed off the stock as Sharp kicked the officer between the legs. Sharp was screaming a challenge, a scream of hate that had nothing to do with Mysore or the enemy officer, and everything to do with the frustrations of his life. The Indian staggered, hunched over, and Sharp slammed the musket's heavy butt into the dark face. The enemy officer went down, his sabre falling from his hand. He shouted something, maybe offering his surrender, but Sharp did not care. He just put his left foot on the man's sword arm, then drove the bayonet hard down into his throat. The fight might have lasted three seconds. Sharp advanced no farther. Other men ran past, screaming as they pursued the fleeing enemy. But Sharp had found his victim. He had thrust the bayonet so hard that the blade had gone clean through the officer's neck into the soil beneath, and it was hard work to pull the steel free. And in the end he had to put a boot on the dying man's forehead before he could tug the bayonet out. Blood gushed from the wound, then subsided to a throbbing pulse of spilling red, as Sharp knelt and began rifling the man's gaudy uniform, oblivious of the choking, bubbling sound that the officer was making as he died. Sharp ripped off the yellow silk sash and tossed it aside, together with the silver-hilted sabre and the pistol. The sabre's scabbard was made of boiled leather, nothing of any value to Sharp, but behind it was a small embroidered pouch, and Sharp drew out his knife, unfolded the blade, and slashed through the pouch's straps. He fumbled the pouch open to find that it was filled with nothing but dry rice and one small scrap of what looked like cake. 
He smelled it gingerly and guessed it was made of some kind of bean. He tossed the food aside and spat a curse at the dying man. Where's your bleeding money? The man gasped, made a choking sound. Then his whole body jerked as his heart finally gave up the struggle. Sharp tore at the tunic that was decorated with mauve tiger stripes. He felt the seams, looking for coins. Found none, so pulled off the wide red turban that was sticky with fresh blood. The dead man's face was already crawling with flies. Sharp pulled the turban apart, and there, in the very center of the greasy cloth, he found three silver and a dozen small copper coins. Knew you'd have something, he told the dead man, then pushed the coins into his own pouch. The cavalry was finishing off the remnants of the Tipu's infantry. The Tipu himself, with his entourage and standard bearers, had gone from the top of the ridge, and there were no cannon firing there either. The enemy had slipped away, abandoning their trapped infantry to the sabers and lances of the British and Indian cavalry. The Indian cavalry had been recruited from the city of Madras, and the East Coast states, which had all suffered from the Tipu's raids. And now they took a bloody revenge, whooping and laughing, as their blades cut down the terrified fugitives. Some cavalrymen, running out of targets, were already dismounted and searching the dead for plunder. The sepoy infantry, too late to join the killing, arrived to join the plunder. Sharp twisted the bayonet off his musket, wiped it clean on the dead man's sash, scooped up the saber and pistol. Then went to find more loot. He was grinning and thinking that there was nothing to this fighting business, nothing at all. A few shots in Flanders, one volley here, and neither fight was worthy of the name battle. Flanders had been a muddle, and this fight had been as easy as slaughtering sheep. No wonder Sergeant Hakeswell would live forever, and so would he. Sharp reckoned, because there was nothing to this business. Just a couple of bangs, and it was all over. He laughed, slid the bayonet into its sheath, and knelt beside another dead man. There was work to do and a future to finance. If only he could decide where it would be safe to run. Chapter Two. Sergeant Obadiah Hakeswell glanced about to see what his men were doing. Just about all of them were plundering, and quite right too. That was a soldier's privilege. Fight the battle, then strip the enemy of anything worth a penny. The officers were not looting, but officers never did, at least not so that anyone noticed them. But Hakeswell did see that Ensign Fitzgerald had somehow managed to get himself a jewelled sabre, that he was now flashing around like a shilling whore given a guinea fan. Mister Bloody Ensign Fitzgerald was getting above himself, in Sergeant Hakeswell's considered opinion. Ensigns were the lowest of the low. Apprentice officers, lads in silver lace, and Mister Bloody Fitzgerald had no business countermanding Hakeswell's orders, so Mister Bloody Fitzgerald must be taught his place. But the trouble was that Mister Fitzgerald was Irish, and Hakeswell was of the opinion that the Irish were only half civilized and never did understand their place. Most of them, anyway. Major She was Irish, and he was civilized, at least when he was sober. And Colonel Wellesley, who was from Dublin, was wholly civilized, but the Colonel had possessed the sense to make himself more English than the English, while Mister Bloody Fitzgerald made no pretence about his birth. See this, Hakeswell, Fitzgerald, sublimely unaware of Hakeswell's glaring thoughts, stepped across a body to show off his new saber. See what, sir? Damn blade is made in Birmingham. Will you credit that? Birmingham says so on the blade. See, made in Birmingham. Hakeswell dutifully examined the legend on the blade, then fingered the saber's pommel, which was elegantly set with a ring of seven small rubies. "Looks like glass to me, sir," he said dismissively, hoping he could somehow persuade Fitzgerald to relinquish the blade. "Nonsense," Fitzgerald said cheerfully. "Best rubies, bit small maybe, but I doubt the ladies will mind that. Seven pieces of glitter, that adds up to a week of sin, Sergeant. It was worth killing the rascal." For that, if you did kill him, Hakeswell thought sourly, as he stumped away from the exuberant ensign. More likely, picked it up off the ground, and Fitzgerald was right. 
Seven rubies, even small ones, would buy a lot of Nag's ladies. Nasty. Nag was a merchant from Madras, one of the many travelling with the army, and he had brought his brothel with him. It was an expensive brothel, officers only, or at least only those who could pay an officer's price, and that made Hagswell think of Mary Bickerstaff. Mrs. Mary Bickerstaff, she was a half and half, half Indian and half British, and that made her valuable, very valuable. Most of the women who followed the army were dark as Hades. And while Obadiah Hexwell had no distaste for dark skin, he did miss the touch of white flesh. So did many of the officers, and there was a guinea or two to be made out of that lust. Nag would pay well for a skin as pale as Mary Bickerstaff's. She was a rare beauty, Mary Bickerstaff, a beauty amongst a pack of ugly, rancid women. Hexwell watched as a group of the battalion's wives ran to take part in the plundering, and almost shuddered as he contemplated their ugliness. About two thirds of the wives were bibis, Indians, and most of those Hexwell knew were not properly married with the colonel's permission. While the rest were those lucky British women who had won the brutal lottery that had taken place on the night before the battalion had sailed from England. The wives had been gathered in a barrack room. Their names had been put into ten shakos, one for each company, and the first ten names drawn from each hat were allowed to accompany their husbands. The rest had to stay in Britain, and what happened to them there was anybody's guess. Most went on the parish, but parishes resented feeding soldiers' wives, so as like as not they were forced to become whores, barrack gate whores for the most part, because they lacked the looks for anything better. But a few, a precious few, were pretty, and none was prettier than Sergeant Bickerstaff's half and half widow. The women spread out among the dead and dying Mysoreans. If anything, they were even more efficient than their men at plundering the dead, for the men tended to hurry and so missed the hiding places where a soldier secreted his money. Hakeswell watched Flora Plackett, strip the body of a tall tiger-striped corpse. Whose throat had been slashed to the backbone by the slice of a cavalryman's saber, she did not rush her work, but searched carefully, garment by garment, then handed each piece of clothing to one of her two children to fold and stack. Hakeswell approved of Flora Plackett, for she was a large and steady woman, who kept her man in good order and made no fuss about a campaign's discomforts. She was a good mother too, and that was why Obadiah did not care that Flora Plackett. Was as ugly as a haversack. Mothers were sacred. Mothers were not expected to be pretty. Mothers were Obadiah Hakeswell's guardian angels, and Flora Plackett reminded Obadiah of his own mother, who was the only person in all his life who had shown him kindness. Biddy Hakeswell was long dead now. She died a year before the twelve-year-old Obadiah had dangled on a scaffold for the trumped-up charge of sheep stealing. And to amuse the crowd, the executioner had not let any of that day's victims drop from the gallows, but instead had hoisted them gently into the air, so that they choked slowly as their piss-soaked legs jerked in the death dance of the gibbet. No one had taken much notice of the small boy at the scaffold's end, and when the heavens had opened and the rain came down in bucketfuls to scatter the crowd, no one had bothered when Biddy Hakeswell's brother had cut the boy down and set him loose. Did it for your mother," his uncle had snarled. "God rest her soul. Now be off with you, and don't ever show your face in the dale again." Hakeswell had run south, joined the army as a drummer boy, had risen to sergeant, and had never forgotten his dying mother's words. "No one will ever get rid of Obadiah," she had said. "Not my Obadiah. Death's too good for him." The gallows had proved that. Touched by God, he was. Indestructible. A groan sounded near Hexwell, and the sergeant snapped out of his reverie to see a tiger-striped Indian struggling to turn onto his belly. Hexwell scurried over, forced the man onto his back again, and placed his halberd spear point at the man's throat. Money, Hexwell snarled, then held out his left hand and motioned the counting of coins. Money. The man blinked slowly, then said something in his own language. "I'll let you live, you bugger," 
Hakeswell promised, leering at the wounded man. Not that you'll live long. Got a ghoulie in your belly, see? He pointed at the wound in the man's belly where the bullet had driven home. Now, where's your money? Money. Pice. Dane. Pagodas. Annas. Rupees. The man must have understood, for his hand fluttered weakly toward his chest. Good boy, now. Hakeswell said, smiling again. Then his face jerked in its involuntary spasms as he pushed the spear point home, but not too quickly if he liked to see the realization of death on a man's face. You're a stupid bugger, too, Hakeswell said when the man's death throes had ended. Then he cut open the tunic and found that the man had strapped some coins to his chest with a cotton sash. He undid the sash and pocketed the handful of copper change. Not a big haul, but Hakeswell was not dependent on his own plundering to fill his purse. He would take a cut from whatever the soldiers of the Light Company found. They knew they would have to pay up or else face punishment. He saw Sharp kneeling beside a body and hurried across. Got a sword there, Sharpie? Hakeswell asked. Stole it, did you? I killed the man, Sergeant. Sharp looked up. Doesn't bleeding matter, does it, lad? You ain't permitted to carry a sword. Officer's weapon, a sword is. Mustn't get above your station, Sharpie. Get above yourself, boy, and you'll be cut down. So I'll take the blade. I will. Hakeswell half expected Sharp to resist, but the private did nothing as the sergeant picked up the silver hilted blade. Worth a few bob, I dare say. Hakeswell said appreciatively. Then he laid the sword's tip against the stock at Sharp's neck. Which is more than your worth, Sharpie. Too clever for your own good, you are. Sharp edged away from the sword and stood up. I ain't got a quarrel with you, Sergeant, he said. But you do, boy. You do. Hakeswell grimaced as his face went into spasm. And you know what the quarrels are bad, don't you? Sharp backed away from the sword. I ain't got a quarrel with you, he repeated stubbornly. I think our quarrel is called Mrs. Bickerstaff, Hakeswell said, and grinned when Sharp said nothing. I almost got you with that flint, didn't I? Would have had you flog raw, boy, and you'd have died of a fever within a week. A flogging does that in this climate. Where's a man down? A flogging does. But you got a friendly officer, don't you, Mr. Lawford? He likes you, does he? He prodded Sharp's chest with the sword's tip. Is that what it is? Officer's pet, are you? Mr. Lawford ain't nothing to me, Sharp said. That's what you say, but my eyes tell different. Hakeswell giggled. Sweet on each other, are you? You and Mr. Lawford? Ain't that nice, Sharpie, but it don't make you much use to Mrs. Bickerstaff, does it? Reckon she'd be better off with a real man. She ain't your business, Sharp said. Ain't my business? I'll listen to it. Hakeswell sneered, then prodded the sword forward again. He wanted to provoke Sharp into resisting, for then he could charge him with attacking a superior. But the tall young man just backed away from the blade. You listen, Sharpie, Hakeswell said, and you listen well. She's a sergeant's wife, not the oar of some common ranker like you. Sergeant Bickerstaff's dead, Sharp protested. So she needs a man, Hakeswell said, and a sergeant's widow doesn't get rogered by a stinking bird of dirt like you. It ain't right, ain't natural. It's beneath her station, Sharpie, and it can't be allowed. Says so in the scriptures. She can choose who she wants. Sharp insisted. Choose, Sharpie, choose. Hakeswell laughed. Women don't choose, you soft bugger. Women get taken by the strongest. Says so in the scriptures. And if you stand in my way, Sharpie... He pushed the sword hard forward. Then I'll have your spine laid open to the daylight. A lost flint? That would have been two hundred lashes, lad. But next time, a thousand. 
and laid on hard, real hard. Be blood and bones, boy, bones and blood. And who'll look after you, Mrs. Bickerstaff, then, eh? Tell me that. So you take your filthy hands off her. Leave her to me, Sharpie. He leered at Sharp, but still the younger man refused to be provoked, and Hakes will at last abandon the attempt. Worth a few guineas, his sword, the sergeant said again as he backed away. Obliged to you, Sharpie. Sharp swore uselessly at Hakes will's back, then turned as a woman hailed him from among the heaped bodies that had been the leading ranks of the Tipu's column. Those bodies were now being dragged apart to be searched. And Mary Bickerstaff was helping the work along. He walked toward her, and as ever was struck by the beauty of the girl. She had black hair, a thin face, and dark, big eyes that could spark with mischief. Now, though, she looked worried. What did Hicks will want? She asked. You. She spat, then crouched again to the body she was searching. He can't touch you, Richard. She said, "Not if you do your duty." The arm is not like that, and you know it. You've just got to be clever," Mary insisted. She was a soldier's daughter who had grown up in the Calcutta barrack lines. She'd inherited her dark Indian beauty from her mother, and learned the ways of soldiers from her father, who had been an engineer sergeant in the old forts garrison, before an outbreak of cholera had killed him and his native wife. Mary's father had always claimed she was pretty enough to marry an officer and so rise in the world, but no officer would marry a half caste, at least no officer who cared about advancement. And so, after her parents' death, Mary had married Sergeant Jem Bickerstaff of the Thirty Third, a good man, but Bickerstaff had died of the fever shortly after the army had left Madras to climb to the Mysore plateau, and Mary, at twenty-two, was now an orphan and a widow. She was also wise to the army's ways. If you're made up to Sergeant Richard, she told Sharp now, then Hicks will can touch you. Sharp laughed. Me, a sergeant? That'll be the day, lass. I made corporal once, but that didn't last. You can be a sergeant, she insisted, and you should be a sergeant. And Hicks will couldn't touch you if you were. Sharp shrugged. It ain't me he wants to touch, lass, but you. Mary had been cutting a tiger-striped tunic from a dead man, but now she paused and looked quizzically up at Sharp. She had not been in love with Jem Bickerstaff, but she had recognised that the sergeant was a good, kind man, and she saw the same decency in Sharp. It was not exactly the same decency for Sharp. She reckoned, had ten times Jem Bickerstaff's fire, and he could be as cunning as a snake when it suited him. But Mary still trusted Sharp. She was also attracted to him. There was something very striking about Sharp's lean, good looks. Something dangerous, she acknowledged, but very exciting. She looked at him for a few seconds, then shrugged. Maybe he won't dare touch me if we're married, she said. I mean, proper married with the colonel's permission. Married, Sharp said, flustered by the word. Mary stood. It ain't easy being a widow in the army, Richard. Every man reckons your loot. Aye, I know it's hard," Sharp said, frowning. He stared at her as he thought about the idea of getting married. Till now, he'd only been thinking of desertion, but maybe marriage was not such a bad idea. At least it would make it much harder for Hakesbill to get his hands on Mary's skin. And a married man, Sharp reckoned, was more likely to be promoted. But what was the point of rising an inch or two in the dunghill? Even a sergeant was still at the bottom of the heap. It was better to be out of the army altogether, and Mary, Sharp decided, would be more likely to desert with him if she was properly married to him. That thought made him nod slowly. I reckon I might like to be married, he said shyly. Me too. She smiled, and awkwardly, Sharp smiled back. For a moment, neither had anything to say. Then Mary excitedly fished in the pocket of her apron to produce a jewel she'd taken from a dead man. Look what I found. She handed Sharp a red stone, half the size of a hen's egg. You reckon it's a ruby? Mary asked eagerly. 
Sharp tossed the stone up and down. I reckon it's glass, lass, he said gently. Just glass. But I'll get you a ruby for a wedding gift. Just you watch me. I'll more than watch you, Dick Sharp, she said happily and put her arm into his. Sergeant Hakeswill, a hundred paces away, watched them, and his face twitched. While, on the edges of the killing place, where the looted and naked bodies lay scattered, the vultures came down, sidled forward, and began to tear at the dead. The Allied armies camped a quarter of a mile short of the place where the dead lay. The camp sprawled across the plain, an instant town where fifty thousand soldiers and thousands of camp followers would spend the night. Tents went up for officers, well away from the places where the vast herds of cattle were guarded for the night. Some of the cattle were beeves, being herded and slaughtered for food. Some were oxen that carried panniers filled with the eighteen and twenty-four pounder cannonballs that would be needed to blast a hole through the walls of Seringapatam. While yet others were bullocks that hauled the wagons and guns, and the heaviest guns, the big siege pieces, needed sixty bullocks apiece. There were more than two hundred thousand cattle with the army, but all were now scrawny, for the Tipu's cavalry was stripping the land of fodder as the British and Hyderabad armies advanced. The common soldiers had no tents. They would sleep on the ground close to their fires, but first they ate, and this night the feeding was good, at least for the men of the king's thirty-third, who had coins taken from the enemy dead to spend with the Binjaris, the merchant clans that travelled with the army and had their own private guards to protect their goods. The Binjaris also chickens, rice, flour, beans, and best of all, the throat-burning skins of Arak, which could make a man drunk even faster than rum. Some of the Binjaris also hired out whores, and the 33rd gave those men good business that night. Captain Morris expected to visit the famous green tents of Naig, the Binjari, whose stock in trade was the most expensive whores of Madras. But for now, he was stuck in his own tent, where, under the feeble light of a candle that flickered on his table, he disposed of the company's business. Or rather, Sergeant Hakeswill disposed of it, while Morris, his coat unbuttoned and silk stock loosened, sprawled in a camp chair. Sweat dripped down his face. There was a small wind, but the muslin screen hanging at the entrance to the tent took away its cooling effects. And if the screen was discarded, the tent would fill with savagely huge moths. Morris hated moths, hated the heat, hated India. God rosters, sir," Hakeswell said, offering the papers. "Anything I should know? Nothing, sir. Just like last week, sir. Ensign X made up the roster, sir. Good man, sir. Ensign X knows his place. You mean he does what you tell him to do?" Morris asked dryly. "Learning his trade, sir. Learning his trade, just like a good little ensign should. Unlike some, as I could mention." Morris ignored the sly reference to Fitzgerald, and instead dipped his quill in ink and scrawled his name at the foot of the rosters. "I assume Ensign Fitzgerald and Sergeant Green have been assigned all the night duty," he asked. "I need the practice, sir." "And you need your sleep, Sergeant?" "A punishment book, sir," Hakeswell said, offering the leather-bound ledger and taking back the guard roster, without acknowledging Morris's last comment. Morris leafed through the book. No floggings this week. We'll be soon, sir. We'll be soon. Private Sharp escaped you today, eh? Morris laughed. <laughs> Losing your touch, Obadiah. There was no friendliness in his use of the Christian name, just scorn. But Sergeant Hakeswell took no offence. Officers were officers. At least those above ensigns were proper officers, in Hakeswell's opinion. And such gentlemen had every right to be scornful of lesser ranks. I ain't losing nothing, sir," Hakeswell answered equably. "If the rat don't die first, shake, sir, then you puts the dog in again. That's how it's done, sir. Says so in the scriptures. Sick report, sir. Nothing new except that Sears has the fever, so he won't be with us long. But he won't be no loss, sir. No good to man or beast, Private Sears." Better off, Daddy is.
Are we done? Morris asked when he'd signed the sick report. But then a tactful cough sounded at the tent's opening, and Lieutenant Lawford ducked under the flap, and pushed through the muslin screen. Busy, Charles? Lawford asked Morris. Always pleased to see you, William. Morris said sarcastically. But I was about to go for a stroll. There's a soldier to see you, Lawford explained. Man's got a request, sir. Morris sighed as though he was too busy to be bothered with such trifles. But then he shrugged and waved a hand as if to suggest he was making a great and generous gesture by giving the man a moment of his precious time. Who? He asked. Private Sharp, sir. Trouble maker, sir. Aches were put in. He's a good man, Lawford insisted hotly, but then decided his small experience of the army hardly qualified him to make such judgments, and so diffidently, he added that it was only his opinion. But he seems like a good man, sir. He finished. Let him in. Morris said, "He sipped from a tin mug of arak while Sharp negotiated the muslin screen, and then stood to attention beneath the ridge pole." "At off, boy!" Axwell snapped. "Don't you know to take your hat off in the presence of an officer?" Sharp snatched off his shako. "Well," Morris asked. For a second, it seemed that Sharp did not know what to say, but then he cleared his throat. And staring at the tent wall, a few inches above Captain Morris's head, he at last found his voice. Permission to marry, sir? Morris grinned. Marry? Found yourself a bibby, have you? He sipped more arak, then looked at Hakeswell. How many wives are on the company strength now, Sergeant? Full complement, sir. No room for more, sir. Full up, sir. Not a vacancy to be had. Shall I dismiss Private Sharp, sir? This girl's on the complement. Lieutenant Lawford intervened. She's Sergeant Bickerstaff's widow. Morris stared up sharp. Bickerstaff, he said vaguely, as though the name was strange to him. Bickerstaff, fellow who died of a fever on the march. Is that right? Yes, sir. Hakeswell answered. Didn't know the man was even married. Morris said. Official wife was she? Very official, sir. Hakeswell answered. On the company strength, sir. Colonel's signature on the certificate, sir. Proper married before God and the army, sir. Morris sniffed and looked up at Sharp again. Why do you want to marry Sharp? Sharp looked embarrassed. Just do, sir, he said lamely. Can't say I disapprove of marriage, Morris said. Steady as a man does marriage, but a fellow like you, Sharp, can do better than a soldier's widow, can't you? Dreadful creatures, soldiers' widows. Used goods, private. Fat and greasy, like lumps of lard wrapped up in linen. Get yourself a sweet little bibby, man. Something that ain't yet run to seed. Very good advice, sir. Hakeswell said, his face twitching. Words of wisdom, sir. Shall I dismiss him, sir? Mary Bickerstaff is a good woman, sir. Lieutenant Lawford said. The lieutenant, whom Sharp had first approached with his request, was eager to do his best. Sharp could do a lot worse than marry Mary Bickerstaff, sir. Morris cut a cigar and lit it from the guttering candle that burned on his camp table. White is she? He asked negligently. Half bibby and half Christian, sir. Hakeswell said, but she had a good man for her husband. He sniffed, pretending that he was suddenly overcome with emotion. And Jem Bickerstaff ain't this month in his grave, sir. Too soon for the trollop to marry again. It ain't right, sir. Says so in the scriptures. Morris offered Hakeswell a cynical glance. Don't be absurd, Sergeant. Most army widows marry the next day. The ranks are hardly a high society, you know. But Jim Bickerstaff is a friend of mine, sir. Hakeswell said, sniffing again, and even coughing at an invisible tear. Friend of mine, sir. He repeated more hoarsely, and on his dying bed, sir, he begged me to look after his little wife, sir. I know she ain't through and through white. He told me, but she deserves to be looked after. His very dying words, sir. He bloody hated you. Sharp could not resist the words. Quiet in front of an officer. Hakeswell shouted, "Speak when you're spoken to, boy. In other words, keep your filthy mouth buttoned like God wanted it." Morris frowned as though Hakeswell's loud voice was giving him a headache. Then he looked up at Sharp. 
I'll talk to Major She about it, Sharp. If the woman is on the strength and wants to marry, then I don't suppose we can stop her. I'll talk to the Major. You're dismissed. Sharp hesitated, wondering whether he should thank the captain for the laconic words. But before he could say anything, Hakeswell was bawling in his ear. About turn. Smartly now. Hat on. Quick march. One, two, one, two. Smartly now. Mind the bleeding curtain, boy. This ain't a pig style like what you grew up in, but an officer's quarters. Morris waited till Sharp was gone, then looked up at Lawford. Nothing more, Lieutenant. Lawford guessed that he too was dismissed. You will talk to Major Shee, Charles, he pressed Morris. I just said so, didn't I? Morris glared up at the lieutenant. Lawford hesitated, then nodded. Good night, sir, he said, and ducked under the muslin screen. Morris waited until he was certain that both men were out of earshot. Now what do we do? He asked Hakeswell. Tell a silly bugger that Major She refused permission, sir. And Willie Lawford will talk to the Major and find out that he didn't, or else he'll go straight to Wellesley. Lawford's uncle is on the staff, or had you forgotten that? Use your wits, man. Morris slapped at a moth that had managed to slip through the screen. What do we do? He asked again. Hakeswell sat on a stool opposite the camp table. He scratched his head, glanced into the night, then looked back to Morris. He's a sharp one. Sharp he is. Slippery. But I'll do him. He paused. Of course, sir, if you helped, it'd be quicker. Much quicker. Morris looked dubious. The girl will only find herself another protector, he said. I think you're wasting my time, Sergeant. What, me, sir? No, sir, not at all, sir. I'll have the girl, sir, just you watch. A nasty nag says you can have all you want of her, free and gratis, sir, like you ought to. Morris stood, pulled on his jacket, and picked up his hat and sword. You think I'd share your woman, Hexwell? The captain shuddered. And get your pox. Pox, sir, me, sir. Hexwell stood. Not me, sir, clean as a whistle I am, sir. Cured, sir. Mercury. His face twitched. Ask the surgeon, sir, he'll tell ya. Morris hesitated, thinking of Mary Bickerstaff. He thought a great deal about Mary Bickerstaff. Her beauty ensured that, and men on campaign were deprived of beauty. And so Mary's allure only increased with every mile the army marched westward. Morris was not alone. On the night when Mary's husband had died, the 33rd's officers, at least those who had a mind for such games, had wagered which of them would first take the widow to their bed, and so far none of them had succeeded. Morris wanted to win, not only for the fourteen guineas that would accrue to the successful seducer, but because he had become besotted by the woman. Soon after she had become a widow, he'd asked Mary to do his laundry, thinking that thereby he could begin the intimacy he craved, but she'd refused him with a lacerating scorn. Morris wanted to punish her for that scorn, and Hakeswell, with his intuition for other men's weaknesses, had sensed what Morris wanted and promised he would arrange everything. Naig, Hakeswell assured his bitter officer, had a way of breaking reluctant girls. There ain't a bibby born that nasty can't break, sir. Hakeswell had promised Morris, and he'd give a small fortune for a proper white one. Not that Mrs. Bickerstaff's proper white, sir, not like a Christian, but in the dark she'd pass well enough. The sergeant needed Morris's help in ridding Mrs. Bickerstaff of Richard Sharp, and as an inducement he'd offered Morris the free run of Nag's tent. In return, Morris knew, Hakeswell would expect a lifetime's patronage. As Morris climbed the army's ranks, so Hakeswell would be drawn ineluctably after him, and with each step the sergeant would garner more power and influence. So when will you free Mrs. Bickerstaff of Sharp? Morris asked, buckling his sword belt. Tonight, sir, with your help. You'll be back here by midnight, I dare say. I might. If you are, sir, we'll do him. Tonight, sir. Morris clapped the cocked hat on his head, made sure his purse was in his coat-tail pocket, and ducked under the muslin. Carry on, Sergeant, he called back. Sir. 
Aches will stood to attention for a full ten seconds after the captain was gone, and then, with a sly grin twitching on his lumpy face, followed Morris into the night. Nineteen miles to the south lay a temple. It was an ancient place, deep in the country, one of the many Hindu shrines where the country folk came on high days and holidays to do honour to their gods, and to pray for a timely monsoon, for good crops, and for the absence of warlords. For the rest of the year, the temple lay abandoned, its gods and altars and richly carved spires, home to scorpions, snakes, and monkeys. The temple was surrounded by a wall through which one gate led, though the wall was not high and the gate was never shut. Villagers left small offerings of leaves, flowers, and food in niches of the gateposts, and sometimes they would go into the temple itself, cross the courtyard, and climb to the inner shrine, where they would place their small gifts beneath the image of a god. But at night, when the Indian sky lay black over a heat exhausted land, No one would ever dream of disturbing the gods. But this night, the night after battle, a man entered the temple. He was tall and thin, with white hair and a harsh, sun-tanned face. He was over sixty years old, but his back was still straight, and he moved with the ease of a much younger man. Like many Europeans who had lived a long time in India, he was prone to bouts of debilitating fever. But otherwise, he was in sterling health, and Colonel Hector McCandless ascribed that good health to his religion, and to a regimen that abjured alcohol, tobacco, and meat. His religion was Calvinism, for Hector McCandless had grown up in Scotland, and the godly lessons that had been whipped into his young, earnest soul had never been forgotten. He was an honest man, a tough man, and a wise one. His soul was old in experience, but even so, it was offended by the idols that reflected the small light of the lantern he had lit, once he was through the temple's ever-open gate. He had lived in India for over sixteen years now, and he was more accustomed to these heathen shrines than to the kirks of his childhood. But still, whenever he saw these strange gods with their multiplicity of arms, their elephant heads, their grotesquely coloured faces, and their cobra-hooded masks. He felt a stab of disapproval. He never let that disapproval show, for that would have imperiled his duty. And McCandless was a man who believed that duty was a master second only to God. He wore the red coat and the tartan kilt of the King's Scotch Brigade, a Highland regiment that had not seen McCandless's stern features for sixteen years. He'd served with the brigade for over thirty years, but lack of funds had obstructed his promotion, and so. With his colonel's blessing, he had accepted a job with the army of the East India Company, which governed those parts of India that were under British rule. In his time, he had commanded battalions of sepoys, but McCandless's first love was surveying. He had mapped the Carnatic coast, he had charted the Sundarbans of the Hooghly, and he had once ridden the length and breadth of Mysore. And while he'd been so engaged, he had learned a half dozen Indian languages, and met a score of princes, rajas, and nawabs. Few men understood India as McCandless did, which is why the company had promoted him to colonel and attached him to the British Army as its chief of intelligence. It was McCandless's task to advise General Harris of the enemy's strength and dispositions, and, in particular. To discover just what defences waited for the Allied armies when they reached Seringapatam, it was his search for that particular answer that had brought Colonel McCandless to this ancient temple. He had surveyed the temple seven years before, when Lord Cornwallis's army had marched against Mysore and back. Then McCandless had admired the extraordinary carvings that covered every inch of the temple's walls. The Scotsman's religion had been offended by so much decoration, but he was too honest a man to deny that the old stone workers had been marvellous craftsmen. For the sculpture here was as fine, if not finer, than anything produced in medieval Europe. The wan yellow light of his lantern, washed across caparisoned elephants, fierce gods, and marching armies, all made of stone. He climbed the steps to the central shrine. 
passed between its vast, squat pillars, and so went into the sanctuary. The roof here, beneath the temple's high carved tower, was fashioned into lotus blossoms. The idols stared blankly from their niches, with flowers and leaves drying at their feet. The colonel placed the lantern on the flagstone floor, then sat cross legged and waited. He closed his eyes, letting his ears identify the noises of the night beyond the temple's walls. McCandless had come to this remote temple with an escort of six Indian lancers, but he'd left that escort two miles away in case their presence should have inhibited the man he was hoping to meet. So now he just waited with eyes closed and arms folded, and after a while he heard the thump of a hoof on dry earth, the chink of a snaffle chain, and then once again silence, and still he waited with eyes closed. If you were not in that uniform, a voice said a few moments later, I would think you were at your prayers. The uniform does not disqualify me from prayer any more than does your uniform, the colonel answered, opening his eyes. He stood. Welcome, General. The man who faced McCandless was younger than the Scot, but every inch as tall and lean. Upper Rao was now a general in the forces of the Tipu Sultan, but once... Many years before, he'd been an officer in one of McCandless's sepoy battalions, and it was that old acquaintanceship, which had verged upon friendship, that had persuaded McCandless it was worth risking his own life to talk to Aparau. Aparau had served under McCandless's orders until his father had died, and then, trained as a soldier, he'd returned to his native Mysore. Today, he'd watched from the ridge as the Tipu's infantry had been massacred by a single British volley. The experience had made him sour, but he forced a grudging courtesy into his voice. So you are still alive, Major? Upper Rao spoke in Canarese, the language of the native Mysoreans. Still alive, and a full colonel now? McCandless answered in the same tongue. Shall we set? Upper Rao grunted, then sat opposite McCandless. Behind him, beyond the sunken courtyard where they were framed by the temple's gateway, were two soldiers. They were Appa Rao's escort, and McCandless knew they must be trusted men, for if the Tipu Sultan were ever to discover that this meeting had taken place, then Appa Rao and all his family would be killed. Unless, of course, the Tipu already knew and was using Appa Rao to make some mischief of his own. The Tipu's general was dressed in his master's tiger-striped tunic, but over it he wore a sash of the finest silk, and slung across his shoulder was a second silk sash, from which hung a gold-hilted sword. His boots were red leather, and his hat a coil of watered red silk, on which a milky blue jewel gleamed soft in the lantern's flickering light. "'You were at Malavelli today?' he asked McCandless. "'I was.' McCandless said, Malavelli was the nearest village to where the battle had been fought. So you know what happened? I know that Tipu sacrificed hundreds of your people. McCandless said, Your people, General, not his. Appa Rao dismissed the distinction. The people follow him. Because they have no choice. They follow, but do they love him? Some do, Appa Rao answered. But what does it matter? Why should a ruler want his people's love? Their obedience, yes, but love? Love is for children, McCandless, and for gods and for women. McCandless smiled, tacitly yielding the argument, which was not important. He did not have to persuade Appa Rao to treachery. The very presence of the Mysorean general was proof that he was already halfway to betraying the Tipu. But McCandless did not expect the general to yield gracefully. There was pride at stake here, and Appa Rao's pride was great and needed to be handled as gently as a cocked dueling pistol. Appa Rao had always been thus, even when he was a young man in the company's army, and McCandless approved of that pride. He'd always respected Appa Rao, and still did, and he believed Appa Rao returned the respect. It was in this belief that the colonel had sent a message to Seringapatam. The message was carried by one of the company's native agents, who wandered as a naked faker through southern India. The message had been concealed in the man's long, greasy hair, and it had invited Apparao to a reunion with his old commanding officer. 
The reply had specified this temple and this night as the rendezvous. Appa Rao was flirting with treachery, but that did not mean he was finding it either easy or pleasant. I have a gift, McCandless said, changing the subject for your Raja. He is in need of gifts. Then this comes with our most humble duty and high respect. McCandless took a leather bag from his sporran and placed it beside the lantern. The bag chinked as it was laid down, and though Appa Rao glanced at it, he did not take it. Tell your Raja, McCandless said, that it is our desire to place him back on his throne. And who will stand behind his throne? Appa Rao demanded. Men in red coats? You will, McCandless said, as your family always did. And you? the general asked. What do you want? To trade. That's the company's business. Trade. Why should we become rulers? Upper Rao sneered. Because you always do. You come as merchants, but you bring guns and use them to make yourselves into taxmen, judges, and executioners. Then you bring your churches. He shuddered. We come to trade, McCandless insisted equably. And what would you prefer, General, to trade with the British or be ruled by Muslims? And that, McCandless knew, was the question that had brought Appa Rao to this temple in the dark night. Mysore was a Hindu country, and its ancient rulers, the Wadayars, were Hindus like their people. But the Tipu's father, the fierce Haidar Ali, had come from the north and conquered their state, and the Tipu had inherited his father's stolen throne. To give himself a shred of legality, the Tipu, like his father before him, kept the old ruling family alive, but the Wadayars were now reduced to poverty and to ceremonial appearances only. The new Raja was scarce more than a child, but to many of Mysore's Hindus he was still their rightful monarch, though that was an opinion best kept secret from the Tipu. Upper Rao had not answered the Scotsman's question, so McCandless phrased it differently. Are you the last Hindu senior officer in the Tipu's army? There are others, Upper Rao said evasively, and the rest... Upper Rao paused, fed to his tigers. He eventually admitted, And soon, General, McCandless said softly, There will be no more Hindu officers in Mysore and some very fat tigers. And if you defeat us, you'll still not be safe. The French will come. Upper Rao shrugged. There are already Frenchmen in Seringapatam. They demand nothing of us. Yet... McCandless said ominously. But let me tell you what stirs in the white world, General. There's a new French general named Bonaparte. His army sits on the Nile now, but there's nothing in Egypt that interests Bonaparte or the French. They have their eyes farther east. They have their eyes on India. Bonaparte wrote to the Tipu earlier this year. Did the Tipu show you his letter? Upper Rao said nothing, and McCandless took the silence to mean that Rao knew nothing of the French general's letter. And so he took from his spar on a piece of paper. Do you speak French, general? No. Then let me translate for you. One of our agents copied the letter before it was sent, and it reads, La Sept Pluvieuse, La Cisse de la République Française. That's the 27th of January this year to the rest of us. And it says... I have reached the borders of the Red Sea with an innumerable and invincible army full of the desire to deliver you from the yoke of England. Here. McCandless offered Appa Rao the letter. There's plenty more in the letter like that. Take it back with you and find someone who will translate it. I believe you, Appa Rao said, ignoring the proffered letter. But why should I fear this French general? Because Bonaparte's alley is the Tipu, and Bonaparte's ambition is to take away the company's trade. His victory will strengthen the Muslims and weaken the Hindus, but if he sees my sir defeated, and if he sees your Raja back on his ancestor's throne, and if he sees a Hindu army led by General Appa Rao, then he will think twice before he takes ship. Bonaparte needs allies in this land, and without my sir he'll have none. 
Appa Rao frowned. This Bonaparte, he is a Muslim? He is friendly to Muslims, but he has no religion that we know of. If he's friendly to Muslims, Appa Rao observed, why should he not be friendly to Hindus also? Because as to the Muslims that he looks for allies, he'll reward them. Appa Rao shifted on the hard floor. Why should we not let this Bonaparte come and defeat you? Because then he will have made the Tipu all-powerful, and after that, General, how long will there be any Hindus in his service? And how long will the surviving Wadiyars live? The Tipu keeps the Wadiyar family alive, for he needs Hindu infantry and cavalry, but if he no longer has enemies, why will he need reluctant friends? And you will restore the Wadiyars? I promise, sir. Appa Rao looked past McCandless, gazing up at the small light reflecting off the serene image of a Hindu goddess. The temple was still here, as were all Mysore's temples, for though the Tipu was a Muslim, he had not torn down the Hindu sanctuaries. Indeed, like his father, the Tipu had restored some of the temples. Life was not hard under the Tipu, but all the same, the Tipu was not the ancestral ruler of Appa Rao's country. That ruler was a boy kept in poverty in a small house in a back alley of Seringapatam. And Appa Rao's hidden loyalty was to the Wadiyar dynasty, not to the Muslim interlopers. The general's dark eyes shifted to McCandless. You British captured the city seven years ago. Why didn't you replace the Tipu then? A mistake, McCandless admitted candidly. We thought he could be trusted to keep his promises, but we were wrong. This time, if God wills it, we shall replace him. A man bitten by a snake once does not let a snake live a second time. Appa Rao brooded for a while. Bats flickered in the courtyard. The two men in the gateway watched as McCandless let the silence stretch. The colonel knew it would not serve to pressure this general too hard, but McCandless also knew he did not need to press. Appa Rao might not be certain that a British victory would be in Mysore's best interest, but what would serve that interest in these hard, confusing times? Appa Rao's choice lay between the Muslim usurpers and foreign domination, and McCandless knew only too well of the simmering distrust that lay between Hindus and Muslims. It was that breach that the Scotsman was assaulting in the hope that he could widen the rift into full betrayal. Appa Rao finally shook his head, then raised an arm and beckoned. One of the two men in the gateway came running forward and knelt beside the general. He was a young man of startling good looks, black-haired, and with a fine, long face of strong bones and defiant eyes. Like Appa Rao, he wore the tiger tunic and had a gold-hilted sword slung at his hip. This is Kunra Singh. Appa Rao introduced the young man. He is the son of a cousin of mine. He announced the relationship vaguely, intimating that it was not close, and the commander of my bodyguard. McCandless looked into Kumwa Singh's eyes. Do your job well, my friend. Your master is valuable. Kumwa Singh smiled, and then, at a signal from Appa Rao, he took a roll of paper from inside his tunic. He unrolled the sheet and weighted its corners with a pistol, a knife, a handful of bullets, and the lantern. McCandless leaned forward. The scroll was a map, and it showed the big island in the river Calvary, on which the Tipu's capital of Seringapatam was built. The fortress town occupied the island's western tip, while beyond its walls, to the east, were pleasure gardens, suburbs, the Tipu's summer palace and the mausoleum where the fearsome Haida Ali was entombed. Appa Rao drew a knife from his belt. He tapped the island's northern bank, where it fronted the Corvary's main channel. That is where General Cornwallis crossed, but since then the walls have been strengthened. The French advised us how to do it. There are new guns on the walls, hundreds of them. He looked up into McCandless's eyes. I mean hundreds, McCandless. That is not an exaggeration. The Tipu is fond of cannon and rockets. He has thousands of rocket men and deep arsenals crammed with weapons. All this, he swept the knife's tip around the walls that faced the river, has been rebuilt 
refortified and given cannon and rockets. We have cannon too, McCandless said. Apa Rao ignored the comment. Instead, he tapped the knife against the western ramparts that overlooked the Corvary's smaller channel. At this time of year, McCandless, the river here is shallow. The crocodiles have gone to the deeper pools, and a man can walk across the river with dry knees. And when your army reaches Seringapatam, they will see that these walls, he tapped the western fortifications again, have not been rebuilt. They are made of mud bricks, and the rains have crumbled the rampart. It looks like a weak place, and you will be tempted to attack there. Do not, for that is where the Tipu wants you to attack. A beetle flew onto the map and crawled along the line marking the western walls. Apa Rao gently swept the insect aside. There is another wall there, a new wall, hidden behind that rampart, McCandless. And when your men get through the first wall, they will be in a trap. Here, he pointed to a bastion that connected the outer and inner walls. That used to be a water gate, but it's been blocked up and there are hundreds of pounds of gunpowder inside. Once your men are trapped between the two walls, the Tipu plans to blow the mine. Apa Rao shrugged. Hundreds of pounds of powder, McCandless, just waiting for you. And when that attack has failed, you will have no time to make another before the monsoon comes. And when the rains do come, the river will rise and the roads will turn to mud and you will be forced to retreat and every foot of your way back to Madras will be dogged by the Tipu's cavalry. That is how he plans to beat you. So we must attack anywhere but in the west. Anywhere but from the west, Apa Rao said. The new inner wall, he demonstrated on the map with the tip of his knife, extends all the way around the north. These other walls, he tapped the southern and eastern ramparts, look stronger, but don't be deceived. The west wall is a trap, and if you fall into it, it will be your death. He moved the weights off the corners of the map and let it roll itself up. Then he unshielded McCandless's lantern and held one end of the scroll in the candle flame. The paper blazed, lighting the intricate carvings of the shrine. The three men watched as the paper burned to ash. Anywhere but from the west, Apo Rao said. Then, after a moment's hesitation, he lifted the bag of gold coins from beside the lantern. All this will go to my Raja, he said. I shall keep none. I never expected you to, McCandless said. You have my thanks, General. I don't want your thanks. I want my Raja back. That is why I came. And if you disappoint me, then you English will have a new enemy. I'm a Scot. But you would still be my enemy, Apa Rao said. Then turned away, but paused and looked back from the inner shrine's threshold. Tell your general that his men should be gentle with the people of the city. I will tell General Harris. Then I shall look to see you in Seringapatam. Apa Rao said heavily. Me and thousands of others, McCandless said. Thousands? Apa Rao's tone mocked the claim. You may have thousands, Colonel, but the Tipu has tigers. He turned and walked to the temple's outer gateway, followed by Kunwa Singh. McCandless burned the copy of Bonaparte's letter, waited another half hour, and then, as silently as he had come to the temple, he left it. He would join his escort, sleep a few hours, then ride with his precious secret to the waiting army. Few men of the 33rd slept that night for the excitement of fighting and beating the Tipu's vaunted troops had filled them with a nervous energy. Some spent their loot on Arak, and those fell asleep soon enough. But the others stayed around their fires and relived the day's brief excitement. For most of the troops it had been their first battle, and on its slim evidence they built a picture of war and their own valour. Mary Bickerstaff sat with Sharp and listened patiently to the tales. She was accustomed to soldiers' stories and shrewd enough to know which men exaggerated their prowess and which pretended not to have been nauseated by the horrors of the dead and wounded. Sharp, after he returned from Captain Morris's tent with the news that the captain would ask Major Shee's permission for them to marry, was silent 
and Mary sensed he was not really listening to the tales, not even when he pretended to be amused or amazed. What is it? she asked him after a long while. Nothing, lass. Are you worried about Captain Morris? If he says no, we just ask Major She, Sharp said with a confidence he did not entirely feel. Morris was a bastard, but she was a drunk, and in truth there was little to choose between them. Sharp had an idea that Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Wellesley, the 33rd's real commanding officer, was a man who might be reasonable, but Wellesley had been temporarily appointed as one of the army's two deputy commanders, and had thus shrugged off all regimental business. We'll get our permission, he told Mary. So what's worrying you? I told you, nothing. You're miles away, Richard. He hesitated. Wish I was. Mary tightened the grip of her hand on his fingers, then lowered her voice to something scarce above a whisper. Are you thinking of running, Richard Sharp? He leaned away from the fire, trying to make a small private space where they could talk without being overheard. Got to be a better life than this, love, he said. Don't do it, Mary said fiercely, but laying a hand on his cheek as she spoke. Some of the men on the other side of the fire saw the tender gesture and greeted it with a chorus of jeers and whistles. Mary ignored them. They'll catch you, Richard, she insisted. Catch you and shoot you. Not if we run far enough. We? she asked cautiously. I want you, lass. Mary took hold of one of his hands and squeezed it. Listen! She hissed. Work to become a sergeant. Once you're a sergeant, you're made. You could even become an officer. Don't laugh, Richard. Mr. Lambert in Calcutta, he was a sergeant once, and he was a private before that. They made him up to ensign. Sharp smiled and traced a finger down her cheek. You're mad, Mary. I love you, but you're mad. I couldn't be an officer. You have to know how to read. I can teach you, Mary said. Sharp glanced at her with some surprise. He'd never known she could read, and the knowledge made him somewhat nervous of her. I wouldn't want to be an officer anyway, he said scathingly. Stuck up bastards, all of them. But you can be a sergeant, Mary insisted, and a good one. But don't run, love. Whatever you do, don't run. Is that the love, birds? Sergeant Hakeswill's mocking voice cut through their conversation. Oh, it's sweet, isn't it? Good to see a couple in love. Restores a man's faith in human nature, it does. Sharp and Mary sat up and disentangled their fingers as the sergeant stalked through the ring of men beside the fire. I want you, Sharpie, Hakeswell said when he reached their side. Got a message for you, I have. He touched his hat to Mary. Not you, ma'am, he said as she stood to accompany Sharp. This is men's business, Mrs. Bickerstaff. Soldier's business. No business for bibbies. Come on, Sharpie. Ain't got all night. Look lively now. He strode away, thumping the ground with the butt of his halberd, as he threaded his way between the fires. Got news for you, Sharpie, he called over his shoulder. Good news, lad, good news. I can marry, Sharp asked eagerly. Hakeswell threw a sly glance over his shoulder as he led Sharp toward the picketed lines of officers' horses. Now why would a lad like you want to marry? Why throw all your spunk away on one baby, eh? And that one used goods, too. Another man's leavings, that's all Mary Bickerstaff is. You should spread it about, boy. Enjoy yourself when you're still young. Hakeswell pushed his way between the horses to reach the dark space between the two picketed lines where he turned and faced Sharp. Good news, Sharp. You can't marry. Permission is refused. You want to know why, boy? Sharp felt his hopes crumbling. At that moment he hated Hakeswell more than ever, but his pride forced him not to show that hate, nor his disappointment. Why? he asked. I'll tell you why, Sharpie, Hakeswell said. And stand still, boy. When a sergeant condescends to torture, yet stand still, tension. That's better, lad. Better respect, like what is proper to show to a sergeant. 
His face twitched as he grinned. You want to know why, boy? Because I don't want you to marry her, Sharpie, that's why. I don't want little Mrs. Bickerstaff married to anyone. Not to you, not to me, not even to the King of England himself. God bless him. He was circling Sharp as he talked. And you know why, boy? He stopped in front of Sharp and pushed his face up toward the younger man. Because that Mrs. Bickerstaff is a bibby, Sharpie, with possibilities. Possibibibilities. He giggled at his joke. Got a future, she has. He grinned again, and the grin was suddenly twisted as his face shuddered with its distorting rictus. You familiar with Naig? Nasty Naig. Answer me, boy. I've heard of him, Sharp said. Fat bugger, Sharpie, he is fat and rich. Rides a elephant, he does, and he's got a dozen green tents. One of the army's followers, Sharpie, and rich as a rich man can be. Richer than you'll ever be, Sharpie, and you know why? Cause nasty Nike provides the officers with their women, that's why. And I'm not talking about those rancid slags the other eason's eyes out to you nasty common soldiers. I'm talking about the desirable women, Sharpie. Desirable. He lingered on the word. Nasty's got a whole herd of expensive whores, Sharpie, he does. All riding in those closed wagons with the coloured curtains. Full of officers meet those wagons are. Fat ones, skinny ones, dark ones, light ones, dirty ones, clean ones, tall ones, short ones, all sorts of ones. And all of them are prettier than you could ever dream of. But there ain't one of them as pretty as little Mrs. Bickerstaff. And there ain't one who looks as white as pretty little Mary does. And if there's one thing an English officer abroad once in a while, Sharpie, it's a spot of the white meat. That's the itch Morris has got, Sharpie. Got it bad, but he ain't no different from the others. They get bored with the dark meat, Sharpie. And the Indian officers, Naig tells me they'll pay a month's wages for a white. You following me, Sharpie? You and me marching in step, are we? Sharp said nothing. It had taken all his self-discipline not to hit the sergeant, and Hakeswell knew it and mocked him for it. Go on, Sharpie, hit me. Hakeswell taunted him, and when Sharp did not move, the sergeant laughed. You ain't got the guts, have you? I'll find a place and time, Sharp said angrily. Place and time? Listen to him. Hakeswell chuckled, then began pacing around Sharp once again. We've made a deal, Nasty and me. Like brothers we are, me and him, just like brothers. We understand each other, see? And Nasty's right keen on your little Mary. Profit there, you see, boy, and I'll get a cut of it. Mary stays with me, Sarge, Sharp said stubbornly. Married or not? Oh, Sharpie, dear me, you don't understand, do you? You didn't hear me, boy, did you? Nasty and me, we've made a bargain. Drunk to it, we did. And not in arak neither, but in proper gentleman's brandy. I give him little Mrs. Bickerstaff, and he gives me half the money she earns. He'll cheat me, of course he'll cheat me, but she'll make so much that it won't signify. She won't have a choice, Sharpie. She'll get snatched on the march and given to one of Nasty's men. One of the ugly buggers. She'll be raped wicked for a week, whipped every night, and at the end of it, Sharpie, she'll do whatever she's told. That's the way the business works, Sharpie. Says so in the scriptures, and how are you going to stop it? Answer me that, boy. Are you going to pay me more than Nasty will? Hakeswell stopped in front of Sharp, where he waited for an answer, and when none came, he shook his head derisively. You're a boy. Play an immense game, Sharpie, and you're going to lose unless you're a man. Are you man enough to fight me here, put me down, claim I was kicked by a horse in the night? You can try, Sharpie, but you're not man enough, are you? 
This book is continued on disc three. Sharp's Tiger by Bernard Cornwell. Continued. Disc three. Are you man enough to fight me here? Put me down? Claim I was kicked by a horse in the night? You can try, Sharpie, but you're not man enough, are you? Hit you, Sergeant, Sharp said. I'll be putting a flog in charge. I'm not duffed. Hakeswell made an elaborate charade of looking right and left. Ain't no one here but you and me, Sharpie. Nice and private. Sharp resisted the urge to lash out at his persecutor. I'm not duffed, he said again, stubbornly remaining at attention. But you are, boy, daft as a bucket. Don't you understand? I'm offering you the soldier's way out. Forget the bloody officers, you daft boy. You and me, Sharpie, we're soldiers. And soldiers set their arguments by fighting. Said so in the scriptures, don't it? So beat me now, lad. Beat me here and now. Beat me in a square fight. And I warrant you can keep Mrs. Bickerstaff all to your little self. He paused, grinning up into Sharp's face. That's a promise, Sharpie. Fight me now, fair and honest, and our argument's over. But you're not man enough, are you? You're just a boy. I'm not falling for your tricks, Sergeant, Sharp said. There ain't no trick, boy, Hakeswell said hoarsely. He stepped two paces away from Sharp, reversed his halberd and thrust its steel point hard into the turf. I can beat you, Sharpie. That's what I'm reckoning. I've been around a bit, know how to fight. You might be taller than me and you might be stronger, but you ain't as quick as me and you ain't half as dirty. I'm gonna pound the bloody guts out of you. And when I finish with you, I'll take little Mary down to Nasty's tents and earn me money. But not if you beat me, boy. You beat me, and on a soldier's honour, I'll persuade Captain Morris to let you marry. You've got me word on it, boy. A soldier's honour. He waited for an answer. You ain't a soldier, he said scornfully, when Sharp still kept quiet. You ain't got the guts. He stepped up to Sharp and slapped him hard across the face. Nothing but a lily, ain't you? Lieutenant Lawford's lily boy. Maybe that's why you ain't got the guts to fight for your Mary. The last insult provoked Sharp to hit Hakeswell. He did it hard and fast. He slammed a low blow into Hakeswell's belly that folded the sergeant over then cut his other hand hard up into the sergeant's face to split open Hakeswell's nose and jerk his head back up. Sharp brought up his knee, missed the sergeant's crotch, but his left hand had hold of Hakeswell's clubbed hair now, and he was just feeling with his right fingers for the squealing sergeant's eyeballs, when a voice was suddenly shouting close behind him. God! the voice called. God! Jesus! Sharp let go of his enemy, turned and saw Captain Morris standing just beyond the picketed horses. Ensign Hicks was with him. Hicks will have sunk onto the ground, but now hauled himself upright on the staff of his halberd. Assaulted me, sir, he did. The sergeant could scarcely speak for the pain in his belly. He went mad, sir, just mad, sir. Don't worry, sergeant. Hicks and I both saw it, Morris said. Came to check on the horses. Ain't that right, Hicks? Yes, sir. Hicks said. He was a small young man, very officious, who would never contradict a superior. If Morris claimed the clouds were made of cheese, Hicks would just stand to attention, twitch his nose, and swear blind he could smell cheddar. Plain case of assault, sir, the ensign said. Unprovoked assault. Guard! Morris shouted. Here! Now! Blood was pouring down Hicks's face, but the sergeant managed a grin. Got ya, Sharfie, he said softly. Got ya. Flogging offence, that. You bastard, Sharp said softly, and wondered if he should run. He wondered if he would stand any chance of making it safely away if he just sprinted into the dark. But Ensign Hicks had drawn his pistol, and the sound of the hammer being cocked stilled Sharp's tiny impulse to flee. A 
A panting Sergeant Green arrived with four men of the guard, and Morris pushed the horses aside to let them through. Arrest Private Sharp, Sergeant, he told Green. Close arrest. He struck Sergeant Hicksville, and Hicks and I witnessed the assault. Ensign Hicks will do the paperwork. Gladly, sir. Hicks agreed. The ensign was slurring his words, betraying that he'd been drinking. Morris looked at Sharp. It's a court martial offence, Sharp, the captain said. Then he turned back to Green, who had not moved to obey his orders. Do it! Sir, Green said, stepping forward. Come on, Sharpie. I didn't do nothing, Sergeant, Sharp protested. Come on, lad, it'll sort itself out, Green said quietly. Then he took Sharp's elbow and led him away. Hicks went with them, happy to please Morris by writing up the charge. Morris waited until the prisoner and his escort had gone, then grinned at Hakesville. The boy was faster than you thought, Sergeant. He's a devil, that one, sir, a devil. Broke me nose, he did. Hakesville gingerly tried to straighten the cartilage, and the bleeding nose made a horrible crunching noise. But his woman's ours. Tonight? Morris could not keep the eagerness from his voice. Not tonight, sir, Hakesville said in a tone that suggested the captain had made a foolish suggestion. There'll be enough trouble in the company with Sharp arrested, sir, and if we go after his bibby tonight, there'll be a rare brawl. Half the bastards are full of arrack. No, sir, wait till the bastards flog to death. Wait for that, sir, and then they'll all be meek as lambs. Meek as lambs. Flogging does that to men. Quartens them down, something proper a good whipping does. All be done in a couple of days, sir. Morris flinched as Hakeswell tried to straighten his nose again. You'd better see Mr. Micklewhite, Hakeswell. No, sir, don't believe in doctors, sir, except for the pox. I'll strap it up, sir, and soon be right as rain. Besides, watching Sharpie flog to be treatment enough. I reckon we done him, sir. You won't have long to wait, sir. Not long at all. Morris found Hakeswell's intimate tone unseemly and stepped stiffly back. Then I wish you a good night, Sergeant. Thank you kindly, sir, and the same to you, sir. And sweet dreams too, sir. Hakeswell laughed. Just as sweet as sweet can ever be, sir. For Sharpie was done. Chapter 3 Colonel McCandless woke as the dawn touched the world's rim with a streak of fire. The crimson light glowed bright on the lower edge of a long cloud that lay on the eastern horizon, like the smoke rill left by a musket volley. It was the only cloud in the sky. He rolled his plaid and tied it onto his saddle's cantle then rinsed his mouth with water. His horse, picketed close by, had been saddled all night in case some enemy discovered McCandless and his escort. That escort, six picked men of the 4th Native Cavalry, had needed no orders to be about the day. They grinned a greeting at McCandless, stowed their meagre bedding, then made a breakfast out of warm canteen water and a dry cake of ground lentils and rice. McCandless shared the cavalryman's meal. He liked a cup of tea in the mornings, but he dared not light a fire, for the smoke might attract the pestilential patrols of the Tipu's light cavalry. "'It will be a hot day, Saib, the Havildar remarked to McCandless. "'They're all hot,' McCandless answered. I "'Haven't had a cold day since I came here.' He thought for a second, then worked out that it must be Thursday, the 28th of March. It would be cold in Scotland today. And for an indulgent moment, he thought of Loch Haber and imagined the snow lying deep in Glen's scaddle and the ice edging the loch's foreshore. And though he could see the image clearly enough, he could not really imagine what the cold would feel like. He'd been away from home too long, and now he wondered if he could ever live in Scotland again. He certainly would not live in England not in Hampshire, where his sister lived with her petulant English husband. Harriet kept pressing him to retire to Hampshire, saying that they had no relatives left in Scotland, 
and that her husband had a wee cottage that would suit McCandless's declining years to perfection. But the colonel had no taste for a soft, plump English landscape, nor indeed for his soft, plump sister's company. Harriet's son, McCandless's nephew, William Lawford, was a decent enough young fellow, even if he had forgotten his Scottish ancestry. But young William was now in the army, here in Mysore, indeed, which meant that the only relative McCandless liked was close at hand, and that circumstance merely strengthened McCandless's distaste for retiring to Hampshire. But to Scotland? He often dreamed of going back, though whenever the opportunity arose for him to take the company's pension and sail to his native land, he always found some unfinished business that kept him in India. Next year, he promised himself, the year of our Lord, 1800, would be a good year to go home, though in truth he had promised himself the same thing every year for the last decade. The seven men unpicketed the horses and hauled themselves into their worn saddles. The Indian escort was armed with lances, sabres and pistols, while McCandless carried a claymore, a horse pistol, and a carbine that was holstered on his saddle. He glanced once toward the rising sun to check his direction, then led his men northward. He said nothing, but he needed to give these men no orders. They knew well enough to keep a keen lookout in this dangerous land. For this was the kingdom of Mysore, high on the southern Indian plateau, and as far as the horsemen could see, the land was under the rule of the Tipu Sultan. Indeed, this was the Tipu's heartland, a fertile plain, rich with villages, fields, and water cisterns. Only now, as the British army advanced and the Tipus retreated, the country was being blighted. McCandless could see six pillars of smoke showing where the Tipu's cavalry had burned granaries to make sure that the hated British could not find food. The cisterns would all have been poisoned, the livestock driven westward, and every storehouse emptied, thus forcing the armies of Britain and Hyderabad to carry all their own supplies on the cumbersome bullock carts. McCandless guessed that yesterday's brief and unequal battle had been an attempt by the Tipu to draw the escorting troops away from the precious baggage onto his infantry, after which he would have released his fearsome horsemen onto the wagons of grain and rice and salt. But the British had not taken the bait, which meant that General Harris's ponderous advance would continue. Say, another week, until they arrived at Seringapatam. Then they would face two months of short rations and searing weather, before the monsoon broke. But McCandless reckoned that two months was plenty enough time to do the job, especially as the British would soon know how to avoid the Tipu's trap at the western walls. He threaded his horse through a grove of cork trees, glad of the shade cast by the deep green leaves. He paused at the grove's edge to watch the land ahead, which dropped gently into a valley where a score of people were working in rice paddies. The valley, McCandless supposed, lay far enough from the line of the British advance to have been spared the destruction of its stores and water supply. A small village lay to the west of the rice paddies, and McCandless could see another dozen people working in the small gardens around the houses. And he knew that he and his men would be spotted as soon as they left the cover of the cork grove, but he doubted that any of the villagers would investigate seven strange horsemen. The folk of Mysore, like villagers throughout all the Indian states, avoided mysterious soldiers in the hope that the soldiers would avoid them. At the far side of the rice paddies were plantations of mango and date palms, and beyond them a bare hill crest. McCandless watched that empty crest for a few minutes, and then, satisfied that no enemy was nearby, he spurred his mare forward. The people working the rice immediately fled toward their homes, and McCandless swerved eastward to show them he meant no harm, then kicked the mare into a trot. He rode beside a grove of carefully tended mulberry trees, part of the Tipu's scheme to make silk weaving into a major industry of Mysore. Then he spurred into a canter as he approached the bed of the valley. His escort's curb and scabbard chains jingled behind him, 
as the horses pounded down the slope, splashed through the shrunken stream that trickled from the paddies, then began the gentle climb to the date palm grove. It was then that McCandless saw the flash of light in the mango trees. He instinctively dragged his horse around to face the rising sun and pricked back his spurs. He looked behind as he rode, hoping that the flash of light was nothing but some errant reflection. But then he saw horsemen spurring from the trees. They carried lances, and all of them were dressed in the tiger striped tunic. There were a dozen men at least. But the Scotsman had no time to count them properly, for he was plunging his spurs back to race his mare diagonally up the slope toward the crest. One of the pursuing horsemen fired a shot that echoed through the valley. The bullet went wide. McCandless doubted it had been supposed to hit anything, but was rather intended as a signal to alert other horsemen who must be in the area. For a second or two, the Scotsman debated turning and charging directly at his pursuers. But he rejected the idea. The odds were marginally too great, and his news far too important to be gambled on a skirmish. Flight was his only option. He pulled the carbine from its saddle holster, cocked it, then clapped his heels hard onto the mare's flank. Once over the crest, he reckoned there was a good chance he could outrun his pursuers. Goats scattered from the path as he spurred the mare over the ridge's skyline. One glance behind satisfied McCandless that he had gained a long enough lead to let him turn north without being headed off, and so he twitched the rein and let the mare run. A long stretch of open, tree-dotted country lay ahead, and beyond were thick stands of timber in which he and his escort could lose themselves. "Run, girl!" he called to the mare, then looked behind to make certain his escort was closed up and safe. Sweat dripped down his face. His scabbarded claymore thumped up and down on his hip, but the strong mare was running like the wind now. Her speed blowing the kilt back up around his hips. This was not the first time McCandless had raced away from enemies. He'd once run for a whole day, dawn to twilight, to escape a Mahratta band, and the mare had never once lost her footing. In all India, and that meant all the world, McCandless had no friend better than this mare. Run, girl," he called to her again. Then looked behind once more, and it was then that the Havildar shouted a warning. McCandless turned to see more horsemen coming from the trees to the north. There must have been fifty or sixty horsemen racing toward the Scotsman, and even as he swerved the mare eastward, he realized that his original dozen pursuers must have been the scouts for this larger party of cavalry, and that by running north, he'd been galloping toward the enemy rather than away from them. Now he rode toward the rising sun again, but there was no cover to the east, and these new pursuers were already dangerously close. He angled back to the south, hoping he might find some shelter in the valley beyond the crest. But then a wild volley of shots sounded from his pursuers. One bullet struck the mare. It was a fortunate shot, fired at the gallop, and ninety-nine times out of a hundred, such a shot would have flown yards wide. But this ball struck the mare's haunch, and my candles felt her falter. He slapped her rump with the stock of his carbine, and she tried to respond, but the bullet had driven close to the mare's spine, and the pain was growing, and she stumbled, neighed, yet still she tried to run again. Then one of her back legs simply stopped working, and the horse slewed around in a cloud of dust. McCandless kicked his feet out of the stirrups as his escort galloped past. The Havildar was already hauling on his reins, wheeling his horse to rescue McCandless, but the Scotsman knew it was too late. He sprawled on the ground, hurled free of the falling mare, and shouted at the Havildar, "Go, man!" He called, "Go!" But the escort had sworn to protect the colonel, and instead of fleeing, the Havildar led his men toward the rapidly approaching enemy. "Yet fools!" McCandless shouted after them. "Brave fools, but fools!" He was bruised, but otherwise unhurt, though his mare was dying. She was whinnying, and somehow she'd managed to raise the front part of her body on her forelegs, and seemed puzzled that her back legs would not work. She whinnied again, and McCandless knew she would never again run like the wind, and so he did the friend's duty. He went to her head, pulled it down by the reins, kissed her nose, and then put a bullet into her skull just above her eyes. She reared back, white-eyed, and with blood spraying. Then she slumped down. Her forelegs kicked a few times, 
and after that she was still. The flies came to settle on her wounds. The Havildar's small group rode full tilt into the enemy's pursuit. That enemy had been scattered by their gallop, and the Havildar's men were closed up, and so the first few seconds were an easy victory. Two lances found Mysore bellies, two sabres drew more blood, but then the main body of the enemy crashed into the fight. The Havildar himself had ridden clean through the leading ranks, leaving his lance behind, and he now looked back to see his men fighting desperately among a milling group of enemy horsemen. He drew his sabre and turned back to help. When he heard McCandless shouting, Go, man! Go! Go! McCandless yelled, pointing north. The Havildar could not take back the vital news McCandless had gained from Aparau, but it was still important to let the army know that the colonel had been captured. McCandless was not a vain man, but he knew his own value, and he left some careful instructions that might retrieve some of the damage of his capture. Those instructions offered a chance for the army to rescue McCandless, and that dangerous expedient was now the Scotsman's only hope of passing on Appa Rao's message. Go! McCandless roared as loudly as he could. The Havildar was caught between his duty to his men and his duty to obey McCandless's orders. He hesitated, and two of the pursuers swerved aside to pounce on him. That made up his mind. He clapped his spurs back, charged the pursuers, touched the rein at the last moment, and swung his sabre as he went past the two men. The blade sliced across the nape of the nearer man's neck, and then the Havildar curved away northwards, galloping free, while the rest of the enemy gathered about the survivors for the kill. McCandless threw down his pistol and carbine, drew his heavy claymore, and walked toward the melee. He never reached it, for an enemy officer detached himself from the clash of sabres and turned his horse to meet the Scotsman. The Mysorean officer sheathed his saber, then mutely held out his right hand for McCandless's blade. Behind him, the sabres and lances worked briefly, then the small fight was over, and McCandless knew that his escort, all but the Havadar, was dead. He looked at the horsemen above him. The sword, he said bitterly, belonged to my father and to his father. He spoke in English. The sword, McCandless said, was carried for Charles Stuart at Culloden. The officer said nothing, just held his hand out, his eyes steady on McCandless. The Scotsman slowly reversed his blade, then held the hilt upwards. The Mysorean officer took it and seemed surprised by the claymore's weight. What were you doing here? the officer asked in Canaries. Do you speak English? McCandless asked in that tongue, determined to hide his knowledge of India's languages. The officer shrugged. He looked at the old claymore, then slid it into his sash. His men, their horses white with sweat, gathered excitedly to stare at the captured heathen. They saw an old man, and some wondered if they'd captured the enemy's general. But the captive seemed to speak no language any of them knew, and so his identity would have to wait. He was given one of his dead escort's horses, and then, as the sun climbed towards its daily furnace heat, McCandless was taken west, toward the Tipu's stronghold. While behind him the vultures circled, and at last... Sure that nothing lived where the dust and flies had settled on the newly made corpses, flew down for their feast. It took two days to convene the court martial. The army could not spare the time in its march for the business to be done immediately, and so Captain Morris had to wait until the great ponderous horde was given a half day's rest to allow the straggling herds to catch up with the main armies. Only then was there time to assemble the officers and have Private Sharp brought into Major She's tent, which had one of its sides brailed up to make more space. Captain Morris laid the charge, and Sergeant Hicks will, and Ensign Hicks gave evidence. Major John She was irritable. The Major was irritable at the best of times, but the need to stay at least apparently sober had only shortened his already short Irish temper. He did not in truth enjoy commanding the 33rd, Major Shee suspected, when he was sober enough to suspect anything, 
that he did the job badly, and that suspicion had given rise to a haunting fear of mutiny. And mutiny, to Major She's befuddled mind, was signalled by any sign of disrespect for established authority. Private Sharp was plainly a man who brimmed over with such disrespect, and the offence with which he was charged was plain, and the remedy just as obvious. But the court proceedings were delayed because Lieutenant Lawford, who should have spoken for Sharp, was not present. Then where the devil is he? She demanded. Captain Fillmore, commander of the Fourth Company, spoke for Lawford. He was summoned to General Harris's tent, sir. She frowned at Fillmore. I knew he was supposed to be here. And we're just supposed to twiddle our thumbs while he takes tea with the general? She demanded. Captain Fillmore glanced through the tent's open side as if he hoped to see Lawford hurrying toward the court-martial, but there were only sentries to be seen. Lieutenant Lawford did ask me to assure the court, sir, that Private Sharp is a most reliable man, Fillmore said, fearing that he was not doing a very good job at defending the unfortunate prisoner. The lieutenant would have spoken most forcibly for the prisoner's character, sir, and begged the court to grant him the benefit of any doubt. Doubt, she snapped. What doubt is that? He struck a sergeant. He was seen doing it by two officers. And you think there's doubt? It's an open and shut case. That's what it is, open and shut. Fillmore shrugged. Ensign Fitzgerald would also like to say something. She glared at Fitzgerald. Not much to say, Ensign, I trust. Whatever it might take, sir, to prevent a miscarriage of justice. Fitzgerald, young and confident, stood and smiled at his commanding officer and fellow Irishman. I doubt we have a better soldier in the regiment, sir, and I suspect Private Sharp has given provocation. Captain Morris says not, she insisted, and so does Ensign Hicks. I cannot contradict the captain, sir, Fitzgerald said blandly. But I was drinking with Timothy Hicks earlier that evening, sir, and if his eyes weren't crossed by midnight, then he must possess a belly like a Flanders cauldron. She looked dangerously belligerent. Are you accusing a fellow officer of being under the influence of liquor? Fitzgerald reckoned that most of the 33rd's mess was ever under the influence of arak, rum, or brandy. But he also knew better than to say as much. I'm just agreeing with Captain Fillmore, sir, that we should give Private Sharp the benefit of the doubt. Doubt? She spat. There is no doubt. Open and shut. He gestured at Sharp, who stood hatless in front of his escort. Flies crawled on Sharp's face, but he was not allowed to brush them away. She seemed to shudder at the thought of Sharp's villainy. He struck a sergeant in full view of two officers, and you think there's doubt about what happened? He do, sir, Fitzgerald declared forcibly. Indeed, I do. Sergeant Hakeswell's face twitched. He watched Fitzgerald with loathing. Major She stared at Fitzgerald for a few seconds, then shook his head as though questioning the end's insanity. Captain Fillmore tried one last time. Fillmore doubted the evidence of Morris and Hicks, and he'd never trusted Hicks' will. But he knew she could never be persuaded to take the word of a private against that of two officers and a sergeant. Might I beg the court, Fillmore said respectfully, to suspend judgment until Lieutenant Lawford can speak for the prisoner? What can Lawford say in the name of God? She demanded. There was a flask of arrack waiting in his baggage, and he wanted to get these proceedings over and done. He had a brief, muttered conversation with his two fellow judges, both of them field officers from other regiments, then glared at the prisoner. You're a damned villain, Sharp, and the army has no need of villains. If you can't respect authority, then don't expect authority to respect you. Two thousand lashes! He ignored the shudder of astonishment and horror that some of the onlookers gave, and looked instead at the sergeant major. How soon can it be done? This afternoon's as good a time as any, sir. Bywaters answered stolidly. He had expected a flogging verdict, though not as severe as this, and he had already made the necessary arrangements. She nodded. Parade the battalion in two hours. These proceedings are over. He gave Sharp one foul glance, then pushed his chair back. He would need some arak, she thought if he was to sit his horse in the sun through two thousand lashes. Maybe he should have only given one thousand, for a thousand lashes were as liable to kill as two, 
but it was too late now. The verdict was given, and she's only hope of respite from the dreadful heat was his hope that the prisoner would die long before the awful punishment was finished. Sharp was kept under guard. His sentinels were not men from his own battalion, but six men from the king's twelfth, who did not know him, and who could therefore be trusted not to connive in his escape. They kept him in a makeshift pen behind She's tent, and no one spoke to Sharp there until Sergeant Green arrived. I'm sorry about this, Sharpie, Green said, stepping over the ammunition boxes that formed the crude walls of the pen. Sharp was sitting with his back against the boxes. He shrugged. I've been whipped before, Sergeant. Not in the army, lad. Not in the army. Here. Green held out a canteen. It's rum. Sharp uncorked the canteen and drank a good slug of the liquor. I didn't do nothing anyway, he said sullenly. Maybe, maybe not, Green said. But the more you drink, the less you'll feel. Finish it, lad. Tompkins says you don't feel a damn thing after the first thirty, Sharp said. I hope he's right, lad. I hope he's right. But you drink that rum anyway. Green took off his shako and wiped the sweat from his bald head with a scrap of rag. Sharp tipped the canteen again. And where was Mr. Lawford? He asked bitterly. You heard Sonny was called off to see the general. Green hesitated. But what could he have said anyway? He added. Sharp leaned his head against the box built wall. He could have said that Morris is a lying bastard and that Hicks will say anything to please him. No, he couldn't say that, lad, and you know it. Green filled a clay pipe with tobacco and lit it with his tinder box. He sat on the ground opposite Sharp and saw the fear in the younger man's eyes. Sharp was doing his best to hide it, but it was plainly there, and so it should be. For only a fool did not fear two thousand lashes, and only a lucky man came away alive. No man had ever actually walked away from such a punishment, but a handful had recovered after a month in the sick tent. Your Mary's all right, Green told Sharp. Sharp gave a sullen grimace. You know what Aikeswell told me that he was going to sell her as a whore. Green frowned. He won't, lad. He won't. And how will you stop him? Sharp asked bitterly, "She's been looked after now." Green reassured him, "The lads are making sure of that, and the women are all protecting her." But for how long? Sharp asked. He drank more of the rum, which seemed to be having no effect that he could sense. He momentarily closed his eyes. He knew he had been given an effective death sentence, but there was always hope. Some men had survived. Their ribs might have been bared to the sun, and their skin and flesh be hanging from their backs in bloody ribbons. Yet they lived. But how was he to look after Mary when he was bandaged in a bed? If he was even lucky enough to reach a sick bed instead of a grave, he felt tears pricking at his eyes, not for the punishment he faced, but for Mary. How long can they protect her? He asked gruffly, cursing himself for being so near to weeping. I tell you, she'll be all right," Green insisted. "You don't know Aikeswill," Sharp said. "Oh, but I do, lad. I do," Green said feelingly. Then paused. For a second or two, he looked embarrassed, then glanced up at Sharp. "The bastard can't touch her if she's married. Married proper, I mean, with the Colonel's blessing. That's what I thought." Green drew on the pipe. "If the worst does happen, Sharpie." He said, then stopped in embarrassment again. "I," Sharp prompted him. "Not that it will, of course," Green said hurriedly. "Billy Nixon survived a couple of thousand tickles, but you probably don't remember him, do you? Little fellow with a wall eye. He survived all right. He was never quite the same afterward, of course. But you're a tough lad, Sharpie, tougher than Billy. But if the worst does happen," Sharp reminded the sergeant. "Well," Green said, colouring. But then, at last, he summoned the courage to say what he'd come to say. I mean, if it don't offend you, lad, and only if the worst does happen, which of course it won't, and I pray it won't. But if it does, then I thought I might ask for Mrs. Bickerstaff's hand myself,、uh, if you follow my me meaning. Sharp almost laughed, but then the thought of two thousand lashes choked off even the beginnings of a smile. Two thousand. 
He'd seen men with backs looking like offal after just a hundred lashes, and how the hell was he to survive with another nineteen hundred strokes on top of that? Such survival really depended on the battalion surgeon. If Mr. Micklewhite thought Sharp was dying after five or six hundred lashes, he might stop the punishment to give his back time to heal before the rest of the lashes were given. But Micklewhite was not known for stopping whippings. The rumour in the battalion was that so long as the man did not scream like a baby and thus disturb the more squeamish of the officers, the surgeon would keep the blows coming, even if they were falling onto a dead man's spine. That was the rumour, and Sharp could only hope it was not true. Did you hear me, Sharpy? Sergeant Green interrupted Sharp's gloomy thoughts. I heard you, Sergeant. Sharp said, "So would you mind if I asked her? Have you asked her already?" Sharp said accusingly. "No," Green said hastily. "Wouldn't be right. Not while you're still, well, you know, alive." Sharp said bitterly, "It's only if the worst happens." Green tried to sound optimistic. "Which it won't. You won't need my permission when I'm dead, Sergeant." No, but if I can tell Mary you wanted her to accept me, then it'll help. Don't you see that? I'll be a good man to her, Sharpy. I was married before. I was only she died on me, but she never complained about me. No more than any woman ever complains. Anyhow, Axwell might stop you marrying her. Green nodded. Aye, he might, but I can't see how. Not if we tie the knot quick. I'll ask Major She, and he's always fair with me. Ask him tonight, see, but only if the worst happens. But you need a chaplain," Sharp warned the sergeant. The thirty-third's own chaplain had committed suicide on the voyage to Madras, and no marriage in the army was considered official unless it had the regimental commander's permission and the blessing of a chaplain. The lads in the old dozen tell me they've got a god walloper," Green said, gesturing at the soldiers guarding Sharp, "and he can do the splicing tomorrow. I'll probably have to slip the bugger a shilling, but Mary's worth a bob." Sharp shrugged. Ask her, Sergeant," he said. "Ask her. What else could he say? And if Mary was properly married to Sergeant Green, then she would be protected by the army's regulations. But see what happens to me first," Sharp added. "Of course I will, Sharpy. Hope for the best, eh? Never say die." Sharp drained the canteen. "There's a couple of things in my pack, Sergeant." A good pistol. I took off an Indian officer the other day, and a few coins. You'll give them to Mary. Of course I will. Green said, carefully hiding the fact that Hakeswell had already plundered Sharp's pack. She'll be all right, Sharpy. Promise you, lad. And some dark night, Sergeant. Give bloody Hakeswell a kick in for me. Green nodded. Be a pleasure, Sharpy. Be a pleasure. He knocked the ashes off his pipe against the ammunition boxes, then stood. I'll bring you some more rum, lad. The more, the better. The preparations for Sharp's flogging had all been made. Not that there were many, but it took a few moments to make sure everything was to the sergeant major's satisfaction. A tripod had been constructed out of three sergeants' halberds, their spear points uppermost, and lashed together so that the whole thing stood two feet higher than a tall man. The three halberd butts were sunk into the dry soil. Then a fourth halberd was firmly lashed crosswise on one face of the tripod, at the height of a man's armpits. Sergeant Hakeswill personally selected two of the thirty-thirds drummer boys. The drummer boys always administered the floggings, a small element of mercy and a bestial punishment. But Hakeswill made certain that the two biggest and strongest boys were given the task, and then he collected the two whips from the sergeant major, and made the boys practice on a tree trunk. Put your body into it, lads," he told them, "and keep the arm moving fast after the whips landed, like this." He took one of the whips and slashed it across the bark, then showed them how to keep the lash sliding across the target by following the stroke through. "I did it often enough when I was a drummer," he told them, "and I always did a good job. Best flogger in the battalion, I was second to none." Once he was sure their technique was sufficient for the task, he warned them not to tire too quickly, and then, with a pocket knife, he nicked the edges of the leather lashes so that their abrasions would tear at the exposed flesh as they were dragged across Sharp's back. "Do it well, lads," he promised them, "and there's one of these for each of you." He showed them one of the Tipu's gold coins, which had been part of the battle's loot. 
I don't want this bastard walking again. He told them, Nor do you neither, for if Sharpie ever finds his feet, he'll give you two a rare kicking. So make sure you finish the bastard off proper. Whip him bloody, then put him underground. Like it says in the scriptures. Hexworth coiled the two whips and hung them on the halberd that was mounted crosswise on the tripod, then went to find the surgeon. Mr. Micklewhite was in his tent where he was trying to tie his white silk stock in preparation for the punishment parade. He grunted when he saw Hicksville. You don't need more mercury, do you? He snarled. No, sir, cured, sir, thanks to your worship's skill, sir. Clean as a whistle I am, sir. Micklewhite swore as the knot in the damned stock loosened. He did not like Hicksville, but like everyone else in the regiment he feared him. There was a wildness in the back of Hakeswill's childlike eyes that spoke of terrible mischief. And though the sergeant was always punctilious in his dealings with officers, Micklewhite still felt obscurely threatened. So what do you want, sergeant? Major She asked me to say a word, sir. Couldn't speak to me himself? Oh, you know the major, sir. No doubt he's thirsty. A hot day. Hakeswill's face quivered in a series of tremors. It's about the prisoner, sir. What about him? Troublemaker, sir, known for it. A thief, a liar and a cheat. So he's a redcoat. So? So a major she ain't keen to see him back among the living, sir, if you follow me meaning. Uh, is this what I owe you for the mercury, sir? Hakeswell held up a gold coin, a high dairy, which was worth around two shillings and sixpence. The coin was certainly not payment for the cure of his pox, for that cost had already been deducted from the sergeant's pay, so Micklewhite knew it was a bribe. Not a great bribe, but half a crown could still go a long way. Micklewhite glanced at it, then nodded. Put it on the table, sergeant. Thank you, sir. Micklewhite tugged the silk stock tight, then waved Hakeswell off. He pulled on his coat and pocketed a gold coin. The bribe had not been necessary for Micklewhite's opposition to the coddling of flogging victims was well enough known in the battalion. Micklewhite hated caring for men who'd been flogged, for in his experience they almost always died, and if he did stop a punishment, then the recovering victim only cluttered up his sick cots. And if, by some miracle, a man was restored to health, it was only so he could be strapped to the triangle to be given the rest of his punishment, and that second dose almost always proved fatal, and so, all things considered, it was more prudent to let a man die at the first flogging. It saved money on medicine, and in Micklewhite's view it was kinder, too. Micklewhite buttoned his coat and wondered just why Sergeant Hexwell wanted this particular man dead. Not that Micklewhite really cared. He just wanted the bloody business over and done. The 33rd paraded under the afternoon's burning sun. Four companies faced the tripod while three were arranged at either side, so that the battalion's ten companies formed a hollow oblong, with the tripod standing in the one empty long side. The officers sat on their horses in front of their companies, while Major She, his aides, and the adjutant stood their horses just behind the tripod. Mr. Micklewhite, his head protected from the sun by a wide straw hat, stood to one side of the triangle. Major She, fortified by Arak, and satisfied that everything was in proper order, nodded to Bywaters. You will begin punishment, Sergeant Major. Sir, Bywaters acknowledged, then turned and bellowed for the prisoner to be fetched. The two drummer boys stood nervously with their whips in hand. They alone of the parading soldiers were in shirt sleeves, while everyone else was in full wool uniform. Women and children peered between the company intervals. Mary Bickerstaff was not there, Hakeswell had looked for her, wanting to enjoy her horror, but Mary had stayed away. The women who had come for the spectacle, like their men, were silent and sullen. Sharp was a popular man, and Hakeswell knew that everyone here was hating him for engineering this flogging. But Obadiah Hakeswell had never been concerned by such enmity. Power did not lie in being liked, but in being feared. Sharp was brought to the triangle. He was bareheaded and already stripped to the waist. The skin of his chest and back were as white as his powdered hair and contrasted oddly with his darkly tanned face. He walked steadily, for though he'd had the best part of a pint of rum in his belly, 
The liquor had not seemed to have the slightest effect. He did not look at either Hicksville or Morris as he walked to the tripod. Arms up, lad, the sergeant major said quietly. Stand against the triangle, feet apart. There's a good lad. Sharp obediently stepped up to the triangular face of the tripod. Two corporals knelt at his feet and lashed his ankles to the halberds, then stood and pushed his arms over the crosswise halberd. They pulled his hands down and tied them to the uprights, thus forcing his naked back up and outward. That way he could not sag between the triangle and so hoped to exhaust some of the blows on the halberd staffs. The corporals finished their knots, then stepped back. The sergeant major went to the back of the triangle and brought from his pouch a folded piece of leather that was deeply marked by tooth prints. Open your mouth, lad, he said softly. He smelled the rum on the prisoner's breath and hoped it would help him survive. Then he pushed the leather between Sharp's teeth. The gag served a double purpose. It would stifle any cries the victim might make and would stop him biting off his tongue. Be brave, boy, Bywater said quietly. Don't let the regiment down. Sharp nodded. Bywater stepped smartly back and came to attention. Prisoner ready for punishment, sir, he called to Major Shee. The Major looked to the surgeon. Is the prisoner fit for punishment, Mr. Micklewhite? Micklewhite did not even give Sharp a glance. Hail and fit, sir. Then carry on, Sergeant Major. Right, boys, the Sergeant Major said. Do your duty. Lay it on hard now and keep the strokes high, above his trousers. Drummer, begin! A third drummer boy was standing behind the floggers. He lifted his sticks, paused, then brought the first stick down. The boy to the right brought his whip hard down on Sharp's back. One! Bywaters shouted. The whip had left a red mark across Sharp's shoulder blades. Sharp had flinched, but the rope fetters restricted his movement, and only those close to the triangle saw the tremor run through his muscles. He stared up at Major Shee, who took good care to avoid the baleful gaze. Two, Bywaters called, and the drummer brought down his stick as the second boy planted a red mark crosswise on the first. Hakeswell's face twitched uncontrollably, but he was smiling under the rictus, for the drumbeat of death had begun. Colonel McCandless stood alone in the centre of the courtyard of the Tipu's inner palace, inside Seringapatam. The Scotsman was still in his full uniform, red-coated, tartan-kilted, and with his feather-plumed hat cocked on his head. Six tigers were chained to the courtyard's walls, and those tigers sometimes strained to reach him, but they were always checked by the heavy chains that quivered tautly whenever one of the muscled beasts sprang toward the Scotsman. McCandless did not move, and the tigers, after one or two fruitless lunges, contented themselves with snarling at him. The tiger's keepers, big men armed with long staves, watched from the courtyard entrance. It was those men who might receive the orders to unleash the tigers, and McCandless was determined to show them a calm face. The courtyard was covered with sand, its lower walls were of dressed stone, but above the stone, the palace's second story, was a riot of stuccoed teak that had been painted red, white, green, and yellow. That decorated second story was composed of Moorish arches, and McCandless knew just enough Arabic to guess that the writing incised above each arch was a surah from the Koran. There were two entrances to the courtyard, the one behind McCandless, through which he had entered, and where the tiger's keepers now stood, was a plain double gateway that led to a tangle of stables and storehouses behind the palace while in front of him, and evidently leading into the palace's staterooms, was a brief marble staircase rising to a wide door of black wood that had been decorated with patterns of inlaid ivory. Above that lavish door was a balcony that jutted out from three of the stuccoed arches. A screen of intricately carved wood hid the balcony, but McCandless could see that there were men behind the screen. He suspected the tipu was there, and, the Scotsman trusted, so was the Frenchman who had first questioned him. Colonel Goudin had struck him as an honest fellow, and right now, McCandless hoped, Goudin was pleading to let him live, though McCandless had taken good care not to offer the Frenchman his real name. He feared that the tipper would recognize it, 
and realized just what a prize his cavalry had taken. And so the Scotsman had given his name as Ross instead. McCandless was right. Colonel Goudin and the Tipu were both staring down through the screen. This Colonel Ross, the Tipu asked, he says he was looking for forage. Yes, sir, Goudin replied through the interpreter. You believe him? It was plain from his tone that the Tipu was sceptical. Goudin shrugged. Their horses are thin. The Tipu grunted. He had done his best to deny the advancing enemy any food, but the British had taken to making sudden marches north or south of their approach to enter territory where his horsemen had not yet destroyed the village's supplies. Not only that, but they'd brought a vast amount of food with them. Yet even so, the Tipu's spies reported that the enemy was going hungry. Their horses and oxen were especially ill-fed, so it was not unlikely that this British officer had been searching for forage. But why would a full colonel be sent on such an errand? The Tipu could find no answer to that, and the question fed his suspicions. Could he have been spying? Scouting, maybe, Good answered, but not spying. Spies do not ride in uniform, Your Majesty. The Tipu grunted when the answer was translated into Persian. He was a naturally suspicious man, as any ruler should be. But he consoled himself with the observation that whatever this Britisher had been doing, he must have failed. The Tipu turned to his entourage and saw the tall, dark-faced Aparau. You think this Colonel Ross was looking for food, General? Aparau knew exactly who Colonel Ross truly was, and what McCandless had been looking for. And worse, Rao now knew that his own treachery was in dire danger of being discovered, which meant that this was no time to look weak in front of the Tipu. But nor was Appa Rao ready to betray McCandless. That was partly because of an old friendship, and partly because Appa Rao half suspected he might have a better future if he was allied to the British. We know they're short of food, he said, and that man looks thin enough. So you don't consider him a spy? A spy or not? Appa Rao said coldly, he is your enemy. The Tipu shrugged at the evasive answer. His good sense suggested that the prisoner was not a spy. But why would he wear his uniform? But even if he was, that did not worry the Tipu over much. He expected Seringapatam was full of spies, just as he had two score of his own men marching with the British. But most spies, in the Tipu's experience, were useless. They passed on rumors, they inflated guesses, and they muddled far more than they ever made plain. Kill him, one of the Tipu's Muslim generals suggested. I shall think about it, the Tipu said, and turned back through one of the balcony's inner archways into a gorgeous room of marble pillars and painted walls. The room was dominated by his throne, which was a canopied platform eight feet wide, five foot deep, and held four feet above the tiled floor by a model of a snarling tiger that supported the platform's center and was flanked on each side by four carved tiger legs. Two silver gilt ladders gave access to the throne's platform, which was made of ebony wood, on which a sheet of gold, thick as a prayer mat, had been fixed with silver nails. The edge of the platform was carved with quotations from the Koran, the Arabic letters picked out in gold, while above each of the throne's eight legs was a finial in the form of a tiger's head. The tiger heads were each the size of a pineapple, cast from solid gold and studded with rubies, emeralds and diamonds. The central tiger, whose long, lean body supported the middle of the throne, was made of wood covered with gold, while its head was entirely of gold. The tiger's mouth was open, revealing teeth cut from rock crystal, between which a gold tongue was hinged so that it could be moved up and down. The canopy above the golden platform was supported by a curved pole, which, like the canopy itself, had been covered with sheet gold. The fringes of the canopy were made of strung pearls, and at its topmost point was a golden model of the fabulous Humach, the royal bird that rose from fire. The Humach, like the tiger finials, was studded with jewels. Its back was one solid, glorious emerald, 
and its peacock-like tail a dazzle of precious stones, arrayed so thickly that the underlying gold was scarcely visible. The Tippo did not spare the gorgeous throne a glance. He had ordered the throne made, but had then sworn an oath that he would never climb its silver steps nor sit on the cushions of its golden platform, until he had at last driven the British from southern India. Only then would he take his royal place beneath the pearl-strung canopy, and until that bright day, the tiger throne would stay empty. The Tippo had made his oath, and the oath meant that he would either sit on the tiger throne, or else he would die. And the Tippo's dreams had given him no presentiment of death. Instead, he expected to expand Mysore's frontiers, and to drive the infidel British into the sea where they belonged, for they had no business here. They had their own land, and if that far country was not good enough for them, then let them all drown. So the British must go, and if their destruction meant an alliance with the French, then that was a small price to pay for the Tipu's ambitions. He envisaged his empire spreading throughout southern India, then northward into the Maratha territories, which were all ruled by weak kings or child kings or by tired kings. And in their place, the Tipu would offer what his dynasty had already given to Mysore, a firm and tolerant government. The Tipu was a Muslim and a devout one, but he knew the surest way to lose his throne was to upset his Hindu subjects, and so he took good care to show their temples reverence. He did not entirely trust the Hindu aristocracy, and he had done what he could to weaken that elite over the years. But he wished only prosperity on his other Hindu subjects. For if they were prosperous, then they would not care what god was worshipped in the new mosque that the Tipu had built in the city. In time, he prayed, every person in Mysore would kneel to Allah, but until that happy day, he would take care not to stir the Hindus into rebellion. He needed them. He needed them to fight for him against the infidel British. He needed them to cut down the red-coated enemy before the walls of Seringapatam. For it was here, on his island capital, that the Tipu expected to defeat the British and their allies from Hyderabad. Here, in front of his tiger-muzzled guns, the redcoats would be beaten down like rice under a flail. He hoped they could be lured into the slaughter yard he was preparing on the western bastions. But even if they did not take the bait and came at the southern or eastern walls, he was still ready for them. He had thousands of cannon and thousands of rockets. And thousands of men ready to fight, he would turn their infidel army into blood, and he would destroy the army of Hyderabad, and then he would hunt down the Nizam of Hyderabad, a fellow Muslim, and torture him to a slow and deserved death, which the Tipu would watch from his canopied golden throne. He walked past the throne to stare at his favourite tiger. This one was a life-size model, made by a French craftsman. That showed a full-grown beast, crouching above the carved figure of a British redcoat. There was a handle in the tiger's flank, and when it was turned, the tiger's paw mauled at the redcoat's face. And reeds hidden within the tiger's body made a growling sound, and a pathetic noise that imitated the cries of a man dying. A flap opened in the tiger's flank, to reveal a keyboard on which an organ concealed in the tiger's belly could be played. But the Tipu rarely bothered with the instrument, preferring to operate the separate bellows that made the tiger growl and the victim cry out. He turned the handle now, delighting in the thin, reedy sound of the dying man. In a few days' time, he thought he would stun the very heavens with the genuine cries of dying redcoats. The Tipu finally let the tiger organ fall silent. I suspect the man is a spy. He said suddenly, "Then kill him." Appa Rao said, "A failed spy." The Tipu said, "You say he is a Scot?" He asked Gudan, "Indeed, Your Majesty." Not English then, no, sire. The Tipu shrugged at the distinction. Whatever his tribe, he is an old man. But is that reason to show him mercy? The question was directed at Colonel Gudan. Who, once it was translated, stiffened. He was captured in uniform, Your Majesty, so he does not deserve death. Gudan would have liked to add that it would be uncivilized even to contemplate killing such a prisoner, 
but he knew that Tipu hated being patronized, and so he kept silent. He is here, is he not? The Tipu demanded. Does that not deserve death? This is not his land, these are not his people, and the bread and water he consumes are not his. Kill him, your majesty, Goudin warned, and the British will show no mercy on any prisoners they take. I am full of mercy, the Tipu said, and mostly that was true. There was a time for being ruthless and a time for showing mercy, and maybe this Scotsman would be a useful pawn if there was a need to hold a hostage. Besides, the Tipu's dream the night before had promised well, and this morning's auguries had been similarly hopeful. So today he could afford to show mercy. Put him in the cells for now, the Tipu said. Somewhere in the palace, a French-made clock chimed the hour, reminding the Tipu that it was time for his prayers. He dismissed his entourage, then went to the simple chamber where, facing west toward Mecca, he made his daily obeisances. Outside, cheated of their prey, the tigers slunk back to the courtyard's shadows. One beast yawned, another slept. There would be other days and other men to eat, that was what the six tigers lived for, the days when their master was not merciful. While up in the inner palace with his back to the canopied throne of gold, Colonel Jean Goudin turned the tiger's handle. The tiger growled, the claws raked back and forth across the wooden, blood-painted flesh, and the red coat cried aloud. Sharp had not meant to cry out. Before the punishment had begun, he had been determined to show no weakness, and he had even been angry with himself that he'd flinched as the first blow fell. But that sudden pain had been so acute that he had involuntarily shuddered. Since then he'd closed his eyes and bitten down on the leather, but in his head a silent scream shrilled as the lashes landed one after the other. One hundred and twenty-three! Bywaters shouted hoarsely. The drummer boy's arms were tiring, but they still knew better than to slacken their efforts, for Sergeant Hakeswell was watching and savouring every blow. One hundred and twenty-four, Bywaters called. And it was then, through the silent scream that was filling his head, Sharp heard a whimper. Then he heard another, and realised that it was he who was making the noise. And so he snarled instead opened his eyes and stared his loathing at the bastard officers sitting on their horses a few paces away. He stared at them fixedly as if he could transfer the ghastly pain from his back onto their faces, but not one of them looked at him. They stared at the sky, they gazed at the ground. They all tried to ignore the sight of a man being beaten to death in front of their eyes. One hundred and thirty-six, Bywaters shouted and the drummer boy beat his instrument again. Blood had run down Sharp's back and stained the weave of his white trousers past his knees. More blood had spattered onto his greased and powdered hair, and still the lashes whistled down, and each blur of the leather thong splashed into the mess of broken flesh and ribbon skin, and more gleaming blood spurted away. One hundred and forty! Keep it high, boy, keep it high, not on the kidneys, Bywaters snapped. And the sergeant major looked across at the surgeon and saw that Micklewhite was staring vaguely up over the tripod's peak, his jowly face looking as calm as though he was merely idling away a summer's day. Want to look at him, Mr. Micklewhite, sir? The sergeant major suggested, but Micklewhite just shook his head. Keep going, lads, the sergeant major told the drummer boys not bothering to keep the disapproval from his voice. The flogging went on. Hexwell watched it with delight. But most of the men stared into the sky and prayed that Sharp would not cry aloud. That would be his victory, even if he died in achieving it. Some Indian troops had gathered around the hollow square to watch the flogging. Such punishments were not permitted in the East India Company, and most of the sepoys found it inexplicable that the British inflicted it upon themselves. One hundred and sixty-nine, Bywaters shouted, then saw a gleam of white under a lash. The gleam was instantly obscured by a trickle of blood. Can see a rib, sir, the sergeant major called to the surgeon. 
Micklewhite waved a fly away from his face and stared up at a small cloud that was drifting northward. Must be some wind up there, he thought, and it was a pity that there was none down here to alleviate the heat. A tiny droplet of blood splashed onto his blue coat, and he fastidiously backed farther away. One hundred and seventy-four, Bywaters shouted, trying to imbue the bare numbers with a tone of disapproval. Sharp was scarcely conscious now. The pain was beyond bearing. It was as if he was being burned alive and being stabbed at the same time. He was whimpering with each blow, but the sound was tiny, scarce loud enough to be audible to the two sweating boys, whose aching arms brought the lashes down again and again. Sharp kept his eyes closed. The breath hissed in and out of his mouth, past the gag. And the sweat and saliva dribbled down his chin and dripped onto the earth, where his blood showed as dark splashes in the dust. Two hundred and one, Bywaters called, and wondered if he dared take a sip of water from his canteen. His voice was becoming hoarse. Stop! A voice shouted. Two hundred and two. Stop! The voice shouted again, and this time it was as if the whole battalion had been suddenly woken from a sleep. The drummer boy gave a last hesitant tap, then let his hands fall to his sides, as Sergeant Major Bywaters held up his hand to stop the next stroke, which was already faltering. Sharp lifted up his head and opened his eyes, but saw nothing but a blur. The pain surged through him. He whimpered, then dropped his face again, and a string of spittle fell slowly from his mouth. Colonel Arthur Wellesley had ridden up to the tripod. For a moment, she and his aides looked at their colonel almost guiltily, as though they'd been caught in some illicit pastime. No one spoke, as the colonel edged his horse closer to the prisoner. Wellesley looked down sourly, then put his riding crop under Sharp's chin to lift up his head. The colonel almost recoiled from the look of hatred he saw in the victim's eyes. He pulled the crop away, then wiped its tip on his saddle cloth to remove the spittle. The prisoner has to be cut down, Major She," the Colonel said icily. "Yes, sir." She was nervous, wondering if he'd made some terrible mistake. "At once, sir," he added, though he gave no orders. "I dislike stopping a well-deserved punishment," Wellesley said loudly enough for all the nearby officers to hear. "But Private Sharp is to be taken to General Harris's tent as soon as he's recovered." "General Harris, sir." Major She asked in astonishment. General Harris was the commander of this expedition against the Tipu, and what possible business could the commanding general have with a half-flogged private? Yes, sir. Of course, sir. She added quickly, when he saw that his query had annoyed Wellesley. At once, sir. Then do it. Wellesley snapped. The colonel was a thin young man with a narrow face, hard eyes, and a prominently beaked nose. Many older men resented that the twenty-nine-year-old Wellesley was already a full colonel, but he came from a wealthy and titled family, and his elder brother, the Earl of Mornington, was Governor General of the East India Company's British possessions in India. So it was hardly surprising that the young Arthur Wellesley had risen so high, so fast. Any officer given the money to buy promotion, and lucky enough to possess relations who could put him in the way of advancement, was bound to rise. But even the less fortunate men who resented Wellesley's privileges were forced to admit that the young colonel had a natural and chilling authority, and maybe some thought even a talent for soldiering. He was certainly dedicated enough to his chosen trade, if that was any sign of talent. Wellesley nudged his horse forward and stared down as the prisoner's bonds were cut loose. Private Sharp. He spoke with utter disdain, as though he dirtied himself by even addressing Sharp. Sharp looked up, blinked, then made a guttural noise. Bywaters ran forward and worked the gag out of Sharp's mouth. Freeing the pad took some manipulation, for Sharp had sunk his teeth deep into the folded leather. "Good lad, now," Bywaters said softly. "Good lad, didn't cry, did you? Proud of you, lad." The sergeant major at last managed to work the gag free, and Sharp tried to spit. Private Sharp. 
Wellesley's disdainful voice repeated. Sharp forced his head up. Sir! The word came out as a croak. Sir! He tried again, and this time it sounded like a moan. Wellesley's face twitched with distaste for what he was doing. You ought to be fetched to General Harris's tent. Do you understand me, Sharp? Sharp blinked up at Wellesley. His head was spinning and the pain in his body was vying with disbelief at what he heard and with rage against the army. You heard the colonel, boy? Bywaters prompted Sharp. Yes, sir. Sharp managed to answer Wellesley. Wellesley turned to Micklewhite. Bandage him, Mr. Micklewhite. Put a salve on his back, whatever you think best. I want him compass mentis within the hour, you understand me? Within an hour? The surgeon said in disbelief, then saw the anger on his young colonel's face. Uh, yes, sir, he said swiftly. Uh, within an hour, sir. And give him clean clothes, Wellesley ordered the sergeant major before giving Sharp one last withering look and spurring his horse away. The last of the ropes holding Sharp to the tripod were cut away. She and the officers watched, all of them wondering just what extraordinary business had caused a summons to General Harris's tent. No one spoke as the sergeant major plucked away the last strands of rope from Sharp's right wrist, then offered his own hand. Here, lad, hold on to me, gently now. Sharp shook his head. I'm all right, sergeant major, he said. He was not, but he would be damned before he showed weakness in front of his comrades, and double damned before he showed it in front of Sergeant Hakeswill, who had watched aghast as his victim was cut down from the triangle. I'm all right, Sharp insisted, and he slowly pushed himself away from the tripod, then, tottering slightly, turned and took three steps. A cheer sounded in the light company. Quiet, Captain Morris snapped. Take names, Sergeant Hakeswill. Take names, sir. Yes, sir. Sharp staggered twice and almost fell, but he forced himself to stand upright and then to take some steady steps toward the surgeon. Report in for bandaging, sir, he croaked. This book is continued on disc four. Sharp's Tiger by Bernard Cornwell continued. Disc four. Sharp staggered twice and almost fell, but he forced himself to stand upright and then to take some steady steps toward the surgeon. Report in for bandaging, sir, he croaked. Blood had soaked his trousers. His back was carnage, but he had recovered most of his wits, and the look he gave the surgeon almost made Micklewhite flinch because of its savagery. Come with me, private, Micklewhite said. Help him, help him. Bywaters snapped at the drummer boys, and the two sweating lads dropped their whips and hurried to support Sharp's elbows. He'd managed to remain upright, but Bywaters had seen him swaying and feared he was about to collapse. Sharp half-walked and was half-carried away. Major Shee took off his hat, scratched his greying hair, and then, unsure what he should do, looked down at Bywaters. It seems we have no more business today, Sergeant Major. No, sir. She paused. It was also irregular. Dismiss the battalion, sir, Bywater suggested. She nodded, glad to have been given some guidance. Dismiss them, Sergeant Major. Yes, sir. Sharp had survived. Chapter 4 it seemed airless inside General Harris's tent. It was a large tent, as big as a parish marquee, and though both its wide entrances had been brailed back, there was no wind to stir the damp air trapped under the high ridge. The light inside the big tent was yellowed by the canvas to the colour of urine and gave the grass underfoot a dank, unhealthy look. Four men waited inside the tent. The youngest and most nervous was William Lawford, who, because he was a mere lieutenant, and by far the most junior officer present, was sitting far off to one side on a gilt chair of such spindly and fragile construction, it seemed a miracle that it had survived its transport on the army's wagons. 
Lawford scarcely dared move, lest he draw attention to himself. And so he sat awkward and uncomfortable, as the sweat trickled down his face and dripped onto the crown of his cocked hat, which rested on his thighs. Opposite Lawford, and utterly ignoring the younger man, sat his colonel, Arthur Wellesley. The colonel made small talk, but gruffly, as though he resented being forced to wait. Once or twice he pulled a watch from his fob pocket, snapped open the lid, glared at the revealed face, then restored the watch to his pocket without making a comment. General Harris, the army's commander, sat behind a long table that was spread with maps. The commander of the Allied armies was a trim, middle-aged man who possessed an uncommon measure of common sense and a great deal of practical ability, and both were qualities he recognized in his younger deputy, Colonel Wellesley. George Harris was an affable man, but now, waiting in the tense yellow gloom, he seemed distracted. He stared at the maps. He wiped the sweat from his face with a big blue handkerchief, but he rarely looked up to acknowledge the stilted conversation. Harris was uneasy, for, like Wellesley, he did not really approve of what they were about to do. It was not so much the irregularity of the action that concerned the two men, for neither was hidebound, but rather because they suspected that the proposed operation would fail, and that two good men, or rather one good man and one bad, would be lost. The fourth man in the tent refused to sit, but instead strode up and down between the tables and the scatter of flimsy chairs. It was this man who kept alive what little conversation managed to survive the tense, stiff, damp and airless atmosphere. He jollied his companions, he encouraged them, he tried to amuse them, though every now and then his efforts would fail, and then he would stride to one of the tent doorways and stoop to peer out. "'Can't be long now,' he would say each time, and then begin his pacing again. His name was Major General David Baird, and he was the senior and older of General Harris's two deputy commanders. Unlike his colleagues, he had discarded his uniform coat and waistcoat, stripping down to a dirty, much-darned shirt, and letting the braces of his breeches hang down to his knees. His dark hair was damp and tousled, while his broad face was so tanned that, to Lawford's nervous gaze, Baird looked more like a labourer than a general. The resemblance was even more acute because there was nothing delicate or refined about David Baird's appearance. He was a huge Scotsman, tall as a giant, broad-shouldered, and muscled like a coal heaver. It had been Baird who had persuaded his two colleagues to act, or rather he had persuaded General Harris to act much against that officer's better judgment. And Baird, frankly, did not give a tinker's damn whether Colonel Arthur bloody Wellesley approved or not. Baird disliked Wellesley, and bitterly resented the fact that the younger man had been made into his fellow second-in-command. Baird, never a man to let his grudges simmer unspoken, had protested Arthur Wellesley's appointment to Harris. If his brother wasn't Governor-General Harris, he'd never have promoted him. Not true, Baird, Harris had answered mildly. Wellesley has ability. Ability, my ass. He's got family, Baird spat. We all have family. Not prinkin' English popinjay families with too much bloody money. He was born in Ireland. Poor bloody Ireland, then. But he ain't Irish, Harrison, you know it. The man doesn't even drink, for God's sake. A little wine, maybe, but nothing I'd call a proper drink. Have you ever met an Irishman so sober? Some, quite a few. A good number, to tell the truth. Harris, a fair-minded man, had answered honestly. But is inebriation such a desirable quality in a military commander? Experience says, Baird had growled. Hell, man, you and I have seen some service. We've lost blood, and what's worse, they lost money. Nothing but money while he purchased his way up to Colonel. Man's never been in a battle. He will still make a very good second in command, and that's all that matters. Harris had insisted. And indeed, Harris had been well pleased with Wellesley's performance. The Colonel's responsibilities lay mainly with the army of the Nizam of Hyderabad, and he'd proved adept to persuading that potentate to submit to Harris's suggestions. A task Baird could never have performed even half so well, for the Scotsman was notorious for his hatred of all Indians. That hatred went back to the years Baird had spent in the dungeons of the Tipu Sultan in Seringapatam. 
Nineteen years before, in battle against the Tipu's fierce father, Haidar Ali, the young David Baird had been captured. He and the other prisoners had been marched to Seringapatam and there endured forty-four humiliating months of hot, damp hell in Haider Ali's cells. For some of those months, Baird had been manacled to the wall, and now the Scotsman wanted revenge. He dreamed of carrying his Scottish claymore across the city's ramparts and cornering the Tipu. And then, by Christ, the hell of Seringapatam's cells would be paid back a thousandfold. It was the memory of that ordeal and the knowledge that his fellow Scotsman, McCandless, was now doomed to endure it, that had persuaded Baird that McCandless must be freed. Colonel McCandless had himself suggested how that release might be achieved, for, before setting out on his mission, he'd left a letter with David Baird. The letter, which had instructions penned on its cover, saying that it should only be opened if McCandless failed to return, suggested that if the Colonel should be captured... And should General Harris feel it was important to make an attempt to release him? Then a trusted man should be sent secretly into Serengapatam, where he should contact a merchant named Ravi Shekhar. If any man has the resources to free me, it is Shekhar, McCandless had written, though I trust both you and the General will weigh well the risk of losing such a prized informant against whatever small advantages might be gained from my release. Baird had no doubt about McCandless's worth. McCandless alone knew the identities of the British agents in the Tipu's service, and no one in the army knew as much of the Tipu as did McCandless, and Baird was aware that should the Tipu ever discover McCandless's true responsibilities, then McCandless would be given to the Tigers. It was Baird who had remembered that McCandless's English nephew, William Lawford, was serving in the army, and Baird, who had persuaded Lawford to enter Seringapatam in an effort to free McCandless, and Baird, who had then proposed the mission to General Harris. Harris had initially scorned the idea, though he had unbent sufficiently to suggest that maybe an Indian volunteer could be found, who would stand a much greater chance of remaining undetected in the enemy capital. But Baird had vigorously defended his choice. This is too important to be left to some blackamoor, Harris. And besides, only McCandless knows which of the bastards can be trusted. Me, I wouldn't trust any damned one of them. Harris had sighed. He led two armies, 50,000 men, and all but 5,000 of those soldiers were Indians. And if blackamoors could not be trusted, then Harris, Baird, and everyone else was doomed. But the general knew he would make no headway against Baird's stubborn dislike of all Indians. I would like McCandless freed, Harris had allowed, but upon my soul, Baird, I can't see a white man living long in Seringapatam. We can't send a blackamoor, Baird had insisted. They'll take money from us, then go straight to the Tipu and get more money from him. Then you can kiss farewell to McCandless and to this Shekhar fellow. But why send this young man Lawford? Harris had asked. Because McCandless is a secretive fellow, sir, more cautious than most, and if he sees Willie Lawford, then he'll know that we sent him. But if it's some other British fellow, he might think it's some deserter sent to trap him by the Tipu. Never underestimate the Tipu, Harris. He's a clever little bastard. He reminds me of Wellesley. He's always thinking. Harris had grunted. He had resisted the idea, but it had still tempted him. For the Havildar who had survived McCandless's ill-starred expedition had returned to the army, and his story suggested that McCandless had met with the man he hoped to meet. And though Harris did not know who that man was, he did know that McCandless had been searching for the key to the Tipu city. Only a mission so important, a mission that would guarantee success, had persuaded Harris to allow McCandless to risk himself. And now McCandless was taken, and Harris was being offered a chance to fetch him back, or at least to retrieve McCandless's news, even if the colonel himself could not be fetched out of the Tipu's dungeons. Harris was not so confident of British success in the campaign that he could disregard such a windfall. But how in God's name is this fellow Lawford supposed to survive inside the city? Harris had asked. Easy! Baird had answered scornfully. The Tipo's only too damned eager for European volunteers, so we dress young Lawford in a private's uniform and he can pretend to be a deserter. 
He'll be welcomed with open arms. They'll be hanging bloody flowers round his neck and giving him first choice of the bibbies. Harris had slowly allowed himself to be persuaded, though Wellesley, once introduced to the idea, had advised against it. Lawford, Wellesley insisted, could never pass himself off as an enlisted man. But Wellesley had been overruled by Baird's enthusiasm, and so Lieutenant Lawford had been summoned to Harris's tent, where he had complicated matters by agreeing with his colonel. I'd dearly like to help, sir, he told Harris, but I'm not sure I'm capable of the pretense. Good God, man! Baird intervened. Spit and swear it ain't difficult. It will be very difficult, Harris had insisted, staring at the diffident lieutenant. He was doubtful whether Lawford had the resources to carry off the deception. For the lieutenant, while plainly a decent man, seemed guileless. Then Lawford had complicated matters still further. I think it would be more plausible, sir, he suggested respectfully, if I could take another man with me. Deserters usually run in pairs, don't they? And if the man is the genuine article, a ranker, it'll be altogether more convincing. Makes sense. Makes sense. Baird had put in encouragingly. You have a man in mind? Wellesley had asked coldly. His name's Sharp, sir, Lawford said. They're probably about to flog him. Then it'd be no damned use to you, Wellesley said in a tone which suggested the matter was now closed. I'll go with no one else, sir, Lawford retorted stubbornly, addressing himself to General Harris rather than to his colonel, and Harris was pleased to see this evidence of backbone. The lieutenant, it seemed, was not quite so diffident as he appeared. How many lashes is this fellow getting? Harris asked. Don't know, sir. He's standing trial now, sir, and if I wasn't here, I'd be giving evidence on his behalf. I doubt his guilt. The argument over whether to employ Sharp had continued over a midday meal of rice and stewed goat. Wellesley was refusing to intervene in the court martial or its subsequent punishment. Declaring that such an act would be prejudicial to discipline, but William Lawford stubbornly and respectfully refused to take any other man. It had, he said, to be a man he could trust. We could send another officer, Wellesley had suggested, but that idea had faltered when the difficulties of finding a reliable volunteer were explored. There were plenty of men who might go, but few were steady. And the steady ones would be too sensible to risk their precious commissions on what Wellesley scathingly called a fool's errand. So why are you willing to go? Harris had asked Lawford. You don't look like a fool. I trust I'm not, sir. But my uncle gave me the money to purchase my commission. Did he? By God, that's damned generous. And I hope I'm damned grateful, sir. Grateful enough to die for him? Wellesley put in sourly. Lawford had coloured, but stuck to his guns. I suspect Private Sharp is resourceful enough for both of us, sir. The decision whether or not to employ Sharp belonged, in the end, to General Harris, who privately agreed with Wellesley that to spare a man his well-earned punishment was to display a dangerous laxity. But at last, persuaded that extraordinary measures were needed to save McCandless, the general surrendered to Baird's enthusiasm. And so, with a heavy heart, Harris had ordered the unfortunate Sharp fetched to the tent, which was why, at long last, Private Richard Sharp limped into the wan yellow light cast through the tent's high canvas. He was dressed in a clean uniform, but everyone in the tent could see that he was still in dreadful pain. He moved stiffly, and the stiffness was not just caused by the yards of bandage that circled his torso, but by the agony of every movement of his body. He had tried to wash the blood out of his hair, and had succeeded in taking out most of the powder as well, so that when Colonel Wellesley told him to take off his shako, he appeared with curiously mottled hair. "I think you'd better sit, man," General Baird suggested, with a glance at Harris for his permission. "Fetch that stool," Harris ordered Sharp. Then saw that the private could not bend down to pick it up. Baird fetched the stool. "Is it hurting?" He asked sympathetically. "Yes, sir. It's supposed to hurt," Wellesley said curtly. "Pain is the point of punishment." He kept his back to Sharp, pointedly demonstrating his disapproval. "I do not like cancelling or flogging," Wellesley went on to no one in particular. "It erodes good order. 
Once men think their sentences can be curtailed, then God only knows what roguery they'll be up to. He suddenly twisted in his chair and gave Sharp an icy glare. If I had my way, Private Sharp, I'd march you back to the Triangle and finish the job. I doubt Private Sharp even deserved the punishment. Lawford dared to intervene, blushing as he did. The time for that sentiment, Lieutenant, was during the court-martial. Wellesley snapped, his tone suggesting that it would have been a wasted sentiment anyway. You've been lucky, Private Sharp, Wellesley said with distaste. I shall announce that you've been spared the rest of your punishment as a reward for fighting well the other day. Did you fight well? Sharp nodded. Killed my share of the enemy, sir. So I'm commuting your sentence. And tonight, damn your eyes, you'll reward me by deserting. Sharp wondered if he'd heard right. Decided it was best not to ask, and so he looked away from the colonel, composed his face, and stared fixedly at the wall of the tent. Have you ever thought about deserting, Sharp? General Baird asked him. Me, sir? Sharp managed to look surprised. Not me, sir. No, sir. Never crossed me mind, sir. Baird smiled. We need a good liar for this particular service, so maybe you're an excellent choice, Sharp. Besides, anyone who looks at your back will know why you wanted to desert. Baird liked that idea, and his face betrayed a sudden enthusiasm. In fact, if you hadn't already conveniently had yourself flogged, man, we might have had to give you a few lashes anyway. He smiled. Sharp did not smile back. Instead, he looked warily from one officer to the other. He could see that Mr. Lawford was nervous. Baird was doing his best to be friendly. General Harris's face was unreadable, while Colonel Wellesley had turned away in disgust. But Wellesley had always been a cold fish, so there was no point in trying to gain his approval. Baird was the man who'd saved him, a sharp guest, and that fitted with Baird's reputation in the army. The Scotsman was a soldier's general, a brave man and well-liked by the troops. Baird smiled again, trying to put Sharp at his ease. Let me explain why you're running, Sharp. Three days ago we lost a good man, a Colonel McCandless. The Tipu's forces captured him, and so far as we know, they took him back to Seringapatam. I want you to go to that city and be captured by the Tipu's forces. Are you understanding me this far? Yes, sir, Sharp said obediently. Good man. Now, when you reach Seringapatam, the Tipu will want you to join his army. He likes to have white men in his ranks, so you won't have any trouble taking his shilling. And once you're trusted, your job is to find Colonel McCandless and bring him out alive. Are you still following me now? Yes, sir, Sharp said stoically, and wondered why they did not first ask him to hop over to London and steal the crown jewels. Bloody idiots. Put a bit of gold lace on a man's coat and his brain turned to mush. Still, they were doing what he wanted them to do, which was kicking him out of the army. And so he sat very still, very quiet, and very straight. Not so much out of respect, but because his back hurt like the very devil every time he moved. You won't be going alone, Baird told Sharp. Lieutenant Lawford volunteered your services, and he's going as well. He'll pretend to be a private and a deserter, and your job is to look after him. Yes, sir, Sharp said, and hid his dismay that perhaps things were not going to be quite so easy after all. He could not just run, uh, not with Lawford tied to his apron strings. He glanced at the lieutenant, who gave him a reassuring smile. The thing is, Sharp, Lawford said, still smiling, I'm not too certain I can pass myself off as a private, but they'll believe you and you can say I'm a new recruit. A new recruit? Sharp almost laughed. You could no more pass the lieutenant off as a new recruit than you could pass Sharp off as an officer. He had an idea then, and the idea surprised him, not because it was a good idea, but because it implied he was suddenly trying to make this idiotic scheme work. Better if you said you was a company clerk, sir. He muttered the words too softly, made shy by the presence of so many senior officers. Speak up, man! Wellesley snarled. It would be better, sir, Sharp said so loudly that he was verging on insolence. If the lieutenant said he was a company clerk, sir. A clerk? Baird asked. Why? He's got soft hands, sir. Clean hands, sir. Clerks don't muck about in the dirt like the rest of us. And recruits, sir, they're usually just as filthy-handed as the rest of us. 
but not Clark, sir. Harris, who had been writing, looked up with a faint expression of admiration. Put some ink on his answer. Sharp still spoke to Baird, and he won't look wrong. I like it, Sharp. Indeed I do, Baird said. Well done. Wellesley sneered, then pointedly stared through one of the tent openings, as though he found the proceedings tiresome. General Harris looked at Lawford. You could manage to play the part of a disgruntled clerk, Lieutenant, he asked. Oh, indeed, sir. I'm sure, sir. Lawford at last sounded confident. Good, Harris said, laying down his pen. The general wore a wig to hide the scar where an American bullet had torn away a scrap of his skull on Bunker Hill. Now, unconsciously, he lifted a corner of the wig and scratched at that old scar. And I suppose once you reach the city, you contact this merchant. Remind me of his name, Baird. Ravi Shekhar, sir. And what if this fellow Shekhar ain't there? Harris asked, or won't help. There was silence after the question. The sentries outside the tent moved far enough away so they could not overhear the conversation. Stamped up and down, a dog barked. You have to anticipate these things, Harris said mildly, scratching again under his wig. Wellesley offered a harsh laugh, but no suggestion. If Ravi Shekhar won't help us, sir, Baird suggested, then Lawford and Sharp must get themselves into McCandless's jail, then find a way of getting themselves out. The Scotsman turned to Sharp. Were you by any chance a thief before you joined up? A heartbeat's hesitation, then Sharp nodded. Yes, sir. What kind of a thief? Wellesley asked in a disgusted voice, as though he was astonished to discover the ranks of his battalion contained criminals. And when Sharp did not answer, the colonel became even more irritable. A diver? A scamp? Sharp was surprised that his colonel even knew such slang. He shook his head indignantly, denying he'd ever been a mere pickpocket or a highwayman. I was a house boner, sir. He said, "I'm proper trained too." He added proudly, "In fact, he had done his share on the highway, not so much holding up coaches, as slicing the leather straps that held the passengers' portmanteaus on the backs of coaches. The job was done while the coach was speeding along a road, so that the noise of the hoofs and wheels would hide the sound of the tumbling luggage. It was a job for agile youngsters, and Sharp had been good at it. A house boner means he was a burglar." Wellesley translated for his two senior officers, unable to hide his scorn. Baird was pleased with Sharp's answers. "Do you still have a picklock, Private?" "Me sir, no sir, but I suppose I could find one sir if I had a guinea." Baird laughed, suspecting the true cost was nearer a shilling. But he still went to his coat, which was hanging from a hook on one of the tent poles, and fished out a guinea, which he tossed onto Sharp's lap. "Find one before tonight, Private Sharp," he said. For who knows? It might be useful. He turned to Harris, but I doubt it will come to that, sir. I pray it doesn't come to that, for I'm not sure that any man, even Private Sharp here, can escape from the Tipu's dungeons. The tall general turned back to Sharp. I was near four years in those cells, Sharp, and in all that time, not one man escaped. Not one. Baird paced restlessly as he remembered the ordeal. The Tipu's cells have barred doors with padlocks, so your picklock could take care of that. But when I was there, we always had four jailers in the daytime, and some days there were even jetties on guard. Jetties, sir? Lawford asked. Jetties, Lieutenant. The Tipu inherited a dozen of the bastards from his father. They're professional strongmen, and their favourite trick is executing prisoners. They have several ways of doing it. None of them pleasant. You want to know their methods?、Uh, no, sir," Lawford said hurriedly, blanching at the thought. Sharp was disappointed, but dared not ask for the details. Baird grimaced. "Very unpleasant executions, Lieutenant," he said grimly. "You still want to go?" Lawford remained pale, but nodded. "I think it's worth a try, sir." Wellesley snorted at the lieutenant's foolishness, but Baird ignored the colonel. At night the guards are withdrawn, he went on, but there's still a sentry. Just one, 
Sharp asked. Just one, Private, Baird confirmed. I can take care of one sentry, sir, Sharp boasted. Not this one, Baird said grimly, because when I was there he was eight feet long, if he was an inch. He was a tiger, Sharp, a man-eater, and the eight foot don't count his tail. He used to be put in the corridor every night, so pray you don't ever end up in the tipu cells. Pray that Ravi Shekhar will know how to get McCandless out. Or, at the very least, Harris intervened, pray that Shekhar can discover what McCandless knows, and that you can get that news out to us. So that's what we want of you, Baird said to Sharp with a brusque cheerfulness. Are you willing to go, man? Sharp reckoned it was all idiocy, and he did not much like the sound of the tiger, but he knew better than to show any reluctance. I reckon three is better than two thousand, sir. He said, Three? Baird asked, puzzled. Three stripes are better than two thousand lashes, sir. If we find out what you want to know, or else fetch this Colonel McCandless out of jail, sir. Can I be a sergeant? He asked the question of Wellesley. Wellesley looked enraged at Sharp's presumption, and for a second it was plain that he proposed to turn him down. But General Harris cleared his throat, and mildly remarked that it sounded a reasonable suggestion to him. Wellesley thought about opposing the general, then decided that it was most unlikely that Sharp would even survive this nonsense. And so, albeit reluctantly, he nodded. A sergeant stripes Sharp if you succeed. Thank you, sir, Sharp said. Baird dismissed him. Go with Lieutenant Lawford now, Sharp. He'll tell you what to do. And one other thing... The Scotsman's voice became urgent. For God's sake, man, don't tell a mother soul what you're doing. Wouldn't dream of it, sir, Sharp said, flinching as he stood up. Go then, Baird said. He waited till the two men were gone and sighed. A bright young fella, not Sharp, he spoke to Harris. A rogue, Wellesley interjected. I could provide you with a hundred others just as disreputable. Scum, all of them, and the only thing that keeps them from riot is discipline. Harris rapped the table to stop the squabbling of his two seconds in command. But will the rogue succeed? he asked. Not a chance, Wellesley said confidently. A woefully small chance, Baird admitted dourly, then added more vigorously. But even a small chance is worth it if we can get McCandless back. At the risk of losing two good men? Harris asked. One man who might become a decent officer, Wellesley corrected the general, and one man who's lost the world won't mourn for a second. But my canvas might hold the key to the city, General, Baird reminded Harris. True, Harris said heavily, then unrolled a map that had lain scrolled on the edge of his table. The map showed Seringa Patam, and whenever he gazed at it, he wondered how he was to set about besieging the city. Lord Cornwallis, who had captured the city seven years before, had assaulted the north side of the island, and then attacked the eastern walls. But Harris doubted that he would be given that route again. The Tipu would have been forewarned by that earlier success, which meant this new assault must come from either the south or the west. A dozen deserters from the enemy's forces had all claimed that the West Wall was in bad repair, and maybe that would give Harris his best chance. South or West, he said aloud, reiterating the problem he'd already discussed a score of times with his two deputies. But either way, gentlemen, the place is crammed with guns, thick with rockets, and filled with infantry, and we'll have only the one chance before the rains come. Just one... West or south, eh? He stared at the map, hoping against hope the McCandless could be fetched from his dungeon to offer some guidance. But that, he admitted to himself, was a most unlikely outcome, which meant the decision would inevitably be all his to make. The final decision could wait till the army was close to the city, and Harris had been given a chance to view the Tipu's defences. But once the army was ready to make camp, the choice would have to be made swiftly. And all things being equal, Harris was fairly sure which route he would choose. For weeks now his instinct had been telling him where to attack, but he worried that the Tipu might have foreseen the weakness in his city's defences. But there was no point in wondering whether the Tipu was outfoxing him. That way lay indecision. 
and so Harris tapped his quill on the map. My instincts tell me to attack here, gentlemen, right here. He was indicating the west wall. Across the river shallows and right through the weakest stretch of the walls. It seems the obvious place. He tapped the map again. Right here. Right here. Right where the tipper had set his trap. Allah, in his infinite mercy, had been good to the Tipu Sultan, for Allah, in his immeasurable wisdom, had revealed the existence of a merchant who was sending information to the British army. The man dealt in common metals, in copper, tin, and brass, and his wagons frequently passed through one of the city's two main gates, loaded with their heavy cargoes. God alone knows how many such cargoes had passed out of Seringapatam in the last three months, but at least the gate guards had searched the right wagon, the one that carried a coded letter, which, under interrogation, the wretched merchant had admitted contained a report of the strange work that was being done in the old closed gateway of the Western Wall. That work should have been a close secret, for the only men allowed near the gateway were Gudar's reliable European troops and a small band of the Tipu's Muslim warriors, whom he regarded as utterly trustworthy. The merchant, not surprisingly, was a Hindu, but when his wife was brought into the interrogation room and threatened with the red-hot pincers, the merchant had confessed the name of the Muslim soldier who had allowed himself to be suborned by the merchant's gold. And so much gold. A strong room filled with a metal, far more than the Tipu suspected could be earned from trading in tin, brass and copper. It was British gold, the merchant confessed, given him so he could raise rebellion inside Seringapatam. The Tipu did not consider himself a cruel man, but nor, indeed, did he think of himself as a gentle one. He was a ruler, and cruelty and mercy were both weapons of rulers. Any monarch who flinched from cruelty would not rule long, just as any ruler who forgot mercy would soon earn hatred. And so the Tipu tried to balance mercy with cruelty. He did not want the reputation of being lenient any more than he wanted to be judged a tyrant, and so he tried to use both mercy and cruelty judiciously. The Hindu merchant, his confession made, had pleaded for mercy, but the Tipu knew this was no time to show weakness. This was the time to let a shudder of horror ripple through the streets and alleys of Seringapatam. It was a time to let his enemies know that the price for treason was death. And so both the merchant and the Muslim soldier who had taken the merchant's gold were now standing on the hot sand of the inner palace's courtyard, where they were being guarded by two of the Tipu's favoured jetties. The jetties were Hindus, and their strength, which was remarkable, was devoted to their religion. That amused the Tipu. Some Hindus sought the rewards of godliness by growing their hair and fingernails, others by denying themselves food, still others by abjuring all earthly pleasures. But the Jetties did it by developing their muscles, and the results, the Tipu admitted, were extraordinary. He might disagree with their religion, but he encouraged them all the same, and like his father he'd hired a dozen of the most impressive strong men to amuse and serve him. Two of the finest now stood beneath the throne room balcony, stripped to their waists, and with their vast chests oiled so that their muscles shone dark in the early afternoon sun. The six tigers, restless because they had been denied their midday meal of freshly slaughtered goat meat, glared with yellow eyes from the courtyard's edges. The tipu came from his prayers to the balcony, where he threw open the filigree shutters so that he and his entourage could view the courtyard clearly. Colonel Goudin was in attendance, as was Appa Rao, both men had been summoned from the city ramparts, where they had been making the last preparations for the arrival of the British. Gun carriages were being repaired, ammunition being laid down in magazines deep enough to be shielded from the fall of enemy howitzer shells, while dozens of rockets were in the ready magazines on the ramparts' fire steps. The Tipu liked to tour his defences, where he could imagine his rockets and shells searing down into the enemy ranks. But now, in the courtyard of his inner palace, he had an even more pleasurable duty to perform. He would kill traitors. Both men betrayed me. 
he told Colonel Goudin through the interpreter. And one is also a spy. What would you do in France with such men, Colonel? Send them to Madame Guillotine, Your Majesty. The Tipu chuckled when the answer was translated. He was curious about the guillotine, and at one time he thought of having such a machine built in the city. He was fascinated by all things French, and indeed, when the revolution had swept France and destroyed the Ancien Régime, the Tipu had for a time embraced the new ideas of liberty, equality, and fraternity. He had erected a tree of liberty in Seringapatam, ordered his guards to wear the red hats of the revolution, and had even ordered revolutionary decorations to be posted in the city's main streets. But the fascination had not endured. The Tipu had begun to fear that his people might become too fond of liberty, or even infected with equality. And so he'd removed the Tree of Liberty and had the declarations torn down. Yet still the Tipu treasured a love of France. He'd never built the guillotine, not for lack of funds, but rather because Goudin had persuaded him that the machine was a device of mercy, constructed to end a criminal's life with such swiftness that the victim would never even realize he was being killed. It was an ingenious device, the Tipu admitted, but much too merciful. How could such a machine deter traitors? That man, the Tipu now pointed to the Muslim soldier who had betrayed the secrets of the gatehouse, will be killed first and then his body will be fed to pigs. I can think of no fate worse for a Muslim, and believe me, Colonel, he fears the pigs more than he fears his death. The other man will feed my tigers, and his bones will be ground to powder and delivered to his widow. Their deaths will be short, not perhaps as quick as your machine, Colonel, but still mercifully short. He clapped his hands, and the two chained prisoners were dragged forward, until they stood in the centre of the courtyard. The Muslim soldier was forced to his knees. His tiger-striped uniform had been stripped from him, and now he wore nothing but a short pair of loose cotton breeches. He stared up at the Tipu, who was gaudy in a yellow silk tunic and a jewelled turban, and the man raised his manacled hands in a mute appeal for clemency that the Tipu ignored. Goudin tensed himself. He'd seen the jetties at work before, but familiarity did not make the spectacle any more pleasant. The first jetty placed a nail on the crown of the victim's bare head. The nail was a black iron and had a six-inch shank that was topped by a flat head that was a good three inches wide. The man held the nail in place with his left hand, then looked up at the balcony. The doomed soldier, feeling the touch of the iron point on his scalp, called for forgiveness. The tipu listened for a second to the soldier's desperate excuses, then pointed a finger at him. The Tipu held the finger steady for a few seconds, and the soldier held his breath, as he dared to believe he might be forgiven. But then the Tipu's hand abruptly dropped. The jetty raised his right hand, its palm facing downward, then took a deep breath. He paused, summoning his huge strength, then he slapped the hand fast down so that his open palm struck the nail's flat top. He shouted aloud as he struck. And at the very instant that his right hand slapped the nail, so he snatched his left hand away from the long shank, which was driven hard and deep into the soldier's skull. It went so deep that the nail's flat head crushed the prisoner's black hair. Blood spurted from under the nail as its shank slammed home. The jetty stepped away, gesturing at the nail as if to show how much strength had been needed to so drive it through the thick bone of the skull. The traitor still lived. He was babbling and shrieking, and blood was spilling down his face in quick, lacing rivulets as he swayed on his knees. His body was shaking, but then, quite suddenly, his back arched. He stared wide-eyed up at the tipu, and then fell forward. His body shuddered twice, then was still. One of the six chained tigers stirred at the smell of blood and padded forward until its chain stretched to its full length and so held it back. The beast growled, then settled down to watch the second man die. The Tipu and his entourage applauded the first jetty skill, then the Tipu pointed at the wretched Hindu merchant. This second prisoner was a big man, fat as butter, and his gross size would only make the second demonstration all the more impressive. 
The first jetty, his execution successfully completed, fetched a stool from the gateway. He set it down and forced the fat, weeping merchant onto its seat. Then he knelt in front of the chair and pinned the man's manacled arms down tight against his sagging belly, so that he could not move. The chair faced the tipu, and the kneeling jetty made certain he stayed low, so that he would not spoil his master's view. It takes more strength than you would think, the tipu remarked to Gudin, to drive a nail into his skull. So your majesty has been kind enough to inform me before, Gudin answered dryly. The tipu laughed. You do not enjoy this, colonel. The death of traitors is ever necessary, sire, Gudin said evasively. But I should like to think you derive amusement from it. Surely you appreciate my men's strength? I do admire it, sire. Then admire it now, the tipu said, for the next death takes even more strength than the nail. The tipu smiled and turned back to look into the courtyard, where the second jetty waited behind the prisoner. The tipu pointed at the merchant, held the gestures before, then dropped his hand abruptly. The merchant screamed in anticipation, then began to shake like a leaf, as the jetty placed his hands against the sides of the merchant's skull. His touch was gentle at first, almost a caress. His palms covered the merchant's ears as his fingers groped to find a purchase among the skull bones beneath the victim's fat cheeks. Then the jetty suddenly tightened his grip, distorting the plump face, and the merchant's scream became frantic until at last he had no breath left to scream, and could only mew in terror. The jetty drew breath, paused to concentrate all his force, then gave a great shout that made the six tigers leap to their feet in alarm. As he shouted, the jetty twisted the merchant's head. He was wringing his victim's neck like a man would wring a chicken's gullet. Only this neck was thick and fat. But the jetty's first great effort twisted it so far around that the face was already looking back across its right shoulder when the executioner made his second effort, marked by a grunt, which pulled the head all the way around, and Goudin, flinching from the sight on the balcony, heard the distinct crack as the merchant's spine was broken. The jetty let go of the head and sprang back, proud of his work as the dead merchant collapsed off the stool. The tipu applauded, then tossed down two small bags of gold. Take that one to the pigs, he said, pointing at the Muslim, and leave the other here. Let the tigers loose. The balcony shutters were closed, somewhere deep in the palace, Perhaps in the harem where the Tipu's six hundred wives, concubines, and handmaidens all lived. A harp tinkled prettily. While down in the courtyard, the tiger's keepers used their long staves to herd the beasts as they released them from their chains. The Tipu smiled at his followers. Back to the walls, gentlemen, he said. We have work to do. The keepers released the last tiger, then followed the jetties out through the gateway. The dead soldier had been dragged away. For a moment the tigers watched the remaining body. Then one of the beasts crossed to the merchant's corpse and eviscerated the fat belly with one blow of its huge paw. And so Ravi Shekhar had died and now was eaten. Sharp was back with his company before sunset. He was greeted ebulliently by men who saw in his release from the flogging a small victory for the lower ranks against blind authority. Private Mallinson even clapped Sharp on the back and was rewarded with a stream of curses. Sharp ate with his usual six companions, who as ever were joined by three wives and by Mary. The supper was a stew of beans, rice and salt beef, and it was at the end of the small meal, when they were sharing a canteen of arak, that Sergeant Hakeswell appeared. Private Sharp. He was carrying a cane that he pointed towards Sharp. I wants you. Sergeant. Sharp acknowledged Hakeswell but did not move. A word with you, Private, on your feet now. Sharp still did not move. I'm excused company duties, Sergeant. Colonel's orders. Hakeswell's face wrenched itself in a grotesque twitch. This ain't your duty, the sergeant said. 
This is your bleeding pleasure, so get in your bloody feet and come here. Sharp obediently stood, flinching as his coat tugged at his grievously wounded back. He followed the sergeant to an open space behind the surgeon's tent, where Hakeswell turned and rammed his cane into Sharp's chest. How the hell did you escape that flogging, Sharpie? Sharp ignored the question. Hakeswell's broken nose was still swollen and bruised, and Sharp could see the worry in the sergeant's eyes. Didn't you hear me, boy? Hakeswell shoved the cane's tip into Sharp's belly. How come you was cut down? How come you were cut down from the scaffold, sergeant? Sharp asked. No lip from you, boy. No lip, or by God, I'll have you strapped to the tripod again. Now tell me what the general wanted. Sharp shook his head. If you want to know that, sergeant, he said, you better ask General Harris yourself. Stand still, stand straight. Hakeswell snapped, then cut with his cane at a nearby guy rope. He sniffed, wondering how best to worm the information out of Sharp, and decided for a change to try gentleness. I admire you, Sharpie, the sergeant said hoarsely. Not many men have the guts to walk after getting two hundred tickles of the whip. Takes a strong man to do that, Sharpie, and I'd hate to see you getting even more tickles. It's in your best interest to tell me, Sharpie. You know that. It'll go bad with you else. So why was you released, lad? Sharp pretended to relent. You know why I was released, Sergeant? He said. The Colonel announced it. No, I don't know, lad. Hakeswell said. Upon my soul, I don't. So you tell me now. Sharp shrugged. Because we fought well the other day, Sergeant. It's a reward, like. No, it bleeding ain't. Hakeswell shouted, then dodged to one side and slashed his cane onto Sharp's wounded back. Sharp almost screamed with the pain. You don't get called away to a general's tent for that, Sharpie. Hakeswell said, "Stands to reason. Never heard nothing like it in all me born days. So you tell me why, you bastard." Sharp turned to face his persecutor. "You lay that cane on me again, Obadiah," he said softly, "and I'll tell General Harris about you. I'll have you skinned of your stripes. I will, and turn back into a private. Would you like that, Obadiah? You and me in the same file. I'd like that, Obadiah. Stand still." Hakeswell spat. Shoot your face, Sergeant. Sharp said. He had called Hakeswell's bluff, and there was pleasure in that. The sergeant had doubtless thought he could bully the truth out of Sharp, but Sharp held all the trump cards here. How's your nose? He asked Hakeswell. Be careful, Sharpy. Be careful. Oh, I am, Sergeant. I am. I'm real careful. Have you done now? Sharp did not wait for an answer, but just walked away. The next time he faced Obadiah, he thought he would have the stripes on his sleeve, and God help Hakeswell then. He talked to Mary for half an hour. Then it was time to make the excuses that Lieutenant Lawford had rehearsed with him. He picked up his pack, took his musket, and said he had to report to the paymaster's tent. "I'm on light duties till the stripes heal," he told his mates. "Doing sentry go on the money." I'll see you tomorrow. Major General Baird had made all the arrangements. The camp's western perimeter was guarded by men he could trust, and those men had orders to disregard anything they saw. While next day Baird promised Lawford the army would take care not to send any cavalry patrols directly west, in case those patrols discovered the two fugitives. Your job is to go as far west as you can tonight. Baird told Sharp and Lawford when he met them close to the western picket line, and then keep walking west in the morning. You understand now? Yes, sir. Lawford answered. The lieutenant, beneath a heavy cloak that disguised his uniform, was now dressed in the common soldier's red wool coat and white trousers. Sharp had tied Lawford's hair back, and then wrapped it around the leather pad to form the queue, and after that he'd smothered it with a mix of grease and powder. So that Lawford looked no different from any other private, except that his hands were still too soft, but at least they now had ink under the fingernails and ground into the pores. Lawford grimaced as Sharp had tugged at his hair and protested when Sharp had gouged two marks in his neck, 
where a stock would have scraped twin calluses. But Baird had hushed him. Lawford winced again when he put on the leather stock and realized just what discomfort the ordinary soldier endured daily. Now, safe out of sight of the soldiers about their campfires, he dropped the cloak, pulled on a pack, and picked up his musket. Baird hauled a huge watch from his pocket and tilted its face to the half moon. Eleven o'clock, the general said. Time you fellows were away. He put two fingers in his mouth and sounded a shrill, quick whistle. And the picket, visible in the pale moonlight, magically parted north and south, to leave an unguarded gap in the camp's perimeter. Baird had shaken Lawford's hand, then patted Sharp's shoulder. "How's your back, Sharp?" "Hurts like hell, sir." It did too. Baird looked worried. "You'll manage, though. I ain't soft, sir. I never supposed you were a private." Baird patted Sharp's shoulder again, then gestured into the dark. "Off you go, lads, and God be with you." Baird watched the two men run across the open ground and disappear into the darkness on the farther side. He waited for a long time, hoping to catch a last glimpse of the two men's shadows, but he saw nothing, and his best judgment suggested that he would probably never see either soldier again. And that reflection saddened him. He sounded the whistle again and watched as the sentries reformed the picket line. Then he turned and walked slowly back to his tent. This way, sharp," Lawford said when they were out of earshot of the sentries. "We're following a star, just like the wise men, Bill," Sharp said. It had taken Sharp an extraordinary effort to use Mister Lawford's first name, but he knew he had to do it. His survival and Lawford's depended on everything being done right. But the use of the name shocked Lawford, who stopped and stared at Sharp. "What did you call me?" "I called you Bill," Sharp said, "because that's your bleeding name. You ain't an officer now; you're one of us. I'm Dick, you're Bill, and we ain't following any bloody star. We're going to those trees over there. See, the three big buggers." "Sharp," Lawford protested. "No," Sharp turned savagely on Lawford. My job is to keep you alive, Bill. So get one thing straight: you're a bleeding private now, not a bloody officer. You volunteered, remember? And we're deserters. There ain't no ranks here, no sirs, no bloody salutes, no gentlemen. When we get back to the army, I promise you, I'll pretend this never happened, and I'll salute you till my bloody arm drops off. But not now, and not till you and me get out of this bloody nonsense alive. So come on. Lawford, stunned by Sharp's confidence, meekly followed. But this is south of west," he protested, glancing up at the stars to check the direction Sharp was taking. "We'll go west later," Sharp said. "Now get your bleeding stock off." He ripped his own off and tossed it into some bushes. First thing any runner does, sir. The sir was accidental, a habit, and he silently cursed himself for using it. Is take off his stock, then mess your hair and get those trousers dirty. You look like you're standing guard on Windsor Bleeding Castle. Sharp watched as Lawford did his best to obey. So where did you join up, Bill? He asked. Lawford was still resentful of this sudden reversal of roles, but he was sensible enough to realize Sharp was right. Join up? He repeated. Why didn't? Of course you did. Where did they recruit you? My home's near Portsmouth. That's no bloody good. Navy would press you in Portsmouth before a recruiting sergeant could get near to you. Ever been to Sheffield? Good Lord, no! Lawford sounded horrified. Good place, Sheffield, Sharp said, and there's a pub on Pond Street called the Hall in the Pond. Can you remember that? The Hall in the Pond in Sheffield. It's a favourite hunting hole for the Thirty Thirds recruiters, especially on market days. You was tricked there by some bleeding sergeant. He got you drunk, and before you knew it, you'd taken the king's shilling. It was a sergeant of the Thirty Third. So what did he have on his bayonet? His bayonet. Lawford, fumbling to release the leather binding of his newly clubbed hair, frowned in perplexity. Nothing, I should hope. We're the thirty-third, Bill. The Haver Cakes. He carried an oat cake on his bayonet, remember? And he promised you'd be an officer inside two years because he was a lying bastard. What did you do before you met him? Lawford shrugged. A, a farmer? No one would ever believe you laboured on a farm. Sharp said scornfully. You ain't got a farmer's arms. 
That General Baird now, he's got proper arms. Looks as if he could hoist hay all day long and not feel a damn thing. But not you. You were a lawyer's clerk. Lawford nodded. I think we should go now, he said, trying to reassert his rapidly vanishing authority. We're waiting, Sharp said stubbornly. So why the hell are you running? Lawford frowned. Unhappiness, I, I, I suppose. Bleeding hell, you're a soldier. You aren't supposed to be happy. No, let's think now. You boned the captain's watch. How about that? Got caught and you faced a flogging. You saw me flogged and didn't fancy you could survive, so you and me being mates like ran. I, I really do think we must go, Lawford insisted. In a minute, sir. Again, Sharp cursed himself for using the honorific. Just let me back settle down. Oh, of, of course. Lawford was immediately contrite. But we can't wait too long, Sharp. Dick, sir, you call me Dick. We're friends, remember? Of course. Lawford, as uncomfortable with this sudden intimacy as with the need to waste time, settled awkwardly by Sharp at the base of a tree. So why did you join up? he asked Sharp. The Armen were after me. The Armen? Oh, yes, the constables. Lawford paused. Somewhere in the night a creature shrieked as it was caught by a predator, while off to the east the sergeants called to their sentries. The sky glowed with the light of the army's myriad fires. What had you done? Lawford asked. Killed a man, put a knife in him. Lawford gazed at Sharp. Murdered him, you mean? Oh, aye, it was murder right enough, even though the bugger deserved it. But the judge at York Assizes wouldn't have seen it my way, would he? Which meant Dick Sharp would have been Morris dancing at the end of a rope, so I reckoned it was easy to put on the scarlet coat. The armen don't bother a man once he's in uniform, not unless he killed one of the gentry. Lawford hesitated, not sure whether he should inquire too deeply, then decided it was worth a try. So, who was the fellow you killed? Bugger kept an inn. I worked for him, see. It was a coaching inn, so he knew what coaches were carrying good baggage. And my job was to snaffle the stuff once the coach was on the road. That and some prigging. Lawford did not like to ask what prigging was, so kept quiet. He were a right bastard, Sharp went on, but that wasn't why I stuck him. It was over a girl, see, and he and I had a disagreement about who should keep her blanket warm. He lost, and I'm here, and God knows where the lass is now. He laughed. We're wasting time, Lawford said. Quiet, Sharp snapped, then picked up his musket and pointed it towards some bushes. Is that you, lass? It's me, Richard. Mary Bickerstaff emerged from the shadows carrying a bundle. Evening, Mr. Lawford, sir, she said shyly. Call him Bill, Sharp insisted, then stood and shouldered his musket. Come on, Bill, he said. No point in wasting time here. There's three of us now, and wise men always travel in threes, don't they? So find your bleeding star and let's be moving. They walked all night, following Lawford's star toward the western skyline. Lawford took Sharp aside at one point, and insisting on his ever more precarious authority, ordered Sharp to send the woman back. That's an order, Sharp, Lawford said. She won't go. Sharp retorted, We can't take a woman, Lawford snapped. Why not? Deserters always take their valuables, sir. Uh, Bill, I mean. Christ, Private, if you mess this up, I'll make sure you get all the stripes you escaped yesterday. Sharp grinned. It won't be me who messes it. It's the damn fool idea itself. Nonsense. Lawford strode ahead, forcing Sharp to follow. Mary, guessing that they were arguing about her, kept a few paces behind. There's nothing wrong with General Baird's notion, Lawford said. We fall into the Tipu's hands, we join his wretched army, find this man Ravi Shekhar, then leave everything to him. And just what part does Mrs. Bickerstaff play in that? He asked the question angrily. Whatever part she wants, Sharp said stubbornly. Lawford knew he should argue, or rather that he should impose his authority on Sharp, but he sensed he could never win. He was beginning to wonder whether it had been such a good idea to bring Sharp after all. But from the first moment when Baird had suggested this desperate endeavour, Lawford had known he would need help, and he'd also known which of the light company's soldiers he wanted. Private Sharp had always stood out, not just because of his height, 
but because he was by far the quickest witted man in the company. But even so, Lawford had not been ready for the speed or force with which Sharp had taken over this mission. Lawford had expected gratitude from Sharp and also deference. He even believed he deserved that deference purely by virtue of being an officer. But Sharp had swiftly torn that assumption into tatters. It was rather as if Lawford had harnessed a solid looking draft horse to his gig, only to discover it was a runaway racer. But why had the racehorse insisted on bringing the filly? That offended Lawford, suggesting to him that Sharp was taking advantage of the freedom offered by this mission. Lawford glanced at Sharp, noting how pale and strained he looked, and he guessed that the flogging had taken far more from the private than he realized. I still think Mrs. Bickerstaff should go back to the army, he said gently. She can't, Sharp said curtly. Tell him, Mary. Mary ran to catch up. I'm not safe while Hicks was alive. She told Lawford, "You could have been looked after." Lawford suggested vaguely, "Who by?" Mary asked. "A man looks after a woman in the army, and he wants his price. You know that, sir." "Call him Bill," Sharp snarled. "Our lives might depend on it. If one of them calls him sir, then they'll feed us to their bloody tigers." "And it isn't just Hicksville," Mary went on. "Sergeant Green wants to marry me now, which is at least more than Hicksville does." But I don't want either. I just want to be left in peace with Richard. God knows," Lawford said bitterly. "But you probably jumped out of the frying pan into the fire. I'll take my chances," Mary said obstinately, though she had taken what care she could to reduce her chances of being raped. She had dressed herself in a torn, dark frock and a filthy apron, both garments as drab and greasy as she could find. She had smeared ashes and dirt into her hair, but she'd done nothing to disguise the lively beauty in her face. Besides, she said to Lawford, "Neither you nor Richard speak any of the languages. You need me, and I brought some more food." She hoisted the cloth bundle. Lawford grunted. Behind them, the horizon was now marked with a pale glow that silhouetted trees and bushes. He guessed they had travelled about a dozen miles, and as the pale glow turned brighter and the dawn's light seeped across the landscape, he suggested they stop and rest. Mary's bundle held a half dozen loaves of flat, unleavened bread, and had two canteens of water, which they shared as their breakfast. After he'd eaten, Lawford went into the bushes for privacy, and as he came back, he saw Sharp hit Mary hard in the face. For God's sake, man! Lawford shouted, "What are you doing?" "Blacking my eye," Mary answered. "I asked him to." "Dear God," Lawford said. Mary's left eye was already swelling, and tears were running down her cheeks. "Whatever for?" "Keep the buggers off her, of course," Sharp said. "Are you all right, love?" "I live," Mary said. "You hit hard, Richard." "No point in hitting softly. Didn't mean to hurt you, though." Mary splashed water on her eye. Then they all started walking again. They were now in an open stretch of country that was dotted with groves of bright blossom trees. There were no villages in sight, though they did come to an aqueduct an hour after dawn, and wasted another hour trying to find a way across before simply plunging into the weed-filled water and wading through. Seringapatam lay well below the horizon, but Lawford knew the city was almost due west. And he planned to angle southward until he reached the Corvary, and then follow that river to the city. The lieutenant's spirits were low. He'd volunteered for this mission readily enough, but in the night it had begun to dawn on him just how risky the errand was. He felt lonely too. He was only two years older than Sharp, and he envied Sharp Mary's companionship, and he still resented the private's lack of deference. He did not dare express that resentment. For he knew it would be scorned, but nor did he really wish to express it. For he discovered that he wanted Sharp's admiration rather than his deference. Lawford wanted to prove that he was as tough as the private, and that desire kept him stoically walking on toward the horrid unknown. Sharp was equally worried. He liked Lawford, but suspected he would have to work hard to keep the lieutenant out of trouble. He was a quick study, the lieutenant, but so ignorant of the world's ways that he could easily betray the fact that he was no common soldier. As for the Tipu, he was an unknown danger, 
but Sharp was canny enough to know that he would have to do whatever the Tipu's men wanted. He worried about Mary, too. He had persuaded her to come on this fool's errand, and she'd not taken much persuading. But now she was here, Sharp was concerned that he could not protect both her and Lawford. But despite his worries, he still felt free. He was, after all, off the army's leash, and he reckoned he could survive so long as Lawford made no mistake. And if Sharp survived, he knew how to prosper. The rules were simple. Trust no one, be ever watchful. And if trouble came, hit first and hit hard. It had worked for him so far. Mary, too, had doubts. She had persuaded herself she was in love with Sharp. But she sensed a restlessness in him that made her think he might not always be in love with her. Still, she was happier here than back with the army, and that was not just because of Sergeant Hakeswell's threat, but because, although the army was the only life Mary had ever known, she sensed the world could offer her more. She'd grown up in Calcutta, and though her mother had been Indian, Mary had never felt at home in either the army or in India. She was neither one thing nor the other. To the army she was a bibi, while to the Indians she was outside their castes, and she was acceptable to neither. She was a half-breed, suspended in a purgatory of distrust, with only her looks to help her survive. And though the army was the place that provided the friendliest company, it hardly offered a secure future. Ahead of her stretched a succession of husbands, each one succeeding as the previous one was killed in battle, or else died of a fever. And when she was too old to attract another man, she'd be left with her children to fend as best she could. Mary just like Sharp, wanted to find some way up and out of that fate. But how she was to do it she did not know, though this expedition at least gave her a chance to break temporarily out of the trap. Lawford led them to a slight hill from where, screened by flowering bushes, he scanned the country ahead. He thought he could see a gleam of water to the south, and the small glimpse was sufficient to persuade him that it must be the River Corvary. That way, he said, but we'll have to avoid the villages. There were two in sight, both barring the direct path to the river. The villagers will see us anyway, Mary said. They don't miss much. We're not here to trouble them, Lawford said. So perhaps they'll leave us alone? Turn our coats, Bill, Sharp suggested. Turn our coats? We're running, aren't we? So put your coat on back to front as a sign that you're on the run. The villagers will hardly realise the significance of that. Lawford observed tartly. Booger the villagers, Sharp said. It's the Tipu's bloody men I'm worried about. If those bastards see red coats, they'll shoot before they ask questions. Sharp had already undone his cross belts and was shrugging off the wool coat, grunting with the pain that the exertion gave to his back. Lawford, watching, saw that blood had seeped through the thick bandages to stain the dirty shirt. Lawford was reluctant to turn his coat, a turned coat was a sign of disgrace. Battalions that had let the army down in battle were sometimes forced to turn their coats as a badge of shame. But once again the lieutenant saw the wisdom of Sharp's argument, and so he stripped and turned his coat so that its grey lining was outermost. Maybe we shouldn't carry the muskets, he suggested. No deserter would throw away his gun, Sharp answered. He buckled his belt over the turned coat and picked up his gun and pack. He'd carried the pack in his hand all night rather than have its weight press on his wounds. Are you ready? In a moment, Lawford said. Then, to Sharp's surprise, the lieutenant went on one knee and said a silent prayer. I don't pray often, Lawford admitted as he stood, but maybe some help from on high would be providential today. For today, Lawford guessed, would be the day they would meet the Tipu's patrols. They walked south toward the gleam of water. All three were tired, and Sharp was plainly weakened by the loss of blood, but anticipation gave them all a nervous energy. They skirted the nearest village, watched by cows with pendulous folds of skin hanging beneath their necks. Then they walked through groves of cocoa trees as the sun climbed. They saw no one. A deer skittered away from their path in the late morning, and an hour later an excited troop of small monkeys scampered beside them. At midday they rested in the small shade offered by a grove of bamboos, then pressed on again beneath the baking sun. 
By early afternoon, the river was in sight, and Lawford suggested they should rest on its bank. Mary's eye had swollen and blackened, giving her the grotesque look she believed would protect her. I could do with a rest now, Sharp admitted. The pain was terrible, and every step was now an agony. This book is continued on disc five. Sharp's Tiger by Bernard Cornwell continued. Disc five. Mary's eye had swollen and blackened, giving her the grotesque look she believed would protect her. I could do with a rest now, Sharp admitted. The pain was terrible, and every step was now an agony, and I need to wet the bandages. Wet them, Lawford asked. That's what that busted Micklewhite said. Said to keep the bandages damp, or else the stripes won't heal. Well, wet them at the river, Lawford promised. But they never reached the river bank. They were walking beside some beech trees when a shout sounded behind them, and Sharp turned to see horsemen coming from the west. They were fine-looking men in tiger-striped tunics, and with sparring brass helmets, who couched their lances and galloped hard toward the three fugitives. Sharp's heart pounded. He stepped ahead of his companions and held up a hand to show they meant no harm. But the leading lancer only grinned in reply and lowered his lance point, as he pricked back his spurs. Sharp shook his head and waved, then realized the man intended to skewer the spear into his belly. Bastard! Sharp shouted, and dropped his pack and put both hands on his musket, as though it was a quarterstaff. Mary screamed in terror. No! Lawford shouted at the galloping lancers. No! The lancer thrust his blade at Sharp, who knocked the spear point aside with the muzzle of the gun, then swung the gun fast back so that its butt smacked hard onto the horse's head. The beast whinnied and reared, throwing its rider backward. The other lancers laughed, then sawed their reins to swerve past the fallen man. Mary was shouting at them in a language Sharp did not understand. Lawford was waving his hands desperately, but the lancers bored on in, concentrating on Sharp, who stepped backward from their wicked-looking spear points. He slashed a second lance aside. Then a third man rammed his spurs back, and attempted to drive his spear hard into Sharp's belly. Sharp half managed to edge away from the blow, and instead of skewering his stomach, the lance sliced through the skin of his waist, through his coat, and into the tree behind him. The lancer left his spear buried in the beech and wheeled his horse away. Sharp was pinned to the bark, his back a sheet of agony where it was forced against the tree. He tugged at the lance, but his loss of blood had made him far too weak, and the weapon would not budge. And then another lancer spurred toward him with his spear point aimed at Sharp's eyes. Mary shouted frantically. The spear point paused an inch from Sharp's left eyeball. The lancer looked at Mary, grimaced at her filthy state, then said something. Mary answered. The lancer, who was evidently an officer, looked back to Sharp and seemed to be debating whether to kill or to spare him. Finally, he grinned, leaned down, and grasped the spear, pinning Sharp to the tree. He dragged it free. Sharp swore foully, then collapsed at the foot of the tree. There were a score of horsemen, and they all now gathered around the fugitives. Two of them held their razor-sharp lances at Lawford's neck, while the officer spoke to Mary. She answered defiantly, and to Sharp, who was struggling to stand, it seemed that the conversation went on for a long time. Nor did the lancers seem friendly; they were magnificent-looking men, and Sharp, despite his pain, noted how well they maintained their weapons. There was no rust on the lance heads. And the shafts were oiled smooth. Mary argued with the officer, and he seemed indifferent to her pleading. But at last, she must have made her point, for she turned and looked at Lawford. He wants to know if you are willing to serve in the Tipu's forces. She told the lieutenant. The lance tips were tickling Lawford's neck, and as a recruiting device, they worked wonders. The lieutenant nodded eagerly. Absolutely. He said, "Just what we want, volunteers. Tell him we're ready to serve, both of us. Long live the Tipu!" The officer did not need the enthusiastic reply translated. He smiled and ordered his lancers to take their weapons from the redcoat's neck. 
and thus Sharp joined the enemy's army. Chapter 5 Sharp was near to exhausted despair by the time he reached the city. The lances had driven the three fugitives westward at an unrelenting pace, but had offered none of them a saddle, and so the three had walked. And by the time he stumbled through the ford that took them south across the Corvarin, to the island on which Seringapatam was built, Sharp's back burned like a sheet of fire. The city itself still lay a mile to the west, but the whole island had been ringed with new earthworks, inside which thousands of refugees were gathered. The refugees had brought their livestock, obedient to the Tipu's orders that all food stock should be denied to the slowly advancing British army. A half mile from the city wall, a second earthwork had been thrown up to protect a sprawling encampment of thatched, mud-brick barracks, in which thousands of the Tipu's infantry and cavalry lived. None of the troops were idle, some were drilling, others were heightening the mud wall around the encampment, and still more were firing their muskets at targets of straw men propped against the city's stone wall. The straw men were all dressed in makeshift red coats, and Lawford watched aghast as the muskets knocked the targets over, or else exploded great chunks from their straw-stuffed torsos. The soldiers' families lived inside the encampment, and the women and children flocked to see the two white men pass. They assumed Sharp and Lawford were prisoners, and some jeered as they went by, and others laughed when Sharp staggered in pain. "'Keep going, Sharp!' Lawford said encouragingly. "'Call me Dick, for Christ's sake!' Sharp snapped. "'Keep going, Dick!' Lawford managed to say, albeit angrily for having been reproved by the private. "'Not far now,' Mary said in Sharp's ear. She was helping Sharp walk, though at times when the jeering became raucous, she clung to Sharp for support. Ahead of them were the city walls, and Lawford, seeing them, wondered how anyone could hope to blast through such massive works. The great ramparts were lime-washed, so that they seemed to shine in the sun, and Lawford could see cannon muzzles showing in every embrasure. Cavaliers, jutting out like small square bastions, had been built everywhere along the face of the wall, so that yet more guns could be brought to bear on any attacker. Above the walls, on which the Tipu's flag stirred in the small, warm wind, the twin white minarets of the city's mosque towered in the sunlight. Beyond the minarets, Lawford could see the intricate tower of a Hindu temple, its stone layers elaborately carved and gorgeously painted. While just north of the temple there shone the gleaming green tiles of what Lawford supposed was the Tipu's palace. The city was all much bigger and grander than Lawford had expected while the white-painted wall was higher and stronger than he'd ever feared. He had expected a mud wall, but as he drew closer to the ramparts he could see that these eastern walls were made from massive stone blocks that would need to be chipped away by the siege guns if a breach were ever to be made. In places where the wall had been damaged by previous sieges, there were patches where the stone had been repaired by brickwork, but nowhere did the wall look weak. It was true that the city had not had time to build itself a modern European type of defence, with star-shaped walls and outlying forts and awkward bastions and confusing ravelins. But even so, the place looked dauntingly strong, and even now vast ant-like gangs of labourers, some of them naked in the heat, were carrying baskets of deep red earth on their backs, and piling the soil to heighten the glassy that lay directly in front of the lime-washed walls. The growing earthen glassy that was separated from the walls by a ditch that could be flooded with river water was designed to deflect the besiegers' shots up and over the ramparts. Lawford consoled himself that Lord Cornwallis had managed to smash into this formidable city seven years before, but the heightening of the glassy demonstrated that the Tipu had learned from that defeat and suggested that General Harris would not find it nearly so easy. The Lancers ducked their spired helmets as they clattered through the tunnel of the city's Bangalore gate, and so led the fugitives into the stinking tangle of crowded streets. The spears forged the Lancers' path, 
driving civilians aside and forcing wagons and handcarts into hasty retreats, up any convenient alley. Even the sacred cows that wandered freely inside the city were forced aside, though the lancers did it gently, not wanting to offend the sensibilities of the Hindus. They passed the mosque, then turned down a street lined with shops, their open fronts thickly hung with cloth, silk, silver jewellery, vegetables, shoes, and hides. In one alley, Lawford caught a glimpse of blood-soaked men butchering two camels, and the sight almost made him gag. A naked child hurled a bloody camel's tail at the two white men, and soon a horde of tattered, chanting children were dodging through the lancers' horses to mock the prisoners and pelt them with animal dung. Sharp cursed them, Lawford hunched low as he walked, and the children only ran away when two European soldiers, both dressed in blue jackets, chased them away. Prisonnier, one of the two men called cheerfully. No, monsieur, Lawford answered in his best schoolboy French. Nous sommes déserteurs. C'est bon. The man tossed Lawford a mango. La femme aussi. La femme est notre prisonnière. Lawford tried a little wit, and was rewarded with a laugh and a farewell shout of, Bonne chance! You speak French? Sharp asked. A little, Lawford claimed modestly. Really, only a little. Bloody amazing! Sharp said, and Lawford was obscurely pleased that he had at last succeeded in impressing his companion. But not many private soldiers speak frog. Sharp dashed Lawford's pleasure. So don't show yourself as being too good at it. Stick to bloody English. I didn't think of that, Lawford said ruefully. He looked at the mango as though he'd never seen such a piece of fruit before, and it was plain that his hunger was tempting him to bite into the sweet flesh. But then his manners prevailed, and he gallantly insisted that Mary eat the fruit instead. The lancers turned into a delicately sculpted archway, where two sentries stood guard. Once inside the archway, the cavalrymen slid down from their saddles, and, lances in hand, led their horses down a narrow passage, between two high brick walls. Sharp, Mary and Lawford were more or less abandoned, just inside the gateway, where the two sentries ignored them, but did chase away the more curious townsfolk, who had gathered to stare at the Europeans. Sharp sat on a mounting block and tried to ignore the pain in his back. Then the lancer officer returned and shouted at them to follow him. He led them through another arch, then under an arcade where flowers twined round pillars, and so to a guardroom. The officer said something to Mary, then locked the door. He says we're to wait, Mary said. She still had the mango, and though the lancers had stripped Sharp and Lawford of their coats and packs, and had searched the two men for coins and hidden weapons. They'd not searched Mary, and she took a small folding penknife from an inside pocket of her skirt and cut the fruit into three portions. Lawford ate his share, then wiped juice from his chin. Did you ever get that pick lock, Sharp? he asked, saw Sharp's furious glare and coloured. Uh, Dick, he corrected himself. I did all along, Sharp said. Mary's got it, and she's got the guinea. He grinned despite his pain. You mean you lied to General Baird? Lawford asked sternly. Cause I bloody lied, Sharp snarled. What kind of a fool admits to having a picklock? For a moment Lawford looked as though he would reprove Sharp for dishonesty, but the lieutenant controlled the urge. He merely shook his head in mute disapproval, then sat with his back against the bare brick wall. The floor was made of small green tiles, on which Sharp lay on his belly, in minutes he was asleep. Mary sat beside him, sometimes stroking his hair, and Lawford found himself embarrassed by her display of affection. He felt he ought to talk with Mary, but found he had nothing to say, and so decided it was better not to speak in case he woke sharp. He waited. Somewhere deep in the palace a fountain splashed. Once there was a great clatter of hooves as cavalrymen led their horses out from the inner stables. But most of the time it was quiet in the room. It was also blessedly cool. Sharp woke after dark, 
he groaned as the pains in his back registered, and Mary hushed him. What time is it, love? Sharp asked her. Late. Jesus, Sharp said as a stab of agony tore down his spine. He sat up, whimpering with the effort, and tried to prop himself against the wall. A wan moonlight came through the small barred window, and Mary, in its dim light, could see the blood stains spreading through the bandages, and onto Sharp's shirt. Have they forgotten us? Sharp asked. No, Mary said. They brought us some water while you were asleep. Here. She lifted the jug toward him, and they gave us a bucket. She gestured across the dim cell. For, she faltered. I can smell what the bucket's for. Sharp said. He took the jug and drank. Lawford was slumped against the far wall, and there was a small open book face down on the floor beside the sleeping lieutenant. Sharp grimaced. Glad the bugger's brought something useful, he said to Mary. You mean this? Lawford said, indicating the book. He'd not been asleep after all. Sharp wished he'd not used the insult, but did not know how to retrieve it. What is it? He asked instead, "A Bible, bloody hell," Sharp said. "You don't approve?" Lawford asked icily. "I had a bellyful of the good book when I was in the Foundlings' home," Sharp said. "If they weren't reading it to us, they were hitting us round the head with it, and it wasn't some little book like that one, but a bloody great big thick thing. Could have stunned an ox. That Bible." "Did they teach you to read it?" Lawford asked. "We weren't reckoned good enough to read." Good enough to pick hemp, we were, but not read. No, they just read it to us at breakfast. It was the same every morning: cold porridge, tin of water, and an earful of Abraham and Isaac. So you can't read, Lawford asked. Of course I can't read. Sharp laughed scornfully. What the bloody hell's the use of reading? Don't be a fool, Dick, Lawford said patiently. Only a fool takes pride in pretending that a skill he doesn't possess is worthless. For a second, Lawford was tempted to launch himself on a panegyric of reading, how it would open a new world to Sharp, a world of drama and story and information and poetry, and timeless wisdom. Then he thought better of it. "You want your sergeant stripes, don't you?" he asked instead. A "Man doesn't have to read to be a sergeant," Sharp said stubbornly. "No, but it helps, and you'll be a better sergeant if you can read." Otherwise, the company clerks tell you what the reports say, and what the lists say, and what the punishment book says, and the quartermasters will rob you blind. But if you can read, then you'll know when they're lying to you. There was a long silence. Somewhere in the palace, a sentry's footsteps echoed off stone. Then came a sound so familiar that it almost made Lawford weep for homesickness. It was a clock striking the hour: twelve o'clock, midnight. Is it hard? Sharp finally asked. Learning to read, Lawford said. Not really. Then you and Mary had better teach me, Bill, and Joe. Yes, Lawford said. Yes, we had. They were taken out of the guardroom in the morning. Four tiger-striped soldiers fetched them and pushed them down the arcade, then into a narrow corridor that seemed to run beside the kitchens. And afterward, through a shadowed tangle of stables and storerooms that led to a double gate, which opened into a large courtyard where the bright sun made them blink. Then Sharp's eyes adjusted to the brilliant daylight, and he saw what waited for them in the courtyard, and he swore. There were six tigers, all of them huge beasts with yellow eyes and dirty teeth. The animals stared at the three newcomers. Then one of the tigers rose, arched its back. Shook himself and slowly padded toward them. Jesus Christ, Sharp said. But just then the tiger's chain lifted from the dusty ground, stretched taut, and the tiger, cheated of its breakfast, growled and went back to the shadows. Another beast scratched itself. A third yawned. Look at the size of the bastards, Sharp said. Just big pussy cats, Lawford said with an insouciance he did not entirely feel. Then you go and scratch their chins," Sharp said, "and see if they purr. Bugger off, you!" This was to another curious beast that was straining toward him from the end of its chain. Need a big mouse to feed one of those bastards. The tigers can't reach you," 
A voice spoke in English from behind them. Unless their keepers release them from their chains. Good morning. Sharp turned. A tall, middle-aged officer with a black moustache had come into the courtyard. He was a European and wore the blue uniform of France. I am Colonel Goudin, the officer said. And you are? For a moment, none of them spoke. Then Lawford straightened to attention. William Lawford, sir. His name's Bill. Sharp said, "I'm called Dick, and this is my woman." He put an arm round Mary's shoulder. Goodan grimaced as he looked at Mary's swollen black eye and her filthy skirts. "You have a name," he paused. "Mademoiselle." He finally decided that was the most appropriate way to address Mary. "Mary, sir." She made a small curtsy, and Goodan returned the courtesy with an inclination of his head. "And your name?" he asked Sharp. Sharp, sir, Dick Sharp, and you are deserters," the colonel asked with a measure of distaste. "Yes, sir," Lawford said. "I am never certain that deserters are to be trusted," Goudin said mildly. He was accompanied by a burly French sergeant who kept giving the tigers nervous glances. "If a man can betray one flag," Goudin observed, "why not another? A man might have good reason to betray his flag, sir." Sharp said defiantly, "And the reason, Sharp?" Sharp turned round so that the blood on his back was visible. He let Goudin stare at the stains, then turned back. "Is that good enough, sir?" Goudin shuddered. "I never understand why the British flog their soldiers. It is barbarism." He waved irritably at the flies which buzzed about his face. "Sheer barbarism!" "You don't flog in the French army, sir." Of course not," Goudin said scornfully. He put a hand on Sharp's shoulder and turned him around again. "When was this done to you?" "A couple of days ago, sir." "Have you changed the bandages?" "No, sir. Wetted them though. You'll still be dead in a week unless we do something," Goudin said. Then turned and spoke to the sergeant, who walked briskly out of the courtyard. Goudin turned Sharp around again. So what had you done to deserve such barbarism, Private Sharp? Nothing, sir. Beyond nothing, Goudin said tiredly, as though he'd heard every excuse imaginable. I am a sergeant, sir. And you, Goudin challenged Lawford. Why did you run? They were going to flog me, sir. Lawford was nervous, telling the lie, and the nervousness intrigued Goudin. For doing nothing, Goudin asked with amusement. For stealing a watch, sir. Lawford reddened as he spoke. Which I did steal, he added, but most unconvincingly. He'd made no effort to hide the accent that betrayed his education, though whether Goudin's ear was sufficiently attuned to English to detect the nuance was another matter. The Frenchman was certainly intrigued by Lawford. What did you say your name was? The Colonel asked. Lawford, sir. Goudin gave Lawford a long scrutiny. The Frenchman was tall and thin, with a lugubrious and tired face, but his eyes, Sharp decided, were shrewd and kind. Goudin, Sharp reckoned, was a gentleman, a proper type of officer, like Lawford, really. And maybe that was the trouble. Maybe Goudin had already seen through Lawford's disguise. You do not seem to me, Private Lawford, to be a typical British soldier. Goudin said. Thus fulfilling Sharp's fears in France, now you would be nothing strange, for we must insist that every young man serve his country. But in Britain, am I not right? You only accept the dregs of the streets, men from the gutter, men like me. Sharp said, "Quiet." Goudin reproved Sharp with a sudden authority. "I did not speak to you." The Frenchman took one of Lawford's hands and mutely inspected the soft, uncalloused fingers. How is it that you and the army Lawford? Father went bankrupt, sir. Lawford said, conjuring the worst disaster that he could ever imagine. But the son of a bankrupt father can take employment, can he not? Goudin looked again at the soft fingers, then released Lawford's hand. And any job surely is better than the life of a British soldier. I got drunk, sir. Lawford said miserably, and I met a recruiting sergeant.
The lieutenant's misery was not at the imagined memory, but at the difficulty he was having in telling the lie. But his demeanour impressed Goudin. It was in a pub, sir, in Sheffield, Lawford went on. The whores in the lake, sir. In Sheffield, sir. In Pond Lane, sir. On market day. His voice tailed away as he suddenly realised he did not know which day of the week the market was held. In Sheffield, Goudin asked. Is that not where they make uh, iron? And what is the word? Uh, cutlery. You don't look like a cutler, Lawford. I was a lawyer's apprentice, sir. Lawford was blushing violently. He knew he'd mixed up the name of the pub, though it was doubtful that Colonel Goudin would ever know the difference. But the lieutenant was certain his lies were as transparent as a pane of glass. And your job in the army? Goudin asked. Company clerk, sir. Goudin smiled. No ink on your breeches, Lawford. In our army, the clerks batter ink everywhere. For a moment it seemed as though Lawford was about to abandon his lie, and in his misery confess the whole truth to the Frenchman. But then the lieutenant had a sudden inspiration. I, I wear an apron, sir, when I'm writing. I don't want to be punished for a dirty uniform, sir. Goudin laughed. In truth, he had never doubted Lawford's story, mistaking the lieutenant's embarrassment for shame at his family's bankruptcy. If anything, the Frenchman felt sorry for the tall, fair-haired and fastidious young man, who should plainly never have become a soldier, and that, to Goudin, was enough to explain Lawford's nervousness. You're a clerk, eh? So does that mean you see paperwork? A lot, sir. So do you know how many guns the British are bringing here? Goudin asked. How much ammunition? Lawford shook his head in consternation. For a few seconds he was speechless then managed to say that he never saw that sort of paperwork. It's just company papers, I see, sir. Punishment books, that sort of thing. Bloody thousands, Sharp interjected. And beg pardon for speaking, sir. Thousands of what? Goudin asked. Bullock, sir. Six eighteen-pounder shot strapped on a piece, sir. And some of the buggers have got eight. But it's thousands of round shot. Two thousand, three... Goudin asked. More than that, sir. I ain't seen or heard the size of it, not even when the Scots drive their beeves down from Scotland to London. Goudin shrugged. He very much doubted whether these two could tell him anything useful. Certainly nothing that Tipu's scouts and spies had not already discovered. But the questions had to be asked. Now, waving flies from his face, he told the two deserters what they might expect. His Majesty the Tipu Sultan will decide your fate, and if he is merciful, he will want you to serve in his forces. I assume you are willing? Yes, sir, Sharp said eagerly. It's why we came, sir. Good, Goudin said. The Tipu might want you in one of his own cochons. That's the word they use for a regiment here, a cochon. They're all good soldiers and well-trained, and you'll be made welcome. But there's one disadvantage... You will both have to be circumcised. Lawford went pale, while Sharp just shrugged. Is that bad, sir? You know what circumcision is, Private? Something the army does to you, sir. Like swear you in? Goudin smiled. Not quite, Sharp. The Tipu is a Muslim, and he likes his foreign volunteers to join his religion. It means one of his holy men will cut your foreskin off. It's quite quick, just like slicing the top from a soft-boiled egg, really. My prick! Sharp was as aghast as Lawford now. It's over in seconds, Goudin reassured them. Though the bleeding can last for a while, and you cannot... Um, how shall I say? He glanced at Mary, then back to Sharp. You can't let the egg become hard-boiled for a few weeks. Bloody hell, sir, Sharp said. For religion? They do that. We Christians sprinkle babies with water, Goudin said, and the Muslims chop off foreskins. The Frenchman paused, then smiled. However, I cannot think that a man with a bleeding prick will make a good soldier, and your armies will be here in a few days, so I will suggest to His Majesty that the two of you serve with my men. We are few, but none of us are Muslims, and all of our soft-boiled eggs retain their full shells. Quite right, too, sir, Sharp said enthusiastically. And it'll be an honour to serve you, sir, he added. 
In a French battalion? Goudin teased him. If you don't flog, sir, and you don't carve up bricks, then it'll be more than an honour. If the tipu allows it, Goudin warned them, which he may not. But I think he might. I have other Britishers in the battalion and some Germans and Swiss. I'm sure you will be happy there. He looked at Mary. But what of you, mademoiselle? Mary touched Sharp's elbow. I came with Richard, sir. Good eye inspected her black eye. How did that happen, mademoiselle? I fell, sir, Mary said. Good eye's face flickered with a smile. Or oh, did Private Sharp hit you, so that you would not appear attractive? I fell over, sir. Good eye nodded. You hit hard, Private Sharp. No point else, sir. That is true, Good eye said, then shrugged. My men have their women. If His Majesty allows it, I don't see why the two of you should not stay together. He turned as his sergeant reappeared, bringing with him an elderly Indian who carried a cloth-covered basket. This is Dr. Venkatesh, Goudin said, greeting the doctor with a bow, and he is quite as good as any physician I ever found in Paris. I imagine, Sharp, that removing those filthy bandages will hurt. Not as much as circumscribing, sir. Goudin laughed. All the same, I think you'd better sit down. Removing the bandages hurt like buggery. Mr. Micklewhite, the surgeon, had put a salve on the lashes, but no army surgeon ever wasted too much precious ointment on a common soldier, and Micklewhite had not used enough salve to stop the bandages from crusting to the wounds, and so the cloth had become one clotted mass of linen and dried blood that tore the scabs away from the wounds as the Indian peeled the bandages away. Dr. Venkatesh was indeed skilful and gentle, and his voice was ever soothing in Sharp's ear as he delicately prized the horrid mess away from the torn flesh. But even so, Sharp could not forbear from whimpering as the bandages were lifted. The tigers, smelling fresh blood, lunged at their chains, so that the courtyard was filled with the clank and snap of stretching links. The Indian doctor plainly disapproved of both the injury and the treatment, he tutted and muttered and shook his head as the carnage was revealed. Then, when he'd picked the last filthy scrap of bandage away with a pair of ivory tweezers, he poured an unguent over Sharp's back, and the cool liquid was wonderfully soothing. Sharp sighed with relief. Then suddenly the doctor sprang away from him, stood, clasped his hands, and bowed low. Sharp twisted round to see that a group of Indians had come into the courtyard. At their head was a shortish, plump man, maybe fifty years old, with a round face and a neatly trimmed black moustache. He was dressed in a white silk tunic, above white silk leggings and black leather boots, but the simple clothes glittered with jewels. He wore rubies on his turban, diamond-studded bangles on his arms, and pearls were sewn onto his blue silk sash from which there hung a sapphire-studded scabbard in which rested a sword with a golden hilt fashioned into the face of a snarling tiger. Dr. Venkatesh backed hurriedly away, still bowing, while Goudin stood respectfully at attention. The Tipu, Goudin warned Sharp and Lawford in a whisper, and Sharp struggled to his feet and, like the Frenchman, stood to attention. The Tipu stopped, a half-dozen paces short of Sharp and Lawford, he stared at them for a few seconds, then spoke softly to his interpreter. Turn around, the interpreter ordered Sharp. Sharp obediently turned, showing his back to the Tipu, who, fascinated by the open wounds, stepped close so he could inspect the damage. Sharp could feel the Tipu's breath on the back of his neck. He could smell the man's subtle perfume. And then he felt a spider-soft touch as the Tipu fingered a strip of hanging skin. Then a sudden pain, like the blow of a red-hot poker, slammed through Sharp. He almost cried aloud, but instead he stiffened and flinched. The Tipu had thrust the tiger hilt of his sword against the deepest wound to see Sharp's reaction. He ordered Sharp to turn around and peered up to see whether there were any tears showing. Tears were pricking at Sharp's eyes, but none spilt onto his cheeks. 
The tipu nodded approval and stepped back. So tell me about them, he ordered Goudin. Ordinary deserters, Goudin said in French to the interpreter. That one, he indicated sharp, is a tough soldier, would probably be a credit to any army. The other one's just a clerk. Lawford tried not to show his disapproval of the judgment. The tipu glanced at him, saw nothing to interest him, and looked at Mary instead. The woman, he asked Goudin. She's with the tall one, Goudin said, again indicating sharp, then waited as the interpreter turned his answer into Persian. The tipu gave Mary a brief inspection. She was slouching, trying to accentuate her drab, bruised and dirty appearance. But when she saw his pensive gaze, she became flustered and tried to make a curtsy. The tipu seemed amused by the gesture, then looked back to Goudin. So what do they know of the British plans? He asked, gesturing at Lawford and Sharp. Nothing. They say they know nothing, the tipu corrected Goudin. And they're not spies? Goudin shrugged. How can one tell? But I think not. I think we can tell, the tipu said. And I think we can discover what kind of soldiers they are too. He turned and rapped some orders to an aide who bowed, then ran out of the courtyard. The aide returned with a pair of hunting muskets. The long-barreled weapons were like no guns Sharp had ever seen, for their stocks were crusted with jewels and inlaid with a delicate ivory filigree. The jeweled butts had an extravagant flair at their shoulder pieces, and the two guns' trigger guards were rimmed with small rubies. The dog heads that held the flints had been fashioned into tiger heads with diamonds for the tiger's eyes. The tipu took the guns, made sure their flints were properly seated within the tiger jaws, then tossed one gun to Lawford and the other to Sharp. The aide then placed a pot filled with black powder on the ground, and beside it a pair of musket balls that Sharp could have sworn were made of silver. Blood the guns, the interpreter said. A British soldier, like any other, learned to load with a paper cartridge. But there was no mystery about using naked powder and ball. Plainly the tipu wished to see how proficient the two men were. And while Lawford hesitated, Sharp stooped to the pot and took out a handful of powder. He straightened up and let the black powder trickle down the gun's chased barrel. The powder was extraordinarily fine, and a fair bit blew away on the small wind. But he had enough to spare and once the charge was safe inside the barrel, he stooped again, picked up the bullet, shoved it into the muzzle, and scraped the ramrod out of its three golden hoops. He twirled the ramrod, let it slide through his hand onto the bullet, and then slammed the missile hard down onto the powder charge. The tipu had provided no wadding, but Sharp guessed it did not matter. He pulled the ramrod out, reversed it, and let it fall into the precious loops beneath the long barrel. Then he stooped again, took a pinch of powder, primed the gun, closed the prison, and stood to attention with the gun's jewelled butt ground beside him. Sir, he said, signifying he was done. Lawford was still trying to trickle powder into the muzzle. The lieutenant was just as proficient at loading a gun as sharp, but being an officer he was never required to do it quickly for that was the one indispensable skill of a private soldier. Lawford only loaded guns while hunting, but in the army he had a servant who loaded his pistols, and never in his life had he needed to be quick with a gun, and now he demonstrated a lamentable slowness. He was a clerk, sir, Sharp explained to Goudin. He paused to lick the powder residue off his fingers. He never needed to fight like... The interpreter translated the words for the tipu, who waited patiently as Lawford finished loading the musket. The tipu, like his entourage, was amused at the Englishman's slowness, but Sharp's explanation that Lawford had been a clerk seemed to convince them. Lawford at last finished and very self-consciously stood to attention. "'You can evidently load,' the tipu said to Sharp. "'But can you shoot?' "'Aye, sir.' Sharp answered the interpreter. The tipu pointed over Sharp's shoulder. Then shoot him. 
Sharp and Lawford both turned to see an elderly British officer being escorted through the courtyard's gate. The man was weak and pale, and he stumbled as the bright sunlight struck his eyes. He coughed with a manacled hand at his face, then looked up and recognised Lawford. For a second, an expression of disbelief crossed his face. Then he managed to hide whatever emotion he was feeling. The officer was white-haired and dressed in a kilt and red jacket, both garments stained with dust and damp. And Sharp, horrified to see a British officer so dishevelled and humiliated, presumed this had to be Colonel McCandless. You can't shoot, Lawford began. Shut up, Bell, Sharp said, and brought the musket up to his shoulder and swung its muzzle to face the horrified Scots officer. Wait, Goudin shouted, then spoke urgently to the Tipu. The Tipu laughed away Goudin's protest. Instead, he had his interpreter ask Sharp what he thought about British officers. Scum, sir, Sharp said loudly enough for Colonel McCandless to hear. Goddamn bloody scum, sir. I think they're better than us because the bastards can read and were born with a bit of money. But there ain't one I couldn't beat in a fight. You are willing to shoot that one? The interpreter asked. I'd pay for the chance, Sharp said vengefully. Lawford hissed at him, but Sharp ignored the warning. Pay for it, he said again. His Majesty would like you to do it very close, the interpreter said. He wants you to blow the man's head off. It'll be a bloody pleasure, Sharp said enthusiastically. He cocked the gun as he walked toward the man he presumed he had been sent to save. He stared at McCandless as he approached, and there was nothing but brute pleasure on Sharp's hard face. Stuck-up Scotch bastard! Sharp spat at him. He looked at the two guards who still flanked the colonel. Move out of the way, you stupid sods, else you'll be smothered in the bastard's blood. The two men stared blankly at him, but neither moved, and Sharp guessed that neither man spoke any English. Dr. Venkatesh who had been trying to hide in the gateway's shadows, shook his head in horror at what was about to happen. Sharp raised the musket so that its muzzle was no more than six inches from a countess's face. Any message for General Harris? he asked softly. McCandless again hid his reaction, other than sparing one glance at Lawford. Then he looked back to Sharp and spat at him. Attack anywhere but from the west. The Scotsman said quietly, and then much louder, May God forgive you! Booger God! Sharp said, then pulled the trigger. The flint fell, it snapped its spark on the prison, and nothing else happened. McCandless's face jerked back as the flint sparked. Then an expression of pure relief crossed his face. Sharp hesitated a second, then drove the gun's muzzle into the colonel's belly. The blow looked hard but he checked it at the last moment. McCandless still doubled over, gasping, and Sharp raised the jeweled butt to bring it hard down on the officer's grey head. Stop! Goudin shouted. Sharp paused and turned. I thought you wanted the booger dead. The tipu laughed. We need him alive for a while, but you passed your test. He turned and spoke to Goudin, and Goudin answered vigorously. It seemed to Sharp that they were discussing his fate, and he prayed he would be spared a painful initiation into one of the Tipu's cushions. Another Indian officer, a tall man in a silk tunic decorated with the Tipu's tiger stripes, was talking to Mary while Sharp still stood above the crouching McCandless. Did Harris sent you? McCandless asked softly. Yes, Sharp hissed, not looking at the colonel. Mary was shaking her head. She glanced at Sharp, then looked back to the tall Indian. Beware the West, McCandless whispered, nothing else. The Scotsman groaned, pretending to be in much more pain than he was. He retched dryly, tried to stand, and instead toppled over. You're a traitor, he said loudly enough for Goudin to hear him, and you'll die a traitor's death. Sharp spat on McCandless. Come here, Sharp. Goudin, disapproval plain in his voice, ordered him. Sharp marched back to Lawford's side, where one of the Tipu's attendants took back the two muskets. The Tipu gestured at McCandless's guards. 
evidently signifying that the Scotsman was to be returned to his cell. The Tipu then gave sharp and approving nod before turning and leading his entourage out of the courtyard. The tall Indian in the silk tiger stripes beckoned to Mary. I'm to go with him, love, she explained to Sharp. I thought you were staying with me, Sharp protested. I'm to earn my keep, she said. I'm to teach his little sons English and sweep and wash, of course, she added bitterly. Colonel Gouda intervened. She will join you later, he told Sharp. But for now you are both, how do you say it, on test? Probation, sir, Lawford offered. Exactly, Gouda said. And soldiers on probation are not permitted wives. Don't worry, Sharp. I'm sure your woman will be safe in General Rao's house. Now go, mademoiselle. Mary stood on tiptoe and kissed Sharp's cheek. I'll be all right, love, she whispered. And so will you. Look after yourself, lass, Sharp said and watched her follow the tall Indian officer out of the courtyard. Goudard gestured toward the archway. We must let Dr. Venkatesh finish your back shop, then give you both new uniforms and muskets. Welcome to the Tipu Sultan's army, gentlemen. You earn a high dairy each every day. Good money, Sharp said, impressed. A high dairy was worth half a crown far above the miserable tuppence a day he received in the British Army. But doubtless in arrears, Lawford said sarcastically. He was still angry at Sharp for having tried to shoot McCandless, and the muskets misfired and not placated him. The pay is always in arrears, Goudin admitted cheerfully, but in what army is the pay ever on time? Officially, you earn a high dairy a day, though you will rarely receive it. But I can promise you other consolations. Now come. He summoned Dr. Venkatesh, who retrieved his basket, and followed Goudin out of the palace. Thus Sharp went to meet his new comrades, and readied himself to face a new enemy, his own side. General David Baird did not feel guilty about Sharp and Lawford, for they were soldiers and were paid to take risks. But he did feel responsible for them, the fact that neither the British nor Indian cavalry patrols had discovered the two men suggested that they might well have reached Seringapatam, but the more Baird thought about their mission, the less sanguine he was about its successful completion. It had seemed a good idea when he'd first thought of it, but two days' reflection had diluted that initial hope with a score of reservations. He'd always suspected that even with the help of Ravi Shekhar, their chances of rescuing McCandless were woefully small, but at the very least he had hoped they might learn McCandless's news and succeed in bringing it out of the city. But now he feared that neither man would even survive. At best, he thought the two men could only hope to escape execution by joining the Tipu's forces, which would mean that both Sharp and Lawford would be in enemy uniform when the British assaulted the city. There was little Baird could do about that, but he could prevent a dreadful miscarriage of justice following the city's fall. And so that night, when the two armies' great encampment was established just a few days' march from their goal, Baird sought out the lines of the 33rd. Major She seemed alarmed at the general's sudden appearance, but Baird soothed the Major and explained he had a little business with the light company. Nothing to trouble you, Major, just an administrative matter. A triviality. I take it to Captain Morris, sir, she said, then clapped on his hat and led the general down the line of officers' tents. It's the end one, sir, he said nervously. Do you need me at all? I wouldn't waste your time, she, on trifles, but I'm obliged for your help, though. Baird found a shirt-sleeved Captain Morris frowning at his paperwork in the company of an oddly malevolent-looking sergeant who, at the general's unannounced arrival, sprang to quivering attention. Morris hastily placed his cocked hat over a tin mug that Baird suspected was full of arrack. "'Captain Morris?' the general asked. "'Sir!' Morris upset his chair as he stood up. Then he plucked his red coat off the floor where it had fallen with the chair. Baird waved to show that Morris need not worry about donning a coat. "'There's no need for formality, Captain. Leave your coat off, man. Leave it off. It's desperately hot, isn't it?' "'Unbearable, sir!' 
Morris said nervously. I'm Baird. Baird introduced himself. I don't think we've had the pleasure. No, sir. Morris was too nervous to introduce himself properly. Sit you down, man, Baird said, trying to put the captain at his ease. Sit you down. May I? Baird gestured at Morris's cart, asking permission to use it as a chair. Thank you kindly, Baird said. Then he sat, took off his plumed hat, and fanned his face with its brim. I think I've forgotten what cold weather is like. Do you think it still snows anywhere? My God, but it saps a man this heat. Saps him. Uh, do relax, Sergeant. Thank you, sir. Sergeant Hakes will stiff posture unbent a fraction. Baird smiled at Morris. You lost two men this week, Captain, did you not? Two men? Morris frowned. That bastard sharp had run, taking his bibby with him. But who else? Oh, Morris said. You mean Lieutenant Lawford, sir? The very fellow. A lucky fellow, too, eh? Carrying the dispatch to Madras. It's quite an honor for him. Baird shook his head ruefully. Myself, I'm not so certain that little scrap the other day was worth the dispatch. But General Harris insisted, and your colonel chose Lawford. Baird was using the excuse the army had invented to explain Lawford's disappearance. The excuse had provoked some resentment in the 33rd, for Lawford was one of the most junior of the battalion's lieutenants, and most men who carried dispatches could expect a promotion as a reward for the task, which in turn was usually only given to men who had distinguished themselves in battle. It seemed to Morris, as to every other officer in the battalion, that Lawford had neither distinguished himself nor deserved promotion, but Morris could hardly admit as much to Baird. Very glad for him, Morris managed to say. Found a replacement, have you? Baird asked. Ensign Fitzgerald, sir, Morris said. Lieutenant Fitzgerald now, sir, by brevet, of course. Morris managed to sound disapproving. He would have much preferred Ensign Hicks to have received the temporary promotion. But Hicks did not have the hundred and fifty pounds needed to purchase up from Ensign to Lieutenant whereas Fitzgerald did. And if Lawford's reward for carrying the dispatches was a promotion to captain, then Fitzgerald must replace him. In Morris's opinion, the newly breveted lieutenant was altogether too easy with the men. But a money draft was a money draft, and Fitzgerald was the moneyed candidate, and so had been given the temporary rank. And the other fellow you lost, Baird asked, trying hard to sound casual. The private... In the book, is he? He's in the book, all right, sir, the sergeant answered for Morris. A uh, Hakeswill, sir. He introduced himself. Sergeant Obadar Hakeswill, sir. Man and boy in the army, sir, and at your command, sir. What was the rogue's name? Baird asked Morris. Sharp, sir. Hakeswill again answered. Richard Sharp, sir, and as filthy, horrible a little piece of work as ever I did see, sir, in all my born days, sir. The book? Baird asked Morris, ignoring Hakeswill's judgment. Morris frantically searched the mess on his desk for the punishment book, at the back of which were kept the army's official forms for deserters. Hakeswill eventually found it and, with a crisp gesture, handed it to the general. Sir... Baird leafed through the front pages, finally discovering the entry for Sharp's court-martial. Two thousand strokes, the Scotsman said in horror. It must have been a grave offence. Struck a sergeant, sir, Hakeswell announced. You, perhaps, Baird asked dryly, noting the sergeant's swollen and bruised nose. Without any provocation, sir. Hakeswell said earnestly, "'As God is my judge, sir, I never treated young Dick Sharp with anything but kindness. Like one of me old children he was, sir, if I had any children, which I don't, or at least not so as I knows of. He was a very lucky man, sir, to be let off at two hundred lashes, and you see how he rewards us?' Hakeswell sniffed indignantly. Baird did not respond, but just turned to the last page of the book where he found the name Richard Sharp filled in at the top of the printed form, and beneath it, Sharp's age, which was given as twenty-two years and six months. Though Captain Morris, if indeed it had been Morris who had filled in the form, had placed a question mark beside the age. 
Sharp's height was reported at six feet, only four inches less than Baird himself, who was one of the tallest men in the army. Make or form was the next question, to which Morris had answered, well built, and there followed a list of headings, head, face, eyes, eyebrows, nose, mouth, neck, hair, shoulders, arms, hands, thighs, legs, and feet. Morris had filled them all in, thus offering a comprehensive description of the missing man. Where born was answered simply by London, while besides, former trade or occupation was written thief. The form then gave the date and place of desertion, and offered a description of the clothes the deserter had been wearing when last seen. The final item on the form was general remarks, beside which Morris had written, Back scarred from flogging a dangerous man. Baird shook his head. A formidable description, Captain, the general said. Thank you, sir. It's been distributed. Tomorrow, sir. Morris blushed. The form should have been copied out four times. One copy went to the general commanding the army, who would have it copied again and distributed to every unit under his command. A second copy would go to Madras, in case Sharp ran there. A third copy went to the war office in London to be copied again and given to all recruiting officers, in case the man succeeded in reaching Britain and tried to rejoin the army. While the last copy was supposedly sent to the man's home parish to alert his neighbours to his treachery and the local constables to his crime. In Sharp's case there was no home parish, but once Morris caught up with his paperwork and the company clerk had made the necessary copies, Sharp's description would be broadcast throughout the army. If Sharp was then found in Seringapatam, which Baird suspected he would be, he was supposed to be arrested but it was far more likely that he would be killed. Most soldiers resented deserters, not because of their crime, but because they dared to do what so many others never had the courage to try, and no officer would punish a man for killing a deserter. Baird put the open book onto Morris's table. I want you to add a note under general remarks, Baird told the captain. Of course, sir. Just say that it is vital that Private Sharp be taken alive, and that if he is captured, he must be brought either to me or to General Harris. Morris gaped at Baird. You, sir? Baird, B-A-I-R-D, Major General. Yes, sir, but... Morris had been about to ask what possible business a Major General had with a deserter then realized that such a question would never fetch a civil answer, so he just dipped a quill in ink and hurriedly added the words Baird had requested. "'You think we might see Sharp again, sir?' he asked. "'I do hope so, Captain,' Baird stood. "'I even pray as much. Now may I thank you for your hospitality?' "'Yes, sir. Of course, sir.' Morris half stood as the general left then dropped back onto his chair and stared at the words he'd just written. "'What in God's name is all that about?' he asked when Baird was safely out of earshot. Hakeswell sniffed. "'No good, sir. I warrant that.' Morris uncovered the arrack and took a sip. First the bastard is summoned to Harris's tent, then he runs, and now Baird says we'll see him again once he's kept alive. Why?' "'He's up to no good, sir.' Hakeswell said, "'He took his woman and vanished, sir. "'Ain't no general who can condone that behaviour, sir. "'It's unforgivable, sir. "'The army's going to the dogs, sir.' "'I can't disobey Baird,' Morris muttered. "'But you don't want Sharpie back here either, sir,' Hakeswell said fervently. "'A soldier who's a general's pet. "'You'll be given a sergeant's stripes next.' The thought of such an affront struck Hexwell momentarily speechless. His face quivered with indignation. Then, with a visible effort, he controlled himself. Who oh, no, knows, sir, he suggested slyly. But the little bastard might be reporting on you and me, sir, like the traitor what he is. We don't need snakes in our bosom, sir. We don't want to disturb the happy mood of the company, not by harbouring a general's pet, sir. 
General's pet, Morris repeated softly. The captain was a venal man, and, though no worse than many, he nevertheless dreaded official scrutiny. But he was far too lazy to correct the malfeasances half concealed in the closely penned columns of the pay books. Worse, Morris feared that Sharp could somehow reveal his complicity in the false charge that had resulted in Sharp's flogging. And though it seemed impossible for a mere private to carry that much weight in the army, so it seemed equally impossible that a major general should make a special errand to discuss that private. There was something very odd going on, and Morris disliked strange threats. He merely asked for the quiet life, and he wanted Sharp out of it. But I can't leave those words off the form, he complained to Hakeswill, gesturing at the new edition on Sharp's page. Don't need to, sir. With respect, sir. Ain't no form being distributed here, sir. Not in the 33rd, sir. Don't need a form, do we? We knows what the bugger looks like, we does. So they won't give us no form, sir. They never do, sir. So I'll let it be known that if anyone sees Sharpie, they're to oblige the army by putting a ghoulie in his back. Hexwell saw Morris's nervousness. Won't be no fuss, sir. Not if the bugger's in Syringa Patam and we're pulling the bloody place to pieces. Kill him quick, sir, and that's more than he deserves. He's up to no good, sir. I can feel it in me waters. And a bugger up to no good is a bugger better off dead. Says so in the scriptures, sir. I'm sure it does, Sergeant. I'm sure it does. Morris said, then closed the punishment book. You must do whatever you think is best, Sergeant. I know I can trust you. You do me honour, sir, Hakeswell said with feigned emotion. You do me honour, and I'll have the bastard for you, sir, have him proper dead. In Seringapatam. What in God's name did you think you were doing, Sharp? Lawford demanded furiously. The lieutenant was much too angry to go along with the pretense of being a private, and besides, the two men were now alone for the first time that day. Alone, but not unguarded, for though they were standing sentry in one of the South Wall Cavaliers, there were a dozen men of Goudin's battalions within sight, including the burly sergeant called Rotier, who watched the two newcomers from the next Cavalier along. By God, Private, Lawford hissed, I'll have you flogged for that display when we're back. We're here to rescue Colonel McCandless, not to kill him. Are you mad? Sharp stared south across the landscape, saying nothing. To his right, the shallow river flowed between shelving green banks. Once the monsoon came, the river would swell and spread and drown the wide, flat rocks that dotted its bed. He was feeling more comfortable now, for Dr. Venkatesh had placed some salve on his back, which had taken away a lot of the pain. The doctor had then put on new bandages and warned Sharp that they must not be dampened, but ought to be changed each day until the wounds healed. Colonel Goudin had then taken the two Englishmen to a barracks room close by the city's southwestern corner. Every man in the barracks was a European, most of them French, but with a scattering of Swiss, Germans, and two Britishers. They all wore the blue coats of French infantry, but there were none to spare for the two new men, and so Sergeant Rotier had issued Sharp and Lawford with tiger tunics, like those the Tipu's men wore. The tunics did not open down the front like a European coat, but had to be pulled over the head. Where are you boys from? An English voice asked Sharp as he pulled down the dyed cotton tunic. Thirty-third, Sharp had said. The Havercakes, the man said, thought they were up north in Calcutta. Brought down to Madras last year, Sharp said. He gingerly sat on his cot, an Indian bed made from ropes stretched between a simple wooden frame. It proved surprisingly comfortable. And you? he asked the Englishman. Royal bleeding artillery mate, both of us, ran three months back. Name's Johnny Blake, and that's Henry Ixon. I'm Dick Sharp, and that's Bill Lawford, Sharp said, introducing the lieutenant, who looked desperately awkward in his knee-length tunic of purple and white stripes. Over the tunic he wore two crossbelts and an ordinary belt from which hung a bayonet and a cartridge pouch. They had been issued with heavy French muskets and warned they would have to do their share of sentry duty with the rest of the small battalion. 
Used to be a lot more of us, Blake told Sharp. But men die here like flies. Fever, mostly. But it ain't bad here, Henry Hickson offered. Food's all right. Plenty of bibbies, and Goudin's a real decent officer. Better than any we ever had. Right bastards we had, Blake agreed. Aren't they all? Sharp had said. And the pay's good when you get it. Five months overdue now, but maybe we'll get it when we beat the stuffing out of the British. Blake laughed at the suggestion. Blake and Hickson were not required to stand guard, but instead manned one of the big tiger-mouthed guns that crouched behind a nearby embrasure. Sharp and Lawford stood their watch alone, and it was that privacy which had encouraged Lawford into his furious attack. Have you got nothing to say for yourself, Private? He challenged Sharp, who still stared serenely over the green landscape through which the river curled south about the city's island. Well, Lawford snapped. Sharp looked at him. You loaded the musket, didn't you, Bill? Of course. You ever felt gunpowder that smooth and fine? Sharp gazed into the lieutenant's face. We could have been gunpowder dust, Lawford insisted angrily. That shiny, Sharp said derisively. Gunpowder dust is full of rat shit and sawdust. And did you really think, Bill, he pronounced the name sarcastically, that the bleeding tipper would let us have loaded guns before he was sure he could trust us, and with him standing not six feet away? And did you bother to taste the powder? I did, and it weren't salty at all. That weren't gunpowder, Lieutenant. That were either ink powder or black pigment. But whatever it was, it was never going to spark. Lawford gaped at Sharp. So you knew all along the gun wouldn't fire? Of course I bloody knew I wouldn't have pulled the trigger else. You mean you didn't realise that weren't powder? Lawford turned away. Once again he'd been made to look like a fool, and he blushed at the realisation. I'm sorry, he said. He was crestfallen, and again he felt a galling sense of inadequacy compared to this common soldier. Sharp stared at a patrol of the Tipu's lancers who were riding back toward the city. Three of them were wounded and were being supported in their saddles by their comrades, which suggested the British were not so very far away now. I'm sorry, sir, he said very softly, and deliberately using the word sir to mollify Lawford. But I'm not trying to be insolent. I'm just trying to keep you and me alive. I know. I'm sorry, too. I should have known it wasn't powder. It was confusing, weren't it? Sharp said. Trying to console his companion. What with the Tipu being there? Fat little bugger, ain't he? But you're doing all right, sir. Sharp spoke feelingly, knowing that the young lieutenant desperately needed encouragement. And you were clever as hell, sir, saying you wore an apron. I should have splashed some ink on your uniform, shouldn't I? But I never thought of it. But you got us out of that one. I was thinking of Private Brookfield, Lawford said. Not without some pride at the memory of his inspired lie. You know Brookfield? The clerk of Mr. Stambridge's company, sir. Fellow who wears spectacles. Does he wear a pinny? He says he keeps the ink off him. He always was an old woman, Sharp said scornfully. But you did well. And I'll tell you something else. We have to get out of here soon, because I know why we came now. We don't have to find your merchant fellow. We just have to get out. Unless you think we ought to rescue your uncle. But if you don't, then we can just run. Because I know why we came now. Lawford gaped at him. You know? The colonel spoke to me, sir, while we was going through that pantomime back there in the palace. He says we're to tell General Harris to avoid the West Wall. Nothing else, just that. Lawford stared at Sharp, then glanced across the angle of the city walls toward the western defences. But nothing he could see there looked strange or suspicious. You better stop calling me sir, he said. Are you sure about what he said? He said it twice. Avoid the West War. A bellow from the next cavalier made them turn. Rotier was pointing south, suggesting that the two Englishmen watch that direction as they were supposed to instead of gaping like yokels toward the west. Sharp obediently stared southward, though there was nothing to be seen there except some women carrying loads on their heads and a thin, naked boy herding some scrawny cattle along the river bank. His duty now, Sharp thought, was to escape this place and get back to the British Army. But how in God's name was he ever to do that? If he were to jump off the wall now, Sharp reckoned, 
he would stand a half chance of breaking a leg, and even if he survived the jump, he would only land in the glassy ditch. And if he managed to cross the glassy, he would merely reach the military encampment that was built hard around the city's southern and eastern walls. And if he was lucky enough to escape the hundreds of soldiers who would converge on him, he would still need to cross the river. And meanwhile, every gun on the encampment wall would be hammering at his heels. And once he crossed the river, if he ever did, the Tipu's lancers would be waiting on the far bank. The sheer impossibility of escaping the city made him smile. God knows how we'll ever get out of here," he said to Lawford. "Maybe at night," Lawford suggested vaguely. "If they ever let us stand guard at night," Sharp said dubiously. Then thought of Mary. Could he leave her in the city? So what do we do?" Lawford asked. "What we always do in the army," Sharp said stoically. "Hurry up and do nothing. Wait for the opportunity. It'll come. It'll come." And in the meantime, maybe we can find out just what the devils are doing in the west of the city, eh? Lawford shuddered. I'm glad I brought you, Sharp. You are. Sharp grinned at that compliment. I'll tell you when I'll be glad when you take me back home to the army. And suddenly, after weeks of thinking about desertion, Sharp realized that what he just said was true. He did want to go back to the army, and that knowledge surprised him. The army had bored Richard Sharp, then done its best to break his spirits. It had even flogged him. But now, standing on Seringa Patam's battlements, he missed the army. For at heart, as Richard Sharp had just discovered for himself, he was a soldier. Chapter six. The armies of Britain and Hyderabad reached Seringa Patam four days later. The first evidence of their coming was a cloud of dust that thickened and rose to obscure the eastern horizon. A great fog of dust kicked up by thousands of hoofs, boots, and wheels. The two armies had crossed the river well to the city's east, and were now on its southern bank. And Sharp climbed with the rest of Goodall's men to the far step above the Mysore Gate, to watch the first British cavalry patrols appear in the distance. A torrent of lances clattered out of the gate to challenge the invaders. This book is continued on disc six. But now, after a week in the general's household, Mary did not want to leave. For a start, the house was filled with women, who had taken her into their care and treated her with a kindness that astonished her. The general's wife, Lakshmi, was a tall, plump woman. With prematurely grey hair and an infectious laugh, she had two grown, unmarried daughters, and though there was a score of female servants, Mary was surprised to discover that Lakshmi and her daughters shared the work of the big house. They did not sweep it or draw water; those tasks were for the lowest of the servants. But Lakshmi loved to be in the kitchen, from where her laughter rippled out into the rest of the house. It had been Lakshmi who had scolded Mary for being so dirty, had stripped her from her western clothes, forced her into a bath, and there untangled and washed her filthy hair. "You'd be beautiful if you took some trouble," Lakshmi had said. "I didn't want to draw attention to myself. When you are my age, my dear, no one pays you any attention at all, so you should take all you can get while you're young. You say you're a widow. He was an Englishman." Mary said nervously, explaining the lack of the marriage mark on her forehead, and worried lest the older woman thought she should have thrown herself onto her husband's pyre. Well, you're a free woman now, so let's make you expensive. Lakshmi laughed, and then, helped by her daughters, she first brushed and then combed Mary's hair, drawing it back, and then gathering it into a bun at the nape of her neck. A cheerful maid brought in an armful of clothes, and the women tossed cholis at her. Choose one, Lakshmi said. The choli was a brief blouse that covered Mary's breasts, shoulders, and upper arms, but left most of her back naked. And Mary instinctively selected the most modest, but Lakshmi would have none of it. That lovely pale skin of yours, show it off, she said. And chose a brief choli patterned in extravagant swirls of scarlet flowers and yellow leaves. 